What's in there? Open up. This is the police. Are you sure this is John Thompson's room, Inspector Farrelly? Sure, I'm sure. Hey, maybe she committed suicide, Inspector, hey? Huh? Say, you might be right. Come on, let's break down the door. Yeah. Uh, 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 harder, Rollins, harder. This should do it. Uh, that did it. Come on, let's go in quick. I don't smell no gas. Where's the light switch? Don't ask me. I'm a stranger here myself. Hey, hold it. Somebody's over there crying. Here's the light switch. Hey, miss. You, uh, Joan Thompson? Joan? Joan Thompson? Joan... Are you Joan Thompson? Are you the cigarette girl on the Boulevard Club? Yes. You're wanted for the murder of Henry Brightson? No. You left the no. club with him tonight, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. Took him home in your car, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. Okay, we found Brightson's body on a country road a couple of hours ago. There are blood stains in your car. Explain that. All right. Oh, and I killed him. I did it. I did it. That's better. What did you do with the gun? I gave it. You gave it to somebody? Who? Look around, see what you can find, Rollins. Yeah, I'm looking, Inspector. What did you do with that gun, Miss Thompson? I don't know, I don't know. Hey, Inspector, here's a telephone number that may mean something. Look, right here on the top of this pad. Let's have a look. Well, uh, I'll say it means something. You know that number, Inspector, hey? Know it. I could dial it in my sleep. That phone number is Boston Blackies. <laughs> Now meet Richard Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friends. <laughs> Look, Miss Thompson, crying isn't going to do you any good. You're going to answer my question if it takes forever. I told you everything I know. I killed Henry Bright and I admit it. But where's the gun? Oh, please. Alone. I told you Blackie was here. Yeah, but when and for how long and why was he here? I... Oh, please, leave me alone. Did you give Blackie your gun? I don't remember. Well, start remembering. Did you give your gun to Blackie? Yes, yes I gave it to him. Okay, Miss Thompson, that's all I wanted to know. Give me a hand, Rollins, for taking this girl to headquarters. Okay, lady, let's go. Hey, Inspector, his dog don't look too good, eh? Okay, so maybe she doesn't feel well. Maybe she needs a doctor. And maybe Blackie won't feel well either when he finds out he's going to need a lawyer. Inspector Faraday speaking. Hello, Faraday. This is Blackie. Blackie, I've been looking for you. So I hear. That's why I called. Yeah? Well, how does it feel to be a murder suspect? Completely natural. Now what have I done? Made a fool out of yourself? Well, I had good material. And besides, I was tired of being so different from you. You won't be able to wisecrack your way out of this one, Blanky. I'm pinning this on you. Faraday, you have trouble pinning your badge on yourself. Okay, be a smart aleck if you want to. But why'd you do it, Blanky? Why did I do it? I don't even know what I've done. You're always so shy about telling me those things. You took John Thompson's gun. Oh, that? Yeah, that. The Thompson girl admits she killed Henry Bryson. Now, why did you have to get mixed up in it by taking her gun? Now you're an accessory after the fact. And you're a cop after the accessory. The cycle's complete. All right, Blackie. I've given you a chance to square yourself. You won't? So I'm coming to get you. Oh, come on. It'll be nice seeing you again. Blackie, listen to me. Stop clowning for once and tell me. Why did you do it? It's so simple. Maybe after a few translations of the baby talk, even you can understand it. This Joan Thompson used to be Mary Wesley's best friend. Since when does knowing Mary Wesley make an angel out of anybody? Mary Wesley's qualities are catching. Uh, wait a minute, Barney. Fold your wings, Mary. They're fluttering. Can't. Yeah. When they're <laughs> unfolded like this, they dust the walls so nicely. <laughs> Frankie, is that Miss Wesley with you now? And you ought to see her, Faraday. She looks lovely. Now maybe I will see her. Behind bars with you. She could be mixed up in this, too, you know. Look, Faraday, Mary didn't send me up there to take the gun away from the Thompson girl. I did that on my own. I don't trust your ballistics department. By the way, what caliber bullet killed Henry Brightson? None of your business. Well, I'm going to make it mine to keep you in business. So long, Faraday. When I have your killer, I'll deliver him to you all wrapped up. Blackie, you listen to me, Blackie. Well, times certainly haven't changed, Mary. Neither does Faraday. He thinks I had something to do with Henry Brightson's murder. Oh, Blackie, it's all my fault for calling you. 
Well, when Joan called me, I didn't know who else to turn to. If you never know who else to turn to, that's fine with me. Yes, but now you're in trouble. Is that unusual? No, but I certainly wish it were. Oh, Blackie, what are we going to do? Prove Joan Thompson didn't kill Henry Brightson. But how? She admits she killed him. I think she's admitting that to cover up somebody. Why, of course. Why didn't I think of that? Because you're, because you're not a genius called Boston Blackie. Oh, well, genius, <laughs> what now? Now I think we'll go out and make a night of it. A night of what? Oh, festivities at the Boulevard Club, where your friend Joan Thompson works. But, but why do we go there? To see if we can pick up a couple of clues before Faraday picks up a couple of us. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Williams is completely in my power. Hypnotized. Blackie, is he a fake? The rest of the Boulevard Club is phony enough, Mary, but I think the floor show is legitimate. Ladies and gentlemen, you will remember that before the subject was hypnotized, he could not correctly add... 27 and 47. Who can? Now, while he's hypnotized, I will give the subject three figures to add. And his subconscious mind will calculate the answers with the speed of machinery. If this works, I should have been hypnotized in school. Weren't you? Oh, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Williams. 257, 349, 581. Add those numbers together and give me the answer. 1,187. Ladies and gentlemen, add those figures yourself and you'll see that the answer is correct. Blackie, is it? <laughs> I don't know. I'm still working on oh, it. darling, don't write on the now, table. Now, ladies call. and gentlemen, I think our subject should wake up. Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams. Wake up. Wake up. Hmm. Oh. Yeah, sure. Now, Mr. Williams, give me the correct sum of 257, 349, and 581. Quickly. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> this man would get through life better if he were hypnotized. Me too. <laughs> thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, Mr. Williams. You've been a good sport. Oh, shucks. Isn't that the end of the floor show? Seems to be. Blackie, was that man look really on the level? I don't know. Well, um, here, here comes that Mr. Williams. Let's ask him about it, huh? All right. Say, uh, Williams. You call me? Uh, yes, have you got a minute? Uh, I'm awful sorry. Uh, I've got an awful memory for names and faces. I, I don't think I remember... Oh, you don't know us, Mr. Williams, but uh, uh, we'd like to ask you what it was like to be hypnotized. Were you really hypnotized? I'm afraid I was. Then there's really something to it, huh? Well, I'm not a professional stooge, that you're thinking. I'm just a paying guest, same as you. You added those figures so quickly. Uh, aren't you good with numbers normally? Terrible. I took math in high school for three years and just got by. <laughs> I can hardly add two and two. Well, how is it that you could add under hypnosis, then? You don't have to ask a psychologist about that. Uh, excuse me, please. I got people waiting at my table. Good night. Uh, thanks for coming over. Well, that mentalist is really on the level, then, isn't he, Blackie? Yes, I suppose there is a scientific explanation for hypnosis. It's part of the applied psychology course at colleges. Oh, golly, I think we better watch the clock. It's getting late, darling. Oh, all right. There's a waiter. Waiter! I do, wait, sir. Oh, um, Blackie, why don't you ask the waiter a few questions about Henry Brightson? What? And get thrown out? Mary, in places like this, the only question you ask is, how much is the check? Oh. Now, if the waiter mentions Brightson first, that's different. Then I could probably... Here he comes. You want something, sir? Uh, the check, please. Yes, sir. Here you are. Thanks. Enjoy the floor show? Very much. Almost had a little unscheduled show here last night. Our cigarette girl killed Henry Bison. You read about it? Yes, we did. Sure was exciting. Police all over the place. Say, uh, <laughs> tell me, uh, yes? did the place, uh, did they ever find the man Brightson came in with last night? I don't know why not. Dr. James Harris does not have to hide from anybody. He left a long time before Brightson did. Why would the police think Dr. Harris killed by? Well, I don't know that they do. Uh, say, uh, how did that cigarette girl, um, uh, what's her name, Joan Thompson, uh, uh, how did she get mixed up with Brightson? Well, when Brightson was about to... Uh, don't ask questions yet, sir, because we do not know the answers. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, sir, but we have a policy here never to talk about our customers. Important people come here and... It is not right. I'm sorry I asked. That's okay. Here, this should take care of the check. Thank you, sir. I'll be right back. Never mind, keep it. 
Thank you. Blackie. What's the matter, Mary? You look surprised. How did you know Bryson came in with someone else? I didn't. It was just a shot in the dark. Well, let's stay here until they turn out the lights, and maybe you can shoot for the answer to everything. Oh, no. We're getting out of here. Why? See that man over there? He's Edwards, the boss of this joint. Oh, he looks like the boss of a chain gang. Why not? He used to be a member of one. Look at those mugs he's talking to. And look at them. Look at us. I think they're going to close in for a better look, too. That waiter must have told him that I was asking questions. Oh, Blackie, and those questions didn't do you any good either, did they? I know it. Well, come on. I'm going to see Joan in jail to try and put the pieces of this puzzle together before Edwards and his pals get the notion that we ought to be taken apart. <laughs> There's a doctor to see you, Miss Thompson. A doctor? I don't want a doctor. A friend of yours asked me to see you, Miss Thompson. Oh. Uh, you want me to come in a cell with you, Doc? She's kind of violent, this one. Hey, no, thank you, officer. I'll be all right. Okay. There you are, Doc. Thank you. I'll just lock this door. Just tell me when you're through, and I'll let you out, eh? Uh, thank you, I will, yes. Uh, just sit where you are, Miss Thompson. I tell you, I don't want a doctor. Just sit quietly, Miss Thompson. I don't need a doctor. I hope not, Joan, because I'm no doctor. What? But I'm what the doctor ordered, Boston Blackie. Blackie? Blackie, I gave you the gun. What else do you want? Shh. The police are after me, too. That's the reason for the whiskers in my doctor's kit. I don't understand. Why are you here? To help you. Nobody can help me. Look, Joan, I just come from the Boulevard Club. Something's wrong there. Now... Before you left last night, did anyone force you to do anything at all? No. No, when I got through, I got my hat and my usual cup of coffee and left. You're covering up for somebody, Joan. No. Who? Who killed Henry Bites? I did. Joan, will you stop <laughs> lying? Who's forcing you to say that? I killed Henry Bites and I killed him. I killed him. I killed him. I admit it. Don't leave me alone. Joan, don't do this to me. I've hidden your gun because I thought you were innocent. Now tell me the truth, will you? Go away. I killed Henry Bryson, I admit it. I killed him. What more do you want to do? All right, Joan. If there's nothing more you can say, there's nothing more I can do. Joan Thompson, cigarette girl in the Boulevard Club and friend of Mary Wesley, has confessed to the murder of Henry Brightson. But Blackie and Mary, convinced she is merely covering up for the real killer, try to help her, but learn only that Brightson came to the club with a Dr. Harris, left with Joan Thompson, was later found dead. Blackie's last hope of proving Joan's innocence died later, when in jail, Joan insisted she did kill Brightson. As we return to our story, Blackie's driving Mary to his apartment to pick up the murder gun. Blackie, what are you thinking? A whole catalog of things, Mary. What's on page one? I've never been faced with anything like this before. I know I'm licked. If Joan killed Bryson, she killed him, and that's that. Page two? I still want to do something for her, but I don't know what. Well, first you're going to do something for yourself. You're going to get that gun out of your apartment. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do now. And send it to Faraday. Then what? Then I don't know what. Well, here's my street. Blackie, is that a police car in front of your apartment house? It's worse than that. It's Faraday's private cruiser. Oh. We're getting out of here. Hey, hey, keep all four wheels on the ground, please. Phew. Sorry, oh. Mary, but that was Faraday himself on the sidewalk, Sorry. and I... I know what he's after. You, of course. First, Joan Thompson's gun in my apartment. His men are probably looking for it right now. Will they find it? I don't think so. But this means we have to find something ourselves. What? Well, remember that waiter at the Boulevard Club said Brightson arrived with a Dr. James Harris. Yes? Dr. Harris is a well-known drug specialist. He could tell me something important. What? Well... The real reason, he left the club before Brightson did. That's one thing he could tell me. And what's another thing? Whether or not Joan Thompson can be under the influence of a drug that makes her believe she committed murder. And if he gives you that information, what will you have? A prescription for murder to be filled at the nearest police station. Well, yes, Blackie, I know Harry Brightson's dead. 
He had a visit from Inspector Faraday with the police just a little while ago. Well, Faraday's really making an effort to earn his pay these days. But I'm sure there are a couple of questions he didn't ask you, Dr. Harris. Yes? You came to the club with Brightson last night. Why didn't you leave with him? Why, uh, I had an emergency call. I can check on that, you know. Well, well, all right then. Brightson and I went to the Boulevard Club for a little private game with the owner, Jim Edwards. I dropped out. Because you ran out of money? No. I left because that game wasn't on the level. And I knew it. Who was crooked? Brightson. I told him so and left. Then what did you do? I came straight home. Got a gun, went back to the Boulevard Club, waited for Brightson to come out, followed him, then killed him. Now, look here. I, I didn't kill Brightson, I tell you. I... Yes, I know that's what you tell me. You can't drag me into this. You, you can't. All I want to do is drag the truth out of you. But I've told you the whole truth. All right. Let's forget the possibility that you might have killed Brightson for the moment. Aren't you a specialist in drugs? Mm-hmm. So what? Is there a drug that would make Joan Thompson, the cigarette girl, believe she killed Brightson? No. Drugs don't make people think they've done something they haven't done. Under the influence of drugs, people do forget, though. In other words, drugs don't enter into this at all. Being drugged would not make her confess to something she didn't do. I'll stake my reputation on that. Those are pretty high stakes, Dr. Harris. Let's just hope that before this is over, you don't have to pull them up. Mary, this is Blackie. I've just seen Dr. Harris, and drugs are out. Oh, dear. But something else is in, and if my hunch is right, I'm in, too. What do you mean? Question. Why did Brightson leave the club in Joan's car when his own was parked in a lot outside the club? Answer? His car broke down. Oh, Blackie, Joan told us that. Yes, but we're going to have a look at that car of his, because if it didn't break down, it's going to break up this case. Here's Brightson's car in the parking lot, apparently right where he left it. How will you know whether or not there's something wrong with it? You're no mechanic. <laughs> well, I can try to be one, can I? Guess we'll have a look under the hood. That's where mechanics always start. Why aren't you observing? Mm. What do you see in there? Oh, come over. and You can look at it, too. It's an engine. You don't say. Mm-hmm. Eight cylinders. That bad? <laughs> you're a big help. Well, you're the one who's pretending to be a mechanic. Uh-oh. See something? See those marks on the top of the engine block? Uh, yeah, yeah, the little lines in the grease. Those were made when the contact wires to the spark plugs were removed. Well, yes, but couldn't they have just slipped off? All of them at once? No, Pat. Somebody was kidding around with this engine, only he wasn't kidding. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Good evening, me. Good evening. Oh, you're the same waiter we had here last night. How nice. I'm glad you liked the Boulevard Club enough to come back the second night. Oh, yes, we enjoyed it last night. Especially the floor show. Oh, I hope you have not come to see the mentally. As a matter of fact, we have. We hoped we might be able to volunteer as subjects. Right. Awfully sorry, sir. He is not here any longer. Oh, we missed him. But we have a new act that is excellent. I'm sure you will like it. Yes, I'm sure we will. Now, what would you like for dinner this evening? We haven't decided yet. Uh, could you give us a few more minutes? Let's go. All the time you want, sir. All the time you want. Well, Blackie, there goes your theory. And here I go to the telephone. What for? To call Faraday. Oh, Blackie, a little setback isn't going to make you give up, is it? No, Mary. A little information is going to make me give out. <laughs> Inspector, this is Blackie. Where are you, Blackie? I've been looking all over town for you. Well, thanks for the flattery, Inspector, but I don't need it right now. I don't need you at any time, Blackie, but I'm coming to get you. Uh, don't bother with me, Faraday. You have another body on your hands if you can find it. I've already found it. And guess who it is? The hypnotist at the Boulevard Club. Oh, so you killed him, too? I didn't kill him, either. Yeah? And how did you know he was dead? I have a sixth sense. And so does a horse. 
Then if you had any horse sense, you'd know who killed Wilner and why. Okay, Sea Biscuit. Who did kill the mentalist? Okay, also ran the same guy who killed Brightson. What kind of an answer is that? The right one. Blackie, you know what I'm going to do? Sure, exactly what I tell you to do. First, get a doctor for Joan Thompson. She's been drugged and hypnotized. Get her out of it, and she'll stop insisting she killed Brightson. Yeah? Now, what are you going to do? What I always do, Faraday. Get you your killer. You want to do business with me, Blackie? That's right, Edwards. I have offers from people every day who want to buy into this club of mine. I don't accept it. Oh, I'm not interested in your club, Edwards. Uh, But I am interested in your activities. Meaning what? I think you killed Henry Brightson. I'm not interested in what you think. I also think you killed Wilner, the hypnotist. I'm still not interested. I also think your gun killed them both. Oh, you do? Don't reach for your gun, Edwards. I need only one, and mine's quite handy. You're very fast on the draw. You're very slow on the take. I'm accusing you of two murders, and you don't seem the least bit concerned. Uh, by the way, uh, hand over that gun, will you? I have a permit for this pistol. But the permit doesn't say that you can kill with it. Hand it over. I want to look at it. All right, here. Now you can sit down and make yourself comfortable. Because what I'm going to say to you will make you uncomfortable. That gun of mine did not kill Brightson. It did not kill Wilner. Hasn't been fired in months. I can tell that by looking at it. Are you satisfied? Yeah. Yeah. You can have it now. Now, will you be so kind as to put your gun away? Of course. Well, that better? Yes, much. Now, Edwards, I'm not going to ask you to kill Brightson and Wilner. I'm going to tell you you did, and why. Can you? Just listen. Brightson caught you cheating at cards and threatened to go to the police. You couldn't afford that. You fixed his car so it wouldn't run and sent him home in Joan Thompson's car. Then Joan Thompson was the last to see him alive, so she must have killed him. Joan Thompson was drugged when she had her usual cup of coffee before leaving the club. And you went along with her until the drug took effect. Then stopped the car, shot Brightson. Joan Thompson admits she killed Brightson. Of course. Under hypnosis, she would admit anything. After killing Brightson, you brought Joan back here, had Wilner hypnotize her and impress on her subconscious that she had killed Brightson. You, uh, can prove that? You helped prove it yourself by killing Wilner so he could never blackmail you. The final proof will come when a doctor tells the police that Joan Thompson has been both drugged and hypnotized ever since she was found in her room. Don't move, Blackie. I wouldn't give orders if I were you, Edward. Then I'll let my gun speak for me. Speaks sort of softly, doesn't it? Stay back, Blackie. My gun's just missing. When I'll it's... say it's missing, Edwards. It's missing its bullets. What? I took them out when I pretended to look at you again. Why, you dirty... Oh, no, Edwards. Please, don't call me names. It isn't fair. Because from now on, all anybody will be able to call you is a number. <laughs> Everything checked, Mary. The police found out that our friend Joan had been drugged. And Joan was made to believe she killed Brightson because she was hypnotized. I still can't believe it. Look into my eyes. What? You are going to sleep. Oh. Look into my eyes. Yes? Now put your arms around me. Yes? Now lift your face up to mine. Like? This? And now? Now? This. <laughs> Do you think I'm hypnotized? Well, maybe you aren't. But I am. Let's do that again. <laughs> <laughs>
Broadway's my beat from Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When the rumor gets around that summer is almost here, Broadway is beside itself with glee. Somebody notices the moonlight of May, shouts about it to a girl who whispers about it to another guy, and the word gets round. It drifts cross town, causes phenomena. Crew cuts, bare-legged girls with cheeks of tan, and the boy who runs down the street screaming, I'm in love. It's the time to turn on the dream. Cotton candy and carnival time. Bleachers and hot dog with everything time. It's happened. It's started. The lazy days are here again. And where I was, private house converted to upstairs and downstairs apartment, 11 o'clock in the morning time. Policeman on duty, me. In answer to phone call in which the word violence had intruded. Doorway, upstairs apartment. Are you the police? Come on in. Boy, you ought to see. You ought to see what's in this tree. Your name Adams? You're the man who... Yeah, sure, sure. Now listen. Listen to that. You remember when Whiteman recorded that? Yeah, you know what I was doing then? I... Well, what'd you do that for? You called. You said there was an attempted murder here. Yeah, well, I wanted you to observe the kind of joint you're in, that's all. You think that's the only record like it? No, hundreds of them. Whiteman, Helen Kane, Columbo, Early Crosby. You got carried away with it and thought to call homicide, huh? Come on. In here. Have an attempted homicide. She's been shot, hasn't she? No gun around, I look. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Adams, tell me about it. Oh, I wasn't supposed to be here. No? Well, downstairs is for rent. The agent said look at the downstairs apartment, not the upstairs one, as he shook his finger, which is all he had to do. I'm naughty, the curious Adams. You broke in here? Door was open, and I wanted in, that's all. Oh, you, you try to book me for something in that line, I'll just yell mistake, that's all. Got bum directions from the rental agent. Hmm. You know this woman on the bed? Well, if she's the gal in this picture posing with Rudolph Valentino, I'm inclined to think, yeah. Here, yeah, hold, hold this picture close to her. You've been busy waiting for me, haven't you, Mr. Adams? Yeah, well, I'm also naughty the fidgety Adams. Lots around here to be fidgety about, huh? Old Harvard pennants, raccoon coat, drawings, junk. I figure this dame had her moments around, uh, 1928, wouldn't you say? And the picture... It's her, all right. About 20 years younger. More? Uh, go on, read the description there. Uh, uh, to... Barbara Hunt, what a wonderful dancer sign, Rudolph Valentino. Go, go on, read it. You just read it, Mr. Adams. How about the man who sent you to this place? Well, the rental agent, the broker, Mr. Tierney? Uh-huh. I want to talk to him. Sure. Yeah, here's the same card he gave me. Well, what shall I do now? Stick around for more questioning, Mr. Adams, when technical gets here. Find a chair and sit in it and don't move. Do that for me, will you, Mr. Adams? Silence, then. Languid dance of May sunlight through a world 25 years dead. Gold drift of light across eyelids on twisted contour of mouth of a wounded woman. Mottlings of shadow, scurry of dust across polished surfaces. Swell of drape to sudden flare of May wind. Response to summer and death. The well-preserved relics of a lost era. And the short wait then for today's harvesters of violence. Their arrival, their briefing, and the leaving of them. The ride downtown and west across to Madison and a building now where real estate brokers live and play the percentages and are helpful in the matter of a mortgage on the old homestead. Power descent to the 19th floor. Controls in the hands of a girl who has a bird tattooed on her shoulder. And the office then of John Tierney, real estate broker. Come here, come here quick. Huh? You'll miss it, fella. Miss what, Mr. Tierney? What goes in the office across the street every morning this time right on the nose. <laughs> Yeah, cry a little fella, you missed it. <laughs> Every morning on the nose. Now we can talk, Mr. Turing? Oh, absolutely, fella. You got a thing in mind? A house on East 60th with an upstairs apartment. A woman there named Barbara Hunt. Oh, that's all right, she owns a place. You're interested in a downstairs apartment, I can make you a good deal, fella. You interested? We found her upstairs, wounded. You don't say. She's dying. We're calling it attempted murder. 
If you're a fellow calls it that, then you're a fellow who's... That's right, police. Danny Clover. Pleasure, Mr. Clover. Believe me, a pleasure. She was found there by a man you sent to look at the place. He called it in. Oh, sure. That Mr. Adams. He was interested in the short-term lease on the classy side, rent no object. I figured Mrs. Hunts was just... A... Hey, I told him. I told that Mr. Adams very plain not to enter the upstairs apartment. He wasn't supposed to He did, to go... and he found a dying woman. Anything you want to tell me about her, Mr. Tierney? Barbara? Very nice person. Very lovely woman. She owned that house? In her own name. Uh, maybe a year ago she came to me to handle it downstairs for her. I figured good deal. Pretty house, very pretty decorated, thoughtful rental price. Good deal, I figured. Only it hasn't worked out that way. You'll tell me about it, huh? Well, there have been maybe three broken leases already in the period of a year. Nobody stayed there more than three, four months. From a good deal into a dull headache. Why? You say she's dying? Uh huh. Well, that upstairs apartment, that was hers. No tenant was allowed in it, no one except her. She had a key, separate entrance, one of the conditions of the lease. And that's why the tenants didn't stay long, that's what you're trying to say? Well, the lady's dying, you said. I think I better not say anything about Barbara, why people left her house. I think maybe that's a matter better handled by her husband. Look, her I... Her husband, Nicky Hunt. I'll give you his address. He'll tell you better why things happened to his wife. Uh-huh, Nicky, not me. Look, I can take you... Yeah, I know, you can take me. And still it won't be me. That's the way it is, Mr. Clover. Goodbye, Mr. Clover. Cop. Look, Mr. Hunt, you don't have to make the pose for me. You did it a couple of minutes ago, and I remembered who you were. Cop. And... Bad news. Cop. Every time. They come knocking, they come asking, always every time. Bad news. How else you want me to tell you? Your wife might die. Maybe you know a better way of saying it. Gentler. You were always a gentleman. I remember reading about it. Yeah, there were cops then, too, 20 years ago, 30. Same way of standing like you and talking, looking down at you. Help me get up. Hand me that cane. Here. Now you know what's become a Nick Hunt. Who'd? Would you like to hear how the... No. After they nearly shot off my leg 22 years ago, I sold the story to the newspapers. I got 10 Gs to tell the public how the gangster's bullets and a woman's true love sent me into retirement, and, and you don't want to hear for nothing? <laughs> Hand me that suit coat. You won't need a coat. It's too warm. To... I'm going to pay a call on my wife, am I not? I got respect. Should I cry for her in my shirt sleeves? I'm sorry. Hand it to me. Uh, here, I'll help you with it. All these years... All these years with Barbara. With my wife, Barbara. What's happened to the thug who, who almost owned the half of the city? What was your wife doing in that apartment, Nick? She kept young there. I don't understand. Neither do I. But what did you mean when you said she kept... She built the old years around her, that's all. The pictures, the music, you were there, you saw she had a place for her memories. She took time off to slow down and live with them. For days sometimes. And she left you alone these times? I didn't mind. I can get along without crawling. Want me to show you? No. Barbara always came home. Younger. I'm not young. You can imagine. More about your wife, Nick. What about her friends? It's one. One from the old days. Billy. Billy Scotch. Ever hear her name? No. 1927, you'd have heard it. She lives near here to Glendon Apartments. You talk to her, huh? I'm going to try to talk to my wife. Yes, who is it? Police. You're from the police, and you wish to see me? If you're Mrs. Billy Scott, yes, I... Why? Wanted... Because earlier today, someone tried to kill Barbara Hunt. She's a friend of yours, isn't she, Mrs. Scott? Yes, a friend. Will you come in, please? I am alone here. My husband and my son are traveling this summer in Italy, and, and I'm quite alone. Well, Mrs. Scott... I'm but... trying to tell you something. And it has to do with Barbara and with myself. May I proceed, please? Yes. Thank you. You are not to misunderstand my emotion about being alone. I'm a woman of many interests. There's always a charity. And there's always a decent cause. And I welcome the respite my son and my husband give me every year. 
Gives me the time I need to give myself to the less fortunate. Well, let me put it that way, then. Right now, Barbara Hunt is less fortunate. She's dying. And the time I have proportioned for others have given me little time for Barbara. Much as I may have wished it otherwise has given me little time for Barbara. Her husband told me you were very close friends. Yes, from the short time of youth. When there was the girls' school and rumble seats and the football games and the boys with homemade gin and the silver flasks. And the weekend speakeasies. Then we were great friends, Barbara and I. You haven't seen very much of her lately, is that what you're trying to say? Barbara went her path, I went mine. I have a fine son and I have a lovely home. And my husband stands very little in my way. And what does Barbara have? Oh, Mrs. Scott. What does Barbara have? A man whose name is Nicky. A man who was shot up by gangsters. A man who was an invalid. That Barbara has. And something else. What? Why, well, I asked you. I, she has the unswerving belief that youth will never leave her. In the few times I've seen her in the past year, she has said that to me. Not me, Billy, she has said. No body wrinkles for me. And now consider her. She's dying. How? Where? In the upstairs apartment. Of course, the there. Where else to Barbara? Please. What? I should like very much to see her. May I? Barbara and I, very old friends. And very dear. And I think now is the moment to be at her side. Please. May I? Yeah. Get your things, Mrs. Scott. And I won't believe this has happened, Mr. Clover. If you know Barbara Hunt, if you this know... This is her room, Mrs. Scott, in here. Dr. Sinsky? A couple of minutes ago. It is say Danny. Yeah. Her husband by the bed. Isn't he Nicky Hunt, the old gangster? Uh-huh. Hmm? Imagine that. Nick. Nicky? Yeah. Yeah, what do you want, Billy? Don't cry. Just don't cry. She wouldn't want you to. Oh, listen, Billy. Look at her. So young. The way she looks, Nicky. She must have died very happy. Young, the way she wanted to. And I mustn't cry either. I envy her so. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Later tonight on most of these stations, CBS Radio invites you to adventure with Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. Also later tonight, listen for Gangbusters and The Case of the Crimson Seasoner, a fact crime story taken from the actual police records. Remember on CBS Radio later this evening, Tarzan and Gangbusters for more thrills. The morning sun strikes summer into Broadway's pavements, and splinters of light attend the early walk of May women, and on them the lingerings of night perfume. So morning, and time to lean against the slow warming stone, light the cigarette, flip the coin, make odds on how promises will run later this day. And wide field of choice, the new entries from out of town, in non-crushable linen, and hands in gloves white as the morning, and heels high-stepping. So clock the rhythms, make the picks, run to a phone and play it across the board. By fall of night, one of them may come in. And at headquarters, the opening event of the day, Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. Uh, Good morning to you, Gino. And to you, Danny, a likewise. If anyone here is keeping you up, Gino, why just... Put it down to overindulgence. What? One sip too many from that ever-loving joy cup. Two glasses of wine last night, Gino? Whilst trying to recreate a memory. Gino... A memory brought upon me by the incident of the murder of Barbara Hunt. Her dying made you... Only after the boys in the locker room last evening, before going home, started kicking the item around. How she was found, where she was found, the decorations, the old-type gramophone records in her place, her husband, Nicky Hunt, a hoodlum of yesteryear, And finally, 
I came up with a contribution. Mm. You want to contribute it to me, too, Gino? Ah, memories, Danny. Memories. The Roaring Twenties and the weekly supplement articles on the doings of a Barbara and a Billy. Bathtubs filled with champagne, drunks hanging by the heels from penthouses, wine and satin slippers, the wail of soprano saxophones. You said Barbara and Billy, the same Barbara? I was going to make a point to go to the main branch public library, Danny, to research if the same Barbara, also if the same Mrs. Billy Scott. I remember the article, Barbara and Billy in large red letters, a high-heeled foot peeking out from a bathtub. On my youth, it made such an impression. Anything else? <clears throat> Anything else is a list of three names. Former tenants in the lower apartment of the house of Mrs. Barbara Hunt. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Purdy, a Mr. Ralph Madison, a Jeffrey Sinclair. List obtained by Mugovan from the real estate... Mugovan obtained their present addresses, too? No slop shot. He, Danny, here with they are. Thanks. A uh, squad car, Dino. Order and waiting. Isn't it funny how I remembered all that, eh, Danny? Yes? Is this the Purdy residence? I'm Mrs. Purdy. What is it? I'm from the police. Yes? Well, is the trumpet supposed to blow what? It's about Barbara Hunt. You won't mind if I don't invite you in, do you? This is five minutes of sun I didn't expect to get. Let me get some, will you? Boy, man, oh, man. Boy. Let me know when you've got enough of it. Never get enough of that stuff. Just say when. Barbara Hunt, huh? That's right. Out of her mind. Oh? I lived downstairs from her, didn't I? I ought to know. Well, tell me about it. Bo Dodio Do. What? She thought it was still current. Vododio do and boop boop a doo. When I lived under, that's all I got. By Rudy Valley yet. One night. Well. Well, what? Oh, she's dead now, you know. You really think I should? Yes, I think you should. Well. Most nights it was quiet because Barbara didn't really live there all the time. Just maybe a few nights, a month or so. Did you know that? Just tell me about the night you were. Oh, sure, were... sure. You never heard such noise in all your life. Music, loud, bang, racket, woo-woo, loud, you know. Now go on. So I went upstairs and knocked on her door to protest. Wouldn't you? Sure you would, if you knew how loud. Sure I would. She opened the door, and there she was. Huh? There she was. Hair up in bangs with ribbon, flapper-type dress, roll-down hose, and lips painted in a bowl. Looked about 20 years old. Then what happened? She was alone. Invited me and made me go down and get my husband. I did. Then we both told her, quiet, shh, no noise, hush, not so loud, quiet. <laughs> she was too loaded to pay any attention. Grabbed my husband. Oh? For a Charleston. Sidney surprised. Indeed he did. Did the thing where the palms crossed over the knees like this. Mrs. Purdy. Only real good. I had to drag him out of there. Then I went back. Go on. Called her husband. Come get your drunken wife, I told him by phone. He told me to leave his wife alone, let her enjoy herself, and I don't like it, break the lease and move. Which I did. Well, here we are. And not having anything else at all to ask of Mrs. Purdy, leave her. And before the entrance into the squad car, turn briefly and steal one last glance. Mrs. Purdy, arms outstretched and upward, appreciating the day, making him to the sun leave. Cross town now to Riverside Drive and up. Second name on list of Mrs. Hunt's former tenants, Mr. Harvey Madison and his address. And be told by a young lady in gingham and mint julep that Harvey is to the tennis matches. And didn't I think that was crazy? Uh, mean, too. And no, sir, she didn't even know Harvey when he lived at that other place, so she couldn't give any information at all. And take the wilted hand she offers you and replace it on her julep, which somehow made her stumble, made her curtsy, made her wave farewell. Third name now, and address, a little further uptown, 93rd Street, Brownstone and door knocker of Brass Lion. Hello? It's Danny Clover. Please, come in. Thanks. You, Mr. Madison? Jeffrey Madison. Oh, uh, Mr. Madison. And that over there on the windowsill reading the Penny Dreadful is my brother Bobby. Twin brother. People 
Uh, girls have trouble knowing which is which. Uh, Bobby. Uh, Bobby, do something to let Danny Clover know that you know he's here. There. He knows you're here. Oh, but it was uh, me you wanted to see, wasn't it? Uh-huh. You're absolutely certain? Me, not my twin. A while back, you rented an apartment from Barbara Hunt. You're Danny Clover. Mm-hmm. Danny Clover who? Police. That's why you came right out first thing and said Barbara to me. That's why. She's dead. Yes. What about Barbara Hunt? Bubbly. Loads of fun. Forty-ish, but very bubbly. You rented the apartment from her and... Bobby and I. Bobby and you. And you got to know Mrs. Hunt and... And we were often invited to her place upstairs and there. And there what? We'll show you. Bobby, will you put on that record? You know the one I mean and... And do that... Look, uh, You wanted to know what, didn't you? Well, Bobby's going to show you. There. The way Bobby's dancing. That's what they did. Oh, nice, Bobby. <laughs> Very smooth, Arini. She invited you upstairs so Bobby could dance with her, is that it? Drink bathtub gin in Charleston and Maxie. Bobby's very good at those routines. Why, Barbara often said of him that he was like Valentino, sleek and dangerous. What did you do while your twin was dancing, Jeffrey? Why, Barbara even had a pair of gaucho pants made especially for Bobby and a Spanish hat and one of those I asked long... you something, Jeffrey. You ask what I was doing while Bobby and Barbara danced. You see, my interest hasn't wandered one bit. You got to tell me? Of course. I danced, too. With who? For Bobby, gay Barbara. For me... An old thing, 45-ish, old and cold. A rather dignified specimen of glacial ice. Who? She said, Billy. Call me Billy Bird, sweetums. Which I did, hating myself all the while. You can stop dancing, Bobby. Danny Clover has to go now. Oh, hello, Mr. Clover. Good evening, Mrs. Scott. May I come in? If you'd like. Now, what do you want? Who is it, Billy? What do you want, Mr. Clover? That was Nicky Hunt's voice, wasn't it? I ask you... Billy, who is it? Let's go in and chat with Nick, shall we? Hello, Nick. What was the big secret, Billy? You could have told me it was Clover. It doesn't concern you, and you're upset, Nick. What are you doing here, Nick? I'm not crying... That's one thing I'm doing here. I brought him home, Mr. Clover. He's the husband of a friend of mine, and she's dead. And this is a man who loved her very much. And I'm not crying. Why? Billy's been talking to me from the hospital on that my wife died happy and my wife died young, so why cry? What are you doing here, Clover? You know about cops, Nick. You remember how they stand, why they pay visits, especially on homicide cases? What's it got to do with Billy? I said... Especially on homicide cases, Nick. Billy. What, Nicky? Hey, Billy. You killed Barbara? You think I did, Nick? Well, he thinks so, don't you, Clover? It's a good bet. Clover don't look like the kind of man who bets very often, either. You kill her, Billy? Billy, you killed my wife? Oh, Nick. Oh, Nick. Oh, Nick. Billy. You're not going to understand. Well, then you tell me why. You better tell me why. Why'd you do that? I didn't say I did anything, Nick. Then you tell me, Clover. What went on in your wife's apartment, Nick? What you called her memory place? I never asked. Why not? I never asked. She'd come back fine. She'd get moody, she'd go there. She'd come back fine. Always alone. Always alone, wasn't she, Nick? Hey, why are you here, Clover. You didn't expect to find me here. What kind of questions would you ask if you hadn't found me? I'd ask Mrs. Scott about the twins. What are you talking about? About Jeffrey and his twin, Bobby. What about them, Mrs. Scott? Nick. What? They were Barbara's friends. What difference does that make now? I still want to know why Clover's here. How often were you with Barbara in that place, Mrs. Scott? First. First what? First, I want to tell you something. About me. About my life. You know what you are, Millie? Just listen to me. Will you listen? Go on. 
I married a man who was in stocks and bonds, a very intelligent man, respected. And I have a fine son. My son goes to the same private school that one of our vice presidents went to. Hey, you know what she used to do, Clover? Should I tell Clover you're right, Billy? And I have my charities, and I'm on several committees who do good work. For a girl who really couldn't dance, this was quite a And act. I'm proud of my stature in the community. And you hated yourself every time you came away from that place. She was crazy. Billy. Your wife was crazy, Nick. Well, you didn't have to kill her. Get me to come up here. And you know about me, Nick, and, and liquor? What happens to me? How I could never refuse a drink? You kept going back there. Oh, just to remember. To remember. But I'd I, I keep getting drunk. And, and hating myself for it. Hating myself. I have a fine boy and a husband who is in stocks and bonds. And I have a name in the community. So you killed her. So you killed her, Billy. Yes. Nick. Oh, she's dead now. It don't matter. Nick. It don't matter. You remember how it was 20, 30 years ago? All the things... I want a drink. Let's go, Mrs. I want a drink! I want a drink! I want a drink! Oh, Nicky. I I'm sorry, Nicky. Of course, let's go, Mr. Clover. <laughs> On Broadway, the night bursts open like a sudden flame. The crowd swarm appears, squeezed out from under the earth, roped off by the silhouettes of a thousand buildings. They dance their fury away against the time of morning till the sky soaks up the pain and turns it into dawn. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Lorene Tuttle was heard as Billy and Sheldon Leonard as Nick. Featured in the cast were High Everback, Marion Richmond, and George Neese. Bill Anders speaking. All aboard for Chicago, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Detroit, Baltimore, Cleveland, St. Louis, Washington, and Boston. Nine of the ten biggest cities in the United States. And yet more people listen to Jack Benny on radio every week than the total of their combined populations. Like to move in on them? Take the radio special. What? And remember, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense, is heard Monday evenings on the CBS Radio Network. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis.
On those rare evenings when Mike Shane and his lovely associate, Phyllis Knight, are not eagerly in pursuit of a criminal, they are just as eagerly in pursuit of pleasure. But tonight, they are not even together, and the reason seems a little mysterious. While Mike glumly putters around his apartment all alone, Phyllis, in her apartment, has a visitor, a handsome-looking woman who talks with nervous gestures. Now that I'm here, Miss Knight, I, I don't know how to begin. I asked to come here to your apartment tonight because I've got to talk to you. You I... don't have to apologize, Dr. Grant. You asked if we could be alone. We are. You just tell me in your own way. Well, Miss Knight, you've come to me as a patient to her doctor. Now I come to you not as a doctor, but as a woman, a woman in trouble. I, I've worried so about this thing. It's affected my work at the hospital. I, I can't sleep nights. I've I... never seen you like this before. Dr. Grant, is it about your business? About one of your patients? Oh, no, no. Oh. Is it about your husband? Well, no, not directly. It's... Oh, I was so stupid, so foolish. Oh, I think I understand. It's blackmail, isn't it? How did you know? From what you didn't tell me. I don't need to know what the situation is. You don't need to explain it. But whatever you do, you must not pay any blackmail. That's the awful part of it. I already have. Oh. When? Years ago. It was back in St. Louis. Now the man turns up here in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And now he wants more money. Five thousand dollars before midnight tonight. Oh, it, it wasn't anything criminal I did, Miss Knight. I was just foolish. And they made an example of me. They expelled me from medical school. I had my name changed legally and went to a different city and entered another medical college. As the years passed, I forgot all about it. I came to San Francisco and built up a fine professional reputation. J just a second. I, I want to make some notes. What is this man's name? John F. Hunt. I'm not afraid for my medical standing, Miss Knight. No one can hurt that. But it's my husband. Irvin is in politics. His reputation is spotless. But this man forced me to introduce him to Irvin. And Irvin has taken liking to him. Oh, I can see where that might lead. A man who would stoop to blackmail won't stop there. What am I going to do, Miss Knight? He's coming to the house tonight with some other guests. Dr. Grant, you know that Mr. Shane and I work on all our cases together. He, he's had considerably more experience with this type of case than would I he help me? Could he do something? Well, I haven't seen Mike fail yet on a blackmail case. Now, if you could invite us to your house tonight, you know, you could tell your husband that we're old friends. Well, of course. As I said, Irvin has already asked several political friends in for the evening. That's perfect. I'll telephone Mike right now, and then I want to get some more information from you. Hello, Angel. Mike! How'd you know? <laughs> I knew you'd get loans of for me. Oh, I'm just naturally weak, darling. Look, Mike, get shaved and put on a clean shirt. How huh? we're going calling tonight? A party? Mm -hmm. Oh, swell with you for some fun. Mm, not tonight, dear. It's going to be work. Dirty work. Oh, good evening, sir. Miss Knight and Mr. Shane. Oh, of course. Come in, come in. Thank you. My wife told me you were coming. I'm Irvin Grant. How I'm do you do? I know you. I'll take your coat, Miss Knight. The butler's mixing drinks. Oh, thank you. Say. Gee, that's a beautiful ship model on the table, sir. No, oh, isn't it? Clipper ship, Flying Cloud, made by an old sea captain. If you'll excuse me, I'll go find my wife for you. Thank you. Well... Seems like a right guy. Oh, yes. Dr. Grant's always talking about him. Very much in love with him. Oh, boy, oh, boy. That ship model intrigues me. I pawn my soul for one like that. <laughs> Phil. Phil, that sounded like a... It like... was. It came from the hall. Huh? The next room, Mike. The door closed. Mr. Shane, I heard a shot. Yes. This door is blocked. There's something against it. <clears throat> Mike, I think it's a body. Behind the door. It's John Hunt. I've never heard it. Oh. Where, what happened? What happened? It's Hunt. He's dead. Very dead. Bullet right through the heart. No, no, no. I don't see a gun anywhere. It means murder. Murder? No, 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 no. Call no, no. the inspector. Right away. Uh, Mr. Grant, Miss Knight and I came here tonight as your guests, but it so happens that we're private investigators. 
Now, may I ask if everybody in the house is present in this room? Why, yes, Mr. McGuire there and Mr. Davis. That's Collins, the butler, in the doorway and, and the cook. Good, good. Now, uh, the police will be here in a few minutes. For your own protection, while all of us are in sight of each other, I suggest you allow yourselves to be searched for a possible gun. Well, I guess that's all right. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not a police officer. I have no authority to search you. But this may save you a lot of unnecessary questioning later on. Very well, Mr. Shane. You may start with me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Mm-hmm. All right. And you, sir, I don't know your name. J. Hugh Davis. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Mm-hmm. Fine. Uh, next. No, I will not. Grant, this is an insult to your guests. I, I refuse to be searched. That's your privilege, sir. And now the butler. Uh, uh, Collins? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, swell. And the cook? Oh, no, monsieur. I have no gun. <laughs> well, perhaps we'd better wait until... Uh, I'll search you, Mike. The inspector said he'd be right over. But Good. I have no gun. I am afraid of guns. I don't blame you. All right. All right, that's all. And now, Phyllis, if Dr. Grant will permit you... Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> honey, wait. Uh, Mr. Grant, if you'll stay right here, we'll talk to her. Come on, honey. Please, Dr. Grant. You've got to get hold of yourself. I'd have paid him the blackmail. I'd have done anything to avoid this. Dr. Grant, <laughs> the police are bound to find out about the blackmail. You can't cover it up. Oh, no, 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 they mustn't. Well, they, they will, must. Doctor, they will. In fairness to yourself, you'd better tell your husband about Hunt first. No, I can't. Oh, of course you can, Doctor. He loves you. He'll understand. People have been blackmailed before. No, no, don't you realize? John Hunt was my brother. We'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. It used to be that washing a car meant the better part of a morning's work, with a lot of fancy equipment and getting wet besides. Well, times have changed. You can now do the same job in ten minutes without even changing your clothes if you use Union Luster Wash. All you do is empty a small package of Luster Wash into a pail of water, apply the mixture generously with an ordinary rag, and then rinse off with a hose. That's all. In 10 to 15 minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to tail light. Yes, it's as easy as that. Luster wash is harmless to the finish and your hands, yet cleans almost magically without scrubbing. That's because Union Luster Wash is not a soap, but a special detergent compound which dissolves road film, grease spots, and dirt on contact, leaving the surface clean and smooth. Luster Wash will clean glass and chromium, too, and you don't have to use a chamois afterwards. You can buy a package of Luster Wash for only ten cents at any Union Oil Minuteman station. One package is enough to wash any average car. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Luster Wash. Thank you. Mike and Phyllis find themselves guarding two very compromising and uncomfortable secrets. Secret number one, the man found murdered in Dr. Grant's house was blackmailing their client. Secret number two, he was their client's own brother. The inspector has just arrived on the scene, and Mike grows more and more uncomfortable under the inspector's question. Are you trying to tell me, Mike, that you were not called in to investigate this murder or to represent anyone? Well... <clears throat> Dr. Grant is Phyllis' physician inspector, and <clears throat> Phil suggested we stop in this evening for uh, a little visit, you know. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. And we'd hardly got inside the door, and we heard the gunshot. We ran down the hall and found the body here in the library. Mm-hmm. And who was the last person to see him alive? Don't any of you people know? Mike, don't you know? Well, I saw Dr. Grant and Mr. Hunt go into the library a few minutes before the shot. You're Arnold McGuire, aren't you? Why, yes, the Arnold McGuire of politics. And which of you is Dr. Grant? I am. Doctor, were you talking with Mr. Hunt at the time of the gunshot? No, I had just left him. I was on my way to the bedroom to fix my hair. I, uh, I've already searched everybody, Inspector, to see if they had guns, except Mr. McGuire, who objected. Oh, that's so? Mr. McGuire, I'll have to ask you to cooperate. I do not have a gun. I'm sorry, sir. What's that bulge inside your coat pocket? 
Business papers. They're confidential. They have no connection with this murder. Perhaps not. Oh, by the way, Mike, is the body here just as you found it? No, not quite, Inspector. Mr. Hunt fell against the door and I had to push it open. And that moved the body? Yeah. You can see where the bullet went through the front of his coat. Made a nice clean hole. No powder burns. Mm -hmm. Means the bullet came from a distance. I'd say not less than 15 feet. Well, but this is a very small room, Inspector. You'd have to fire the gun uh, way over in the far corner to be 15 feet from the body. The uh, shot could have come through the doorway. There are four doors opening into the library. Yeah. From the position of the body here, it's in line with all four doors. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Make a list of everything in the victim's pockets and take a set of his fingerprints. Right away, sir. Can any of you uh, tell us who Mr. Hunt was and what he did? He was a friend of my wife, sir, from back in St. Louis. Uh Uh-huh. He wasn't employed at the moment. I was thinking of adding him to my staff. Mr. Davis here is so overworked. I see, and Mr. Davis is... I'm Mr. Grant's political manager. I see. Well, now let's find out where all you people were at the time the shot was fired. Dr. Grant said she was on her way to the bedroom. Now, where is that located, Doctor? It was the downstairs bedroom. That door there leads to it. The door on the left, Mike. And you, Mr. Grant? Why, I think I was in the hall. I was looking for my wife. Then I saw Mr. Shane trying to push the library door open. Mm-hmm. And Mr. McGuire? Why, I was in the living room. That's through the second doorway on the right there. And I was in the dining room eating a sandwich. That would be the first door on the right, Mr. Uh, Davis? Yes. <laughs> then you were all separated. No two p- people in the same room. And all had access to the library. What about the servants? I am Collins, sir. I was in the butler's pantry mixing some cocktails. Hmm? The cook was in the kitchen right next to me. We, oui, monsieur, that is the truth. We heard the bang and I was almost scared to death. Where is the kitchen and the butler's pantry? In the other wing of the house, sir. Do you suppose the shot could have come through this window here? How could it? The windows were closed and no bullet hole... There's no bullet hole through the glass. No, no, and it must be ten or twelve feet down to the ground. Oh, Inspector. What is it, Sergeant? So I found this check, uh... Crumpled up in Hunt's hand. Let's see. Pay to the order of John F. Hunt. Five hundred dollars. Signed, John Hugh Davis. What is this, Mr. Davis? I... Why, that's just a check I gave him on a business deal. It was a personal matter. Mm-hmm. Business deal? Why, Davis, I thought you were so bitterly against my hiring Hunt. I was, so far as your business was concerned. But for my purposes, he was quite all right. I think we'd better take a look at Mr. Hunt's living quarters. Maybe we'll find out about some of these personal business deals and why someone wanted to kill him. Here's his address from the wallet, Inspector. Want to go along, Mike? Well, I doubt we'll find much, Inspector. I got a hunch the solution is right here in this house. And just the same we'll check up. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Nobody is to leave this house till we get back. Yes, sir. Uh, Collins, will you find my coat for me, please? Of course, ma'am. Mike, uh... You and Phil and I have been friends for a long time, haven't we? Oh, I guess for more years than Phil would like to admit. Yeah, you two have helped me out on many a case. You've always played fair with me in the police department. What are you driving at, Inspector? I know that you kids didn't come here just for an innocent social evening. And I noticed, Mike, that when I started to question Dr. Grant, you switched me off on another track. What are you holding out on me? Okay, Inspector, okay, but you've got to keep this under your skullcap. I can't promise that. Well, I think you will when you know. John Hunt was blackmailing Dr. Grant. Blackmailing? Why didn't you tell me? There's our motive. Oh, no, don't be silly, Inspector. Dr. Grant came to my apartment and told me the whole story an hour before the murder. Well, she wouldn't tell me and and, and invite us to a party and kill a man with all those people around. All right, but she did give you a lead that would help us. Well, I can't remember everything she said, but I took notes in shorthand as she talked. All right, Phil, let's have them. Your coat, ma'am. Oh, yes, thank you. I-, I left the notes in my apartment. Mike, you give me the keys and I'll run over and pick them up, huh? Okay. And while you're doing that, Phil, Mike and I'll explore the apartment of John F. Hunt. <laughs> Telephone bills, gas bills, hands, old laundry list. Mike, the desk is crammed with junk, but nothing that matters. Well, that's what I expected. Hunt was too smart a guy to leave anything important lying around for some... Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I take that back. What? Here's a manila folder in this bureau drawer. Hmm. Some clippings with a photograph pinned to them. Snapshot of a boy and girl in a canoe. Yeah, and some writing on the back. Malcolm and Mary, June 12, 1914. Hey, look at this first clipping underneath the photo. Legal notice. Change of name from Mary Boyd to Mary Allen. And, and the next one. Prominent attorney marries woman doctor. 
Last night, Irving Grant was wed to Dr. Mary Allen in a simple ceremony at... Mike, this is a file on Dr. Grant, alias Mary Allen, alias Mary Boyd. Uh, yes, yes, I know. John F. Hunt is another alias. He was her brother. I see. Of course, you didn't let me in on that little fact. Now, how much more do you know? That's all, Inspector. That's all. The whole works. You sure of it? Positive. And before you start jumping to conclusions, Inspector... Do you know if the sergeant took those fingerprints on, of Hunt? Yeah, I got them in an envelope here. Well, then I suggest we go down to headquarters and see if we can collect some local color on Brother John. Good idea, but what about Phil? Well, I'm calling her now. Hello? Uh, it's Mike, Angel. Oh, I'm typing these notes, Mike. Well, listen, the inspector and I are going down to headquarters fingerprint checkup. You want to meet us there? Oh, sure thing. Be there in a few minutes. Okay, Angel. I'll see you at headquarters. Well, Mike, looks like we struck the jackpot. Here's the card file on our man. Hmm. Under the name Malcolm Boyd. John F. Hunt must be a new alias. Yeah. 1931 St. Louis. Forgery conviction... Three years, Missouri State Prison. 1935, New York, forgery and blackmail. Nine years, Sing Sing. Wow. 1945, San Francisco, drunk charge. Uh-uh, Mike. Seems to me more and more little details you didn't bother to tell me. This is the first I've heard about it, Inspector. Believe me, and I'm just as, sh as sore as you are. Dr. Grant should have told Phyllis and me. We're entitled to know these things. Yeah. Dr. Grant may be a reputable physician. She may be married to a prominent man. But when her brother is blackmailing her, a brother who is an ex-convict, well, I couldn't give her a better motive for murder. Agreed, Inspector, but I saw the way she reacted when she first saw the body. No matter what Hunt had done to her, she was still his sister. And Irving Grant was still his brother-in-law. Grant? Yeah. Maybe this wasn't such a well-kept secret after all. Maybe Grant discovered his wife was being blackmailed. But his brother-in-law was an ex-convict. How do we know that Mr. Grant didn't kill the man to save his wife and to protect... Protect his own reputation. Mm. No answer for that, huh, Mike? I was just thinking. Pretty much the same could be said about Grant's manager, Mr. Davis. You noticed how uncomfortable he got when we found his check for 500 bucks crumpled in Hunt's hand? Just a personal business deal, says Davis. But I'll bet it was more blackmail. Yeah, very probably. And Mr. McGuire, why wouldn't they let us search him? What were those private confidential papers in his pocket which he wouldn't show us? Yeah, both men are suspects. But, Mike... Don't try to kid me by laying down a smoke screen. I'm still going to follow the trail of your client and her husband. Well, I can't argue with you, Inspector. Phil talked to Dr. Grant, and Phil knows more about the case than I do. Let's call it her, her apartment and see if she's found anything in those notes, huh? She may be on her way over here right now. Hello? Hello, Angel. Hello? Put down that phone, sister. You ain't talking to anybody. Uh, how, how did you... Who are you? Hang up that phone. <laughs> what does this mean? Don't. <laughs> don't you dare. Oh, don't try to bust past me, sister. You ain't going no place. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. Ladies and gentlemen, would you like to be able to wash your car in ten minutes without having to change clothes and at a cost of only ten cents? Well, that's just how easy it is with Union Oil Company's Luster Wash. All you do is empty a package of Luster Wash into a pail of water. Apply the mixture generously over the surface with an ordinary rag and then rinse off with a hose. That's all there is to it. In 10 to 15 minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to taillight without mess or scrubbing. That's because Luster Wash is not a soap, but a special detergent compound which dissolves grease spots, road film, and dirt on contact. Luster Wash is harmless to your hands, yet eliminates the hard work of old-fashioned methods. It makes glass and chromium sparkle, too, and you don't have to use a chamois afterwards. You can buy a package of Luster Wash for only 10 cents at any Union Oil Minuteman station. One package is enough to wash any average car. 
Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Luster Wash, the new easy way to wash your car. Phyllis is still in her apartment, but very unwillingly. A strange man is pointing a gun at her heart. You... You're insane if you think you can get away with this. I'm doing it, ain't I? Now, for the last time, hand over those notes on Dr. Grant. Well, you've got them. I just finished typing them. No, no, them. no. I want the rest of them. This stuff don't mean anything. But that's all there is. What did you think Dr. Grant told me? Trying to be smart, huh? Sorry, I ain't telling you. Hand over those notes, or do I have to slap you around? Phil! Phil! My... Shut I... up! One sound out of you, and I'll kill you. You're, you're caught. It's Mike. And the inspector, you can't get away. Phil, honey, open the door. Answer me. Tell him to wait a minute. J- just a minute, Mike. Now, I'm going to stand behind the door. You open it and tell him to come in. If you make one squawk, one little tip, I'll let you have it right in the back. Now, go on. Well, they... Well, they're, they're gone. The hall's empty. Yeah. Maybe it's a trick. You bet it is. Hands in the air. Hand over your gun. Mike. Mike, he wanted my notes on Dr. Grant. I gave them to him, but he kept saying there were more, and there aren't. Then Dr. Grant knew something about this guy, and he killed John Hunt. Huh. No any more gags? Plenty. All right, Inspector, let's take him back to the house. We're going to find out who he's working for. <laughs> Shane, I've never seen this man before in my life. It's an insult to even think I'd have anything to do with a criminal. I say the same. This thing has gone far enough. Then if we're to believe all of you people, nobody here knew this man. No. no. Well, it means just one thing. Somebody is lying. That man is the murderer, and you've caught him, and yet you accuse us. No. No, he's not the murderer, Mr. McGuire. If he had killed Hunt, he wouldn't be afraid to murder Miss Knight. Instead, he argued around with her, and you haven't told us why he went to Miss Knight. What was he threatening her about? I uh, prefer not to explain that, Mr. Grant. But uh, he was working for somebody here who... Tommy Rott, he killed Hunt. He sneaked up to the window and shot him. That's impossible. The window was 10 or 12 feet from the ground and the windows were closed. Wait a minute, Inspector. Wait a minute. Maybe that's it. Phil, after we heard the shot, how long did it take us to get into the library here? Oh, I'd say less than 60 seconds. And did you smell any gun smoke in the room? No. No, I didn't smell anything. You wouldn't. If the windows were open and the shot came from outside... Well, then somebody must have closed the windows during all the excitement, Mike. But, Mike, we decided the shot came through one of these doors. The body is completely out of range of the window. Yes, but where was Hunt standing when he was hit? Uh, how do we know he wasn't standing right here by this desk in full view of the window? Before he died, he could have staggered clear over to the hall door. Mike, a man would have to be 12 feet tall to fire through that window. No, Inspector, no, he wouldn't have to be 12 feet tall, and he did shoot through this window. I understand it now. All right, show me. I'll open the window. Now. Now, will all of you people go back to where you were when you heard the shot? We're going to fire a gun again, and you're to tell us if it sounds the same way. You too, Collins. You and the cook go into the kitchen. Uh, Yes, sir. Uh, Sergeant. Sergeant, will you please stand in any one of these four doorways, it doesn't matter which, and fire a blank cartridge. Now, give uh, Phil and me about 15 seconds to get the outside entrance. Yes, sir. I'll come along with you, kid. Hey, uh, I remember Mike was admiring that ship model when we heard the shot. Yeah, I see it. There it goes. All right, honey, how did that sound to you? Oh, no, it wasn't the same shot at all. This one was much louder. That's right, because the bullet which killed Hunt was fired from outside the house by somebody inside the house. Mike, that sounds impossible. How? Who? Come on, come on, follow me. This is the butler's pantry. Yes, yeah, clear in the other wing of the house. Just you, Jane. I heard the shot, but I told Monsieur Collins it did not sound right. Thank you, Ivy, thank you. Now, Inspector, you will notice if you will look out this pantry window here on an angle, you can see the library in the other wing. Yeah. I'll raise the window. Now, now, all I have to do is take my gun, lean out the window. I see. The shot would sound as if fired outdoors. Yes. And if I fired now... As I'm aiming my gun, the bullet would go right through that open library window and hit the library desk. But, Monsieur Stane, there was nobody in here. Monsieur Collins was mixing cocktails right there. I was making sandwiches in the next room. Of course. I was talking to Ivy all the time. 
I had the cocktail shaker in my hand. And uh, a gun in the other hand, Collins. When the cook wasn't looking, you leaned out of the window. You're crazy. No. No, Collins, it has to be you. You see, besides the inspector and myself, you were the one who knew Miss Knight was going to her apartment to get those notes. When you brought her her coat, you overheard us. You were afraid of what was in those notes, so you phoned your pal to get them away from Miss Knight. This whole thing is cockeyed. You know, Collins, you sound less and less like a butler and more like an ex con Oh, you... Grab him, Inspector. Wait, wait a minute. Wait. Uh-oh. He reached for this cupboard. Let's see. Aha. The missing gun. And one bullet fired. That's all, Collins. I think you'd better wear these. For safety's sake. Inspector, would you mind... Leave it to me, Mike. Murder's solved, and I think the motive is something of interest only to the district attorney. Come in, come in, Inspector. Mike's been reheating the coffee for you. I was longer at headquarters than I figured. Oh, hi, Inspector. Well, did he confess? Yeah, pretty much as we expected. Collins served time in the penitentiary with the guy who broke into Phil's apartment. Two of them met Hunt in prison and found out Hunt was planning to blackmail his wealthy sister when he got out. So they decided to cut themselves in, eh? That was it. Hunt was working with them for a while. He got Collins into Dr. Grant's home as a butler, so Collins could keep an eye on things for him. Then Hunt got bigger and grander ideas of blackmail and started to cheat the other two. That was his fatal mistake. Oh, and I suppose Collins figured he knew as much of the dope as Hunt, so why split the money three ways? Exactly. And Mr. McGuire and Davis, they were like the others on the wrong end of Hunt's blackmail. The paying end. Huh? I, I wonder, wonder who, who that, that could be. be. Excuse me. Yes? There are my chains. Oh, then it's for me. Well, thanks. A package. Look, a big one. Who's it from, Mike? Well, wait a minute. Let's see. It's from Irving Grant. Well, open it for Pete's sake. Oh, 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 oh. boy. Phil. <gasps> Phil, it's Grant's ship model, the flying cloud. Oh, the one you admired in his house. I wonder. You suppose he knew he did know the truth about Hunt? But this is his, well, his way of thanking us? It could be. Oh, Mike, it's beautiful. I know just where it should go, on the table in the bay window. Uh-uh. uh-uh. No, no, I want it. I want it over the fireplace. Oh no, no, Mike! It'll look perfect in the window with the harbor as a background. Huh? Andrew, wait a minute. Whose apartment is this? Oh, well, it's yours right now, but I have hopes. <laughs> <laughs> again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Charles Dan. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. George Atkins at Northwest Indemnity. Oh, hiya, Georgie. How'd you like to go to New York, Johnny, and get into the game mad world of the theater? Thanks a lot, Georgie, but no thanks. I'm not the grease paint type. I know, but Amy Bradshaw is. Amy Bradshaw? Yeah, we wrote a policy on her a couple years ago. Look, if it's her autograph you want, why send me? It's not that simple. Anyhow, she's got all the fans she wants. I know, I'm one of them. I think she's great. Johnny, looks like somebody's trying to kill her. Georgie, I'll be right over.
tonight and every weekday night. Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Northwestern Indemnity Alliance, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amy Bradshaw matter. Expense account item one, $16.50. Transportation and incidentals to New York City. I checked in at the hotel and then went over to the Criterion Theater on West 44th, where Amy was starring in a play called The Unguarded Hour. David Coleman, the director, was standing in the wings watching the third act on stage. Let me see, darling. There's no other David Coleman? Yes? I'm Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator, sent over by Northwestern Indemnity. Oh, uh, yes, Mr. Dollar, I called them. Uh, let's go over here where we can talk. Okay. How's the play going? Well, 22 weeks now. I've been going along just fine until this business came up. How did it start? Last evening, just before curtain time, I dropped by Amy's dressing room. She looked, well, strange. How so? Pale, trembling. She was staring at a note in her hand that sounded like some sort of crank note. Do you know, uh, you are an evil woman. You will be punished by sudden death, unquote. Have you reported this to the police? Oh, no. Uh, I was afraid that if I did, it might get into the papers, and we don't want that kind of publicity. I see. How about if I talk to Amy after the show? I told her you'd be down, and she'll talk to you. All good. Well, um, Mr. Dollar... The strain of this whole thing is beginning to show up in her performance. She's making mistakes, and it rattles the cast, especially the young ingenue, Sheila Mitchell. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll see what I can do. There's always the possibility that it is just a crank note and that Amy will never hear any more of it. Well, that's what I'm hoping. But we might as well face another possibility, that somebody close to Amy is using the crank note as a cover. Has that thought ever occurred to you? Why, no... No, it hasn't, Mr. Dollar. We will continue with the Bradshaw matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. Now, first you get Bounce-O the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now, hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus, guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly Holy happy Santa, he stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored, preformed, sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost? Just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovely giants will turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund, but keep the giant talking sat as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush one dollar and ten cents for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. I waited for Amy Bradshaw in her dressing room at the theater. 
Fifty minutes later, after the final curtain, she swept in. Oh, there you are, Mr. Dodd. I'd never seen her from closer than the 15th row before. Needless to say, I was impressed. But I didn't have a chance to say so. I didn't have a chance to say anything. Oh, well, that's the way it goes. If you'll just give me a minute to get some of this makeup off. Now? Now. Hi. Hi. I knew it was only a question of time until you ran down. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I get a little overcharged out on the stage. Sure. Listen, it's nice meeting you, Mr. Dollar, and I know why you've come down here, but I think you're wasting your time. Oh? Yeah. This whole thing's really pretty silly, you know. I hope so, Miss Bradshaw. You mean Amy. Okay, Amy. Say, look, uh, how about having a drink with me somewhere? We can talk about it. I'd love to, but I'm afraid I have a date tonight. Could we make it tomorrow, maybe? Sure, okay, any time. You... Excuse me. Come in. Oh, Mike. Oh, hello, Amy. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you had company. That's all right. This is Johnny Dollar. Johnny, Mike Pomeroy, my agent. Mr. Pomeroy, how are you? What would you think of it tonight, Mike? Well, they seem to like it okay. Oh. Uh, tell you what, Amy, I'll see you tomorrow, eh? Uh, tomorrow, Mike? I've got a few things I've got to take care of tonight. Uh, contacts to go over, you know, th- things like that. I... Oh, of course. Well, glad to meet you, Dollar. Uh, night, Amy. Is that offer of a drink still good, Johnny? Well, sure, but I thought you said you have... Oh, oh, sure, let's go. Thanks for understanding. Anywhere in particular? There's a little place right down the street, small and quiet. Good. Oh. What's the matter? Would you mind if we crossed the stage and went out the other door? Oh, no. Why? I think someone's waiting for me outside this exit. Oh. Sort of a friend of mine, Porter Kane, but... He can be a little wearing, and I'm rather tired. Sure. I could see him through the open door. A thin-faced, rather elegant-looking man in a black Homburg. We went out the other side and down the street to a bar a few doors away. Item two on expense account. Four dollars. Drinks. After the first one, Amy relaxed a little. I wanted to get her talking about herself, and it wasn't too tough to do. There's not really much to tell about me. I've been acting a long time. Sometimes it seems too long. I've come a long way. Some people would say up. I hope it is. <laughs> you make it sound pretty simple, Amy. I guess we do what we have to. All of us. I had to act, so. So, just like that, huh? <laughs> just like that. You've always gotten everything you wanted, haven't you? I think so. Hasn't anyone ever gotten in your way? No, Johnny, that's never happened. If it did... It looks to me like somebody's standing in your way right now. What do you mean? That threatening letter you got the other day. I told you. The whole thing's silly. There's nothing to it. Now, that's what you told me. But I don't think you believe it. Okay. So maybe I have worried a little about it. I I wouldn't have if it hadn't been... It was probably only my imagination. What was, Amy? Well, last night after the show, I felt like walking a little. I went west on 44th Street to Times Square, and as usual, it was crowded. I stood on the curb waiting for the light to change, and suddenly I got shoved out into the street. Oh? Right out into the traffic. I jumped back just in time. You see who did it? How can you tell in a crowd like that? I know. It was probably only coincidence that it happened right after I got that note, but... Oh, Johnny, I, I still just can't believe anybody is really trying to do me harm, but... I guess... What's been making me nervous during the performance is staring out at that blackness past the footlights, wondering if there's somebody out there who hates me. Uh Uh-huh. I guess I can't stand being hated, Johnny. I've got to be loved. Look, Amy, did it ever occur to you this might not be a crank out in the audience, that it might be someone closer to you? What? Johnny, that's impossible. Is it? I don't have many friends. They've mostly to do with the play, but those I have are good ones. Who else besides your agent, Pomeroy? How about the director? David Coleman. He's a very old friend and one of the best. How about the producer? Emery's the last person in the world who'd wish me harm. On a dollars and cents basis, if nothing else, he and Dora both. Dora? His wife. I like her very much. Does she like you? Why shouldn't she? What about this man you wanted to duck tonight? The one who was waiting outside the theater? Porter Kane. Oh, he's... A sort of a fan, I guess. A little eccentric, maybe, but he's been very good to me. Um, Johnny, really, it couldn't be any of them. Maybe, maybe not. 
Look, Amy, I was sent down here because Northwestern Indemnity holds a policy on you. I know. Now, who's the beneficiary? William York. Who's he? My husband. You're... Oh. I didn't know you were married. We separated six months ago. What I wanted, he didn't. What he wanted, I didn't. It's as simple as that. Well, where is he now? Here in New York somewhere, I guess. I don't know. He's a writer, sort of. Johnny, I'm tired. Oh, yeah, sure you must be. I'm sorry I kept you so long. Oh, no, I didn't mean that. It's been nice. Very nice. It's funny. I seem to relax a little when I'm with you. We let that one lay and went outside. Item three on expense account, two dollars. Taxi to Amy's apartment. There was a car parked two doors down with a man just sitting in it. I saw Amy give it a quick look. Then as she said goodnight to me at the door, I noticed that she slipped the catch on it. I sauntered across the street and stepped into the shadows. A moment later, the door of the parked car opened and her agent, Mike Pomeroy, got out and went into the apartment house. Then I realized I wasn't the only one watching this. Half a block down the street, I could see a figure in a shadowy doorway. I ran toward him, but he took off around the corner. When I reached the corner, he was nowhere in sight. Amy might have been taking this thing only half seriously, but I was real serious about it now. She said she had some very nice friends. But I had a strong hunch that one of these very nice friends was out to kill her. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar. Some up to three feet tall. You get Bounce the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa. A roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That's six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today, you may never hear this offer again. Rush $1 plus 10 cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents for each set with your name and address to Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of the Amy Bradshaw Matter. Tomorrow, the Criterion Theater again, and a third-act curtain that wasn't in the script. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Al Sintella down at Precinct Headquarters, Johnny. Oh, hi, Al. Sorry I missed your call a few minutes ago. What's on your mind? An actress named Amy Bradshaw. Amy? One of my favorites. Me too. But right now I seem to be looking for a guy who doesn't feel that way about her. Huh? Al, it looks like somebody's trying to kill Amy Bradshaw. Better come down here and tell me all about it. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, New York City. To the Northwestern Indemnity Alliance, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amy Bradshaw matter. The threat of an attempt on her well-insured life. Expense account item 5, $1.75. Cab from my hotel to precinct headquarters to talk to Detective Lieutenant Al Centella. Al looked about the same as the last time I'd seen him. Rugged, competent, maybe a few pounds heavier. Sit down, Johnny, sit down. Thanks. Something about Amy Bradshaw, you said. Yeah. Didn't know you were a friend of hers. Northwestern Indemnity holds a $25,000 life insurance policy on her. Here, take a look at this note. Amy got it several days ago. You are evil. You will be punished by sudden death. Oh, come on now, Johnny. A couple of nights ago, after the show, somebody shoved Amy off the curb and out into the traffic over in Times Square. Well, the same thing happens to me almost every time I'm around Times Square. You know what I smell in all this? Oh, sure. You probably smell a publicity stuff. I sure do. You think I'd fall for a thing like that? You known Amy Bradshaw very long? No. I'd seen her in a few shows, but last night was the first time I'd ever met her in person. If I didn't know you pretty well, I'd say you might be getting a little stage struck on her. Uh Uh-huh. What about the man who trailed Amy to her apartment last night? Oh? Who? I don't know. I chased him, but he had too much of a lead on me. I still wouldn't go jumping to any conclusions. Who you got to work on, for instance? Well, for one, David Coleman, her director. Then there's the producer, Emery Taylor, and his wife, Dora. From what Amy said, I gather Dora doesn't like her very well. Anybody else? And there's her agent, Mike Pomeroy. She seems to be pretty wrapped up in him. Old stable fool, huh? Yeah, looks like it. Also, a fellow named Porter Kane, who's usually hanging around the theater waiting for Amy. And finally, the man I really came to talk to you about. Who's that? Name is Bill York, her husband, but they're separated. Oh? She doesn't know where he is. You figure he might tie in somehow? He is the beneficiary of Amy's insurance policy. Well, I'll see if I can turn up an address on him for you. Okay, thanks, Al. In the meantime, I think I'll pay a call on this Porter Kane. See if I can find out just how good a fan he is. We will continue with the Bradshaw matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. Now, first you get Bounce-O the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now, hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus, guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly-poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, Giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored, preformed, sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost? Just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush $1 plus 10 cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals, Box 1730 Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund, but keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1730, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 1730. That's Box 1730, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 1730, Grand Central Station, New York City. Expense account item 6, 225. Cab to the apartment of Porter Kane in the East 70s. It was an expensive-looking place. I got there about noon, but Porter Kane was just finishing breakfast, accompanied by Chopin. May I offer you a cup of coffee, Mr. Dollar? Oh, thanks. A blank, please. Yes. Now, you uh, came to see me about Amy Bradshaw, I believe. That's right, Mr. Kane. 
I represent Northwestern Indemnity Alliance. They hold a policy on Miss Bradshaw. You perhaps want some sort of character reference on her? You, uh, might put it that way. Well, in that case, you couldn't have come to one better qualified than I. You see, Amy is my career at present. Afraid I don't understand, Mr. Kane. Well, some years ago, I was relieved of the sordid but customarily necessary task of working for my bread and butter. The result is that I have been able to devote myself to a fascinating hobby. What kind of a hobby? I collect things. Oh? The objects of my interest vary, but uh, they all have one thing in common. Oh? This signet ring I'm wearing, for instance. Yes, I noticed it. Very unusual. The crest is that of the Medici family, Renaissance Italy. The only ring of its kind in the world, so far as any of the authorities on that period are aware. Uh, That uh, vase on the table. The painting on the wall. Uh, That sculpture. One of a kind, huh? Precisely. Precisely. Which brings us quite logically to Amy, who is clearly one of a kind. So? So I plan to add Amy to my collection. Just like that, huh? I'm certain Amy will see it my way in time. And I have time. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must dress for the matinee. Uh, Will I see you again, Mr. Dollar? Yes. You probably will, Mr. Kane. I was glad to get out of the hothouse atmosphere of Kane's apartment. Real weird, this character. And I had a hunch I'd better keep an eye on him. Item 7, $1.65, cab fare that evening to the Criterion Theater. I arrived half an hour before curtain time and headed for Amy's dressing room. Then as I approached her door... You'll listen real careful. I'll give it to you once again. You've been tossing wrong cues to Sheila for three nights now. You've been doing everything you can to upstage her and make her look bad. Mike, it's just that I've been nervous lately. Maybe I have made a few mistakes in my life. Amy, lines, but... you know I've got plans for Sheila, and I don't want her looking bad in this play. You've got plans for Sheila. What about us? Amy, we can talk about that some other time. But for now, I just want you to understand. You're to lay off Sheila. I mean it. Is that a threat, Mike? Take it any way you like. It sounded like Pomeroy was coming outside, so I ducked around behind a piece of scenery and waited a moment. Then I went back to Amy's door. Oh, Johnny. Hello, Amy. You look tired. I am. I just had a little go around with Mike. Pomeroy? Uh huh. I've been fluffing some of my lines lately. He seems to think I've been doing it deliberately to make Sheila Mitchell look bad, but he's wrong. Have you found out anything yet, Johnny? No, not much. I still can't believe there's anything to it. It's so silly to let it upset me. Silly even to give it a thought. Well, try not to, Amy. Let me worry about it. All right. Did I ever tell you it's nice having you around? Johnny. I left her dressing room and started for the alley door, but somebody stepped out in front of me. It was Mike Pomeroy. Hello, Dollar. Oh, hi, Pomeroy. I was just talking to Dave Coleman, the director. He told me uh, he was the one who sent for you. He told me why. You didn't know about the threatening letter Amy got? No, no, I didn't. Look, uh, Dollar, every actress I've ever known has gotten at least one note like that during her career. You don't think this should be taken too seriously, then? No. Amy's pretty nervous these days. And as long as you're around stirring things up, she'll be worried about it. If there's anything to be done about it, I can handle it. In other words, you want me to mind my own business, that it? You said that, Dollar. I didn't. It might not be a bad idea. Funny thing. When somebody tells me to lay off a case, my interest in it always doubles. After the final curtain, I went backstage to wait for Amy. The stage door was open, and I could see Porter Kane waiting in the alley outside. So I went over to him. Well, Mr. Dollar, good evening. Hello, Kane. On duty again tonight? Perhaps that's one way of putting it. I thought I might have a little chat with Amy after she's changed. I'm afraid she has a date. Oh? Do you happen to know with whom? Yeah, me. Uh, Mr. Dollar, are you suggesting that I'm to regard you as some sort of rival? Not at all, Kane. I'm just suggesting that I'm a friend of Amy's. I see. Good night, Mr. Dollar. After Kane left, I stood beside the stage door and tried to figure out some of the angles on this case. There were too many of them. 
By the time I went in, the theater was dark, except for a dim light bulb over the stage, and everyone had gone. Everybody, that is, except Amy. I ran into the darkened theater. She was standing horrified next to the stairway by the dressing rooms, her eyes fixed on something that lay on the floor. Johnny! I was on my way out to meet you. I heard a swish through the air. This heavy sandbag. It barely missed me. Oh, Johnny! Stay back against the wall, Amy. You'll be okay there. I climbed the long ladder up to the catwalk above the stage where they sometimes use the sandbags to balance hunks of scenery. It was dark up there. I started edging along the catwalk. Suddenly, my foot hit a loose board. I almost lost my balance. A loose board that could have been left for me. And it was a long, long drop down to the stage. Whoever had been up there knew the theater pretty well. Finally, I went back down to Amy. She was trembling. Johnny. It's okay, Amy. It's okay. Johnny. Maybe I didn't take it seriously before, but I do now. Somebody dropped that sandbag from up there deliberately. Somebody is trying to kill me, and I'm scared, Johnny. I'm scared. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar. Some up to three feet tall. You get Bounceo the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa. A roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That's six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 1730, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today, you may never hear this offer again. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1730, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents for each set with your name and address to Giant Animals, Box 1730, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of the Amy Bradshaw Matter. Tomorrow, a man steps onto the stage from out of the past and into a role he doesn't want to play. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Al Centella at police headquarters, Johnny. Yeah. You hear what happened at the Criterion Theater after the show last night? I was off duty when you called, but Sergeant Rogers gave me a fill-in this morning. So somebody tried to drop a sandbag on Amy Bradshaw backstage. Yeah, a real near miss. You still think these attempts on her life are publicity stunts? No, uh, looks like your hunch was right. I'll have a couple of my boys keep an eye on Amy. Thanks. Johnny... You wanted to know the whereabouts of this guy, Bill York, the husband Amy separated from... What have you got on him, Al? 768 West 4th Street, down in Greenwich Village. Thanks. I'll check it. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. New York City, expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. 
to the Home Office, Northwestern Indemnity Alliance, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amy Bradshaw matter. Expense account item 8, 275. Taxi from my hotel to Greenwich Village to try and locate a writer named Bill York, who had separated from Amy six months ago. Amy was a good actress, but she couldn't hide the fact she was plenty scared by the attempts on her life in the last three days. My hunch was it was someone close to Amy, and Bill York was very much on my list. After all, he was the beneficiary on her life insurance policy. I hadn't been to this part of the village in two or three years, but from the looks of it, it hadn't changed a bit. Defiantly shabby and run down. A few beards here and there, a few gals with long, straight hair. Bookstores and bars, side by side. I checked at the address Al Centella had given me. It was a beat-up old rooming house. You come down here to interview the famous writer, something like that? Not exactly. Too bad. Here I thought you wanted to carry my message to America. No, I'm afraid that's a little out of my department, Mr. York. Amy did mention that you were a writer. I can tell you exactly what she said. She said, you know, uh, Bill's a writer, uh, sort of, right? (laughs) Well, as a matter of fact... Amy always felt it necessary to apologize for me. That was one thing about our marriage that was always so charming. Well, look, I didn't come here to discuss your marriage, York. I don't know what you're so bitter about. It's none of my business, but... Well, darling, what do I have to be bitter about? Here I am, an artist... Living an unfettered life of freedom in Greenwich Village, what more could I ask? I guess I haven't read any of your books. Don't worry about it. You're in good company. You and the publishers. Oh, that's too bad. Must make a little problem in the grocery department. Oh, that doesn't worry me. You see, one can always manage to live comfortably in huck. Oh? And if one is willing to huck his soul, of course the returns are much greater. I don't get you. That's not surprising, because nobody else but me would call it my soul. It's just the manuscript for an unpublished novel. Three years of work and sweat and pain. But my clever pawnbroker, Mr. Pomeroy, has a fair idea what it means to me. Mike Pomeroy, Amy's agent? Charming chap. Quite shrewd. In other words, if you could raise some money, you could get this brainchild of yours out of hock from him. Tell me... How long has it been since you've seen Amy? Several months. Why? You haven't been uptown near her apartment the last few days, huh? No. You sure? Of course. Anything else? No. Not for now. We will continue with the Bradshaw matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. Now, first you get Bounce-O the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now, hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus, guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly-poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, Giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored preformed sturdy latex which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost? Just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals, Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund. But keep the giant talking Santa's our gift. 
Order Now supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 1870. That's Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. I was getting nowhere in my attempt to find out who was gunning for Amy Bradshaw, and I knew it. I called Mike Pomeroy, her agent, but he was out, so I took the next name on my list, the producer of Amy's play, Emery Taylor. Expense account item 9, 175, cab fare to Taylor's apartment in the mid-50s near the Museum of Modern Art. Taylor wasn't in, but his wife Dora was. She was sleek-looking and a little on the brittle side. She was sitting behind a small bar in the den, and she looked quite at home there. Drink? Thanks. Will your husband be back soon, Mrs. Taylor? Who knows? Yeah. Oh, thank you. What do you want to see him about? Amy Bradshaw. What about Amy Bradshaw? I wanted to ask him if he knew of anyone who might want to harm Amy for any reason. Oh, I could answer that better than Emery. There is someone? There certainly is. Who? Me. Why? Would you like it if your husband was knocking himself out for your... Well, for a younger woman? Well, now, isn't that part of the business? Is it? That's not all. Amy's hurt plenty of people getting where she is. Do you think your husband's one of them? I hope not. Who has she hurt, Mrs. Taylor? Do you know Dave Coleman? Her director? He was very much in love with Amy a few months ago. Oh, I see. I don't like to see someone I like get the way he was. One night here, he had a couple too many. He said, uh, if he couldn't have her... Uh... Oh. Funny. How quick he got over it, though. Never says anything about it anymore, huh? Not a word. What about Porter Kane? Oh, you've met him. Is he one of them that Amy's hurt? No, no, he's not in that category. Whatever happened to hurt him must have happened at about the age of five. What do you mean? Oh, isn't that when most of our troubles start? <laughs> I wouldn't know. I once paid a psychiatrist $500 to tell me that's when mine started. Your troubles? Sure. Can't you tell, Mr. Dollard? I'm the mixed-up type. Aren't we all, Mrs. Taylor? I left her still sitting behind the bar, and somehow I felt sorry for her. But she had given a new lead. David Coleman, Amy's director, who'd had it bad for Amy just a few months ago and had now completely recovered. Maybe. I made a mental note to have a little chat with Coleman that night. Then I put in another call to Mike Pomeroy. This time he was in, and I finally talked him into meeting me at a little bar on West 44th near the theater. But when I got there, I could see that he wasn't feeling very cooperative. Look, Dollar, I suggested once before, nice and polite, that maybe you should try minding your own business. I got the message all right, Pomeroy, and now I've got one for you. I am minding my own business. Hmm? This is what I was hired to do. The insurance company I represent holds a pretty hefty life insurance policy on Amy. And if she's in any danger, they want to know about it. But I told you before, I think this whole thing's pretty silly. I had a talk with Bill York, the writer, this morning. Even though he and Amy are separated, you know, he's still the beneficiary on her policy. So? So he says he's in hock to you. He's a bum. He wasn't doing Amy any good. She was worrying about him. When they split up, I told him as long as he stayed away from her, didn't try to see her, I'd keep him in groceries. I see. But naturally, I wanted some security. The manuscript of his book, for instance? <laughs> Great unborn American novel. Well, apparently that manuscript means a lot to That's him. That's why I figured it'd be good security. What's the matter, Dollar? You look like you uh, smelled something bad. Do I? What am I supposed to be? A philanthropist? Let me make one thing clear, Pomeroy. As far as the kind of loans you make, I agree with you. It's none of my business. But maybe I just got a sensitive note. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, now I want my dough back. Is there anything wrong with that? Not a thing. I've got a play lined up I know will go over big. I want to produce it. York's tab has run up to several thousand bucks now. I could use the money. I see. The stupid part of the whole deal is that York could pay me back within a couple of months if he wanted to. Oh. Sure. There's a lot of dough floating around to be made in television these days. But that prima donna thinks he's way above that sort of thing. This play you want to produce, Pomeroy, will it star Amy? No. Sheila Mitchell. 
Oh. Well, thanks for the information. Be seeing you. I doubt it. On my way over to the Criterion Theater, I thought about Pomeroy. A rugged customer. And I felt he was one more who wouldn't let anyone stand in the way of anything he wanted to do. After the show, I picked up Amy backstage and took her back to her apartment. She looked very tired and didn't say much. We said goodnight at the front entrance, and I started walking along the sidewalk. Then I spotted somebody in the shadows across the street again, watching. I could tell from his hat and coat he was the same one who'd been there the night before last. I kept on walking until I reached the corner, then circled halfway around the block to an alley and edged up on him from behind. He didn't see me until I dove at him. Well, Bill York. So, what are you doing here? So you haven't been near Amy for a long time, huh? Except tonight and the night before last, watching her apartment. Darling. Come on, York, start talking. And it better be good. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar. Some up to three feet tall. You get Bounce-O the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa. A roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall, absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today, you may never hear this offer again. Rush $1 plus 10 cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents for each set with your name and address to Giant Animals Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of The Amy Bradshaw Matter. Tomorrow... I find I have even more of a reason for keeping Amy alive than I'd realized. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Al Sintel at police headquarters, Johnny. Better get over here to my hotel room, Al. I've got company. Who is it? Bill York. Amy Bradshaw's ex-husband? Right. I caught him watching her apartment half an hour ago, and he's the one who was watching it the other night. This time, I had better luck catching him. Has he opened up yet? No, but he will. Johnny, take it easy with him. I think he's got plenty to tell us. Looks like he's the boy we're after, Al. I'll be right over. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. New York City, expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northwestern Indemnity Alliance, Hartford, Connecticut. 
The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amy Bradshaw matter. Amy, star of a Broadway play, and somebody was out to get her. Expense account item 10, $3. Repairs to one coat sleeve. Torn in the process of inviting Bill York up to my hotel room. Look, Dolly, you've got no right to drag me up here to your room this way. York, you're going to sit right here until you open up and tell me all about the attempt on Amy Bradshaw's life. What? You come in. Oh, Al. Hi, Johnny. York, this is Detective Lieutenant Al Centella. Now look here, Lieutenant. What's this all about? Well, I kind of thought that's what you'd tell us, Mr. York. But this is crazy. Why would I want to kill Amy? You're aware that you're still the beneficiary on Amy's insurance policy. What? Well, even if also, I Also, am... you need money, and you need it bad. You're several thousand bucks in debt to Mike Pomeroy, Amy's agent. He's been pressing you for it lately. Look, Dollar. And you know you can't get the manuscript of your novel out of hock from him until you pay off. You've got two strikes against you, York. Motive and opportunity. Opportunity? Sure, but motive? No, Dollar. I've never had any reason to kill Amy. It's true she and I couldn't make it together, but I guess that was more my fault than hers. Go on. You see, Amy's never let anything stand in the way of what she wanted. What she wanted, I didn't. I guess we just lived in two different worlds. What do you mean? He's always been a success, and I've always been a failure. You still haven't explained why you lied to me, York. Lied? When I talked to you this morning, you told me you hadn't been near Amy for a long time. But when I caught up with you in front of her apartment tonight, I realized you were the same one who was watching it night before last. How about that, York? You fellas don't leave me much. What do you mean? Sure, once in a while I go stand outside her apartment house, look up at the light on the window... Maybe think a little about how things might have been. That's all. Uh, maybe you better come downtown with me, York. We'll check your story further. If you're clean, you got nothing to worry about. All right, Lieutenant. Sergeant, take Mr. York down to the car and wait for me there. Johnny? Who else have you talked to? Oh, everybody close to her. But the one who interests me most is her agent, Mike Pomeroy. He can be a pretty rough customer when he wants to. And he thinks Amy's standing in the way of a career for an actress he's currently interested in. Let's talk about somebody else for a moment. Oh. You, Johnny. I think you're getting a little bit out of line. What do you mean? Down at police headquarters, we got a little black book. It tells us what to do and what not to do. It doesn't say anything about insurance investigators dragging possible suspects to their hotel room to question them. Listen, Al, when I'm assigned to a case, I usually try to break it any way I can. I know. It's just that I think you're taking this case pretty big. Meaning? Yesterday I told you that if I didn't know you better, I'd think you were falling for Amy a little yourself. Think it over, Johnny. We will continue with the Bradshaw matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. Now, first you get Bounce-O the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now, hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus, guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly-poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored, preformed, sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost? Just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giant who turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund, but keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. 
Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 1907. That's Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. Expense account item 11, $4, drinks, for me. I thought about what Al Sintel had said. The possibility I was falling for Amy Bradshaw. Thought about it for two hours. Finally, I decided I had to find out if he was right. I went over to Amy's apartment. It was good of you to come over, Johnny. I just can't seem to sleep lately. Yeah. I noticed there's a policeman on duty down in the lobby. Lieutenant Centella arranged for that. It's funny. It should make me feel better, but it doesn't. It just keeps reminding me of it. A threat on my life. I'm glad you're here, Johnny. So am I. Awfully glad. Maybe I shouldn't say that, but... Do you hear any objections? Oh, now, who could... Excuse me. Yeah, sure. Hello? Yes? Oh, Porter. What? No, I'm sorry. I... No, really, Porter, it's out of the question. No, I... Good night, Porter. Okay, now. Huh? Yes, I suppose he means well. But he can be rather annoying. Do you have a cigarette, Johnny? Here. Thanks. You seem rather quiet tonight. Oh, just thinking, I guess. It's funny. Mm. Our meeting like this. Yeah. Just a few days ago, I didn't know you at all. And now... And now what? I don't know, Johnny. I don't know. It's a mistake, Johnny. I'm sorry. Was it? Yes. Johnny, I'm afraid I've hurt a couple of people in the past. I don't want to hurt you. Don't worry. You won't. And that's the wonderful thing about being an actress. You play so many parts. The kiss. That was playing a part, huh? Even if it weren't, Johnny, it'd be no good. There'd always be something between us. It's right over there on the mantel. The clock? Yes. We can't turn it back. If I'd met you a long time ago before, Mike, or... But I didn't. No. So? Is the clock so bad, Amy? It is to an actress. Sometimes I pretend it isn't there. You ever do that, John? No, it doesn't do any good. But you can try can live a whole life trying. Isn't that really what we all do? I don't know. We go along playing our parts, doing what we have to do, pretending the clock isn't there. But all the while it is. And though we keep on fighting against it, we know we can't turn it back. We can't even stop. One thing I'd accomplished, I guess. I'd decided I wouldn't be seeing Amy anymore after this case was wound up. Winding it up, though, was another question. And I was still as far from home as ever on it. But I couldn't seem to get Porter Kane and his quaint little hobby of collecting things out of my mind. Why, good evening, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Mr. Kane. Come in, come in. Thanks. I know it's late. I'm sorry. Not at all. As a matter of fact, I was hoping I'd see you again. I don't want to keep you. I see your hat and coat. No, I'm not going out. I've just come in. Oh. Uh, you said you were hoping you'd see me again? Yes, I enjoyed our other little chat very much. I, um, suppose you came to talk some more about Amy Bradshaw. Matter of fact, Mr. Kane, I came to talk about you. Splendid. And about your hobby. Collecting? A fascinating hobby, Mr. Dollar. You take it pretty seriously, don't you? I've devoted most of my life to it. And I may say that I've succeeded rather brilliantly with it. 
Each item in my collection is incomparable, without equal. Yeah, one of a kind. And that, of course, is precisely why Amy is necessary to complete the collection. The crowning and final edition. Final? Yes. Uh, for your information, Mr. Dollar, when I've acquired Amy, I intend to cease my hobby. Oh. She will complete my collection. Without her, though, it is still incomplete. Mind if I ask you a couple of questions, Mr. Keene? Not, not at all. You seem to have been pretty successful with your collection. Have you ever run up against an item you wanted but couldn't get? Of course not. <laughs> That just doesn't happen. Has it ever happened? Well, I can't remember that it ever... Yes. Yes, it did happen once. When? When I was nine years old. A playmate of mine had a lollipop that I admired greatly. He wouldn't give it to me, and he wouldn't sell it to me. What did you do? I, I did the only logical thing there was to do. I smashed the lollipop, Mr. Dollar... <laughs> Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar. Some up to three feet tall. You get Bounce the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa. A roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall, absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today, you may never hear this offer again. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing and cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents for each set, with your name and address, to Giant Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of the Amy Bradshaw Matter. Tomorrow, well, it's the wind-up, and a pretty rough one. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Robert Reif. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. It's Amy Bradshaw, Johnny. Amy, it's 1 a.m. Anything the matter? Yes, can you come over right away? Sure, your apartment? No, I'm in my dressing room at the Criterion Theater. At 1 o'clock in the... Amy, there's a policeman assigned to you. Is he with you? No, I... I went out the back way. I came over here alone. But why? He's supposed to be protecting you. Johnny, I can't explain now, but I think I finally know who's been trying to kill me. I want to talk to you right away over here. Hurry. Please hurry. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. New York City, expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northwestern Indemnity Alliance, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amy Bradshaw matter. Expense account item 12, $5. Taxi from my hotel to the Criterion Theater on West 44th. Two bucks for the fare, three bucks for getting me there in five minutes. Amy had sounded plenty scared over the phone. The cab skidded to a stop in front. 
I caught a glimpse of somebody at the other corner of the theater. It looked like Porter Kane. I couldn't be sure, and I didn't have time to find out right now. Backstage, it was quite dark, and I had to feel my way through some... The shot came from the direction of Amy's dressing room. Mike Pomeroy, her agent, was lying on the floor, dead. There was a gun on the floor, too, just inside the door. Johnny! Oh, Johnny! What happened, Amy? Amy, stop it! Tell me what happened. The, the door! The door? The, the shot! It, it came from the door! I ran outside the dressing room across the stage into the alley. No one in sight. Back inside, I found a light switch. So I phoned Al Centella at police headquarters, told him what had happened. Amy was quieter now. Johnny. Amy, look, look. I know it's tough for you to talk right now, but you've got to try and tell me. I know. A little after midnight, Mike called me at my apartment. He said he wanted to talk to me about something important. His office is nearby, and he asked me to meet him here in my dressing room. So I came over right away. Go on. Mike and I started talking. Suddenly, I saw the door opening a crack. A hand... With a gun, Mike. Mike! Easy, easy. Mike saw it too. He, he dove in between me and the door. And collected the slug. He, he fell against the door and it slammed on the hand. The gun dropped. And the next thing I remember, you were in the room. You didn't see who was holding the gun. No, just the hand. Amy. And there was something on one of the fingers that I recognized. A large signet ring? Yes, sir. Yeah. It belonged to the guy out on the sidewalk, Porter Kane. We will continue with the Bradshaw matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long. And all for the low, low price of just one dollar. Now, first you get Bounceo the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now, hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus, guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored preformed sturdy latex which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost? Just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals, Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund. But keep the giant talking sat as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 1918. That's Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 1918, Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. Lieutenant Centella arrived at Amy's dressing room, and Amy repeated her story to him. He sent a couple of his boys out to pick up Porter Kane. Al and Amy and I went down to headquarters. We left her in one room while we went into another to question Kane, who had been picked up at his apartment. See here, Lieutenant, I don't know what this is all about, but I certainly object to being routed out Just of... hold it, Kane. You know why you're down here. I certainly do not. You don't know that Mike Pomeroy's dead, eh? Amy's agent? Really? Really. 
Well, I never did like that chap. Quite an insensitive person. Well, he's real insensitive now, Kane. He's dead. How did it happen? Mike was shot by mistake. The real target was Amy. Good heavens, no. When's the last time you saw Amy? The night before last. I spoke to her briefly after the show. You haven't talked to her on the telephone? No. You're lying. Now, see here, Dollar. You phoned her at her apartment about 11 p.m. I was there. All right. I did telephone her. I suggested she meet me somewhere. I, I told her I'd wait for her outside her apartment. Go on. I saw her come out later by the alley, so I followed her to the theater, thinking she meant for us to talk there. But then I I heard a shot. So you admit being in the vicinity. Well, yes, but I definitely did not go into the theater. Didn't you? Kane, Amy got a look at the hand holding the gun. There was a ring on one of the fingers. Ring? Your ring. She's completely mistaken. That's a very distinctive ring. It's not one that anybody be mistaken about. See here, Lieutenant, all of this, this wild supposition is based on the assumption that I had a motive for wanting to kill Amy. You told me what your motive was when I talked to you last evening in your apartment. What do you mean? I asked you what you'd do if you wanted something for your collection and couldn't get it. You told me a story about what happened when you were just a kid nine years old. But I, I say... Another that... kid had a lollipop you wanted. He wouldn't give it to you, so you smashed it. And that's what you were trying to do tonight in Amy's dressing room. You couldn't have her, so you tried to smash her. There wasn't much point in my hanging around. So I got Al Sintella's permission to take Amy back to her apartment. We could wait there for any new developments. Amy didn't say a word all the way. When we got there, she sat in a chair staring at the wall. When she finally spoke, it was more like she was talking to herself. He's dead. Amy. He's dead because of me. Stop talking that way. Mike Pomeroy jumped in the way of a bullet. If he hadn't, you'd be dead. Would have been better that way. Stop it, Amy. Johnny. Yeah. I think... You think what? Oh, just a minute. I'll get it. It was Al Centella down at police headquarters. When he finished talking, I didn't say anything. There wasn't anything to say. After I hung up, I stood there a moment, staring out the window. It had started to rain. I felt old and tired and empty and sick. I went back into the other room again. Amy was sitting there, looking at me. Johnny? Yeah, Amy? Was that call for me? No. Who was it? Lieutenant Centella. Oh. The gun that killed Mike Pomeroy. There were no fingerprints on it. You said you saw a bare hand with a ring on it holding the gun. A bare hand would have left fingerprints. You killed him, didn't you? Yes, Johnny. The attempts on your life, you faked them, didn't you, to convince people you were in danger so you could kill Pomeroy and we'd think the shot was intended for you. Why, Amy? You know why. (sighs) Yeah, I guess so. You loved Mike. You knew he was growing away from you. Very fast. You saw him get interested in a younger actress. You knew she was taking your place with him. To Mike, I was dead. I couldn't stand that. I really couldn't. So I started making it look like I was in danger. It wasn't very hard, Johnny. I'm a good actress. Yeah. After a while, I almost began to believe I was in danger. Something was after me was hunting me. It finally caught up with me and I... did what I did. Which of us is the hunter, Johnny? And which is the hunted? Amy. Yes? I think one of Lieutenant Centella's men is waiting for you out in the hall. All right. Just... one thing, Johnny... What is it? I'll need something now. Something. Don't forget me, Johnny. Give me that. That you can count on, Amy. She walked out of the room and she didn't look back. I'm glad she didn't. Expense account item 13, $16.50. Transportation and incidentals from New York back to Hartford. 
Expense account total, $185.20. End of account, end of report. Remarks? Amy repeated her confession to Lieutenant Centella. Her trial's coming up soon. Sweet case. Well, tomorrow's another day. So they tell me. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar will return in a moment to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar. Some up to three feet tall. You get Bounceo the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa. A roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That's six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today. You may never hear this offer again. Rush $1 plus 10 cents for packing and mailing and cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents for each set with your name and address to Giant Animals, Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's exciting story. Next week... A case with a great big question mark. Accident? Suicide? Or just plain murder? Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Florence Walcott, Don Diamond, Larry Thor, Vic Perrin, and Carlton Young. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Deller. This is Roy Rowan speaking. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Uh, this is Sam, Blackleg Spade, the third most dangerous gambler on the Barbary Coast. Oh, Sam, not horses again. Horses, women, and the gaming tables, Evie, the diversions of the elite. Well, divert yourself with this, Sam. The phone company has sent the pink notice. Aha, uh-huh. pay it no mind, sweetheart. We are healed. We have hit the cashier's cage, annexed the pot, broken the bank, and we're standing on velvet. Sam, are you sober? Uh, definitely velvet. Hmm, warm, too. Sam, from where are you calling from? You're wrong, Effie. It's a drugstore. Stay where you are. I'll be right down to deal out my report on the hot hundred grand caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. It's smart to buy things the whole family can use, isn't it? That's why I say it's smart to buy Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. To mom, to dad, to the children, Wild Root Cream Oil is really a friend indeed. 
Non-alcoholic wild root cream oil with lanolin grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. I hope you have a big family-sized bottle of wild root cream oil in your home. Get wild root cream oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Date, uh, September 19, 1948, to uh, robbery detail, San Francisco Police, Attention Sergeant Walsh, uh, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596, uh, dear Joe. Here's the rundown on that hot hundred grand. It started pleasantly enough when my secretary, Miss Effie Perrine, cute little mouse, eased into my private office, closed the door behind her, and leaned back against it with that air of pained resignation, which generally means there's a customer outside that she doesn't approve of, but that I'll see her anyway. It's up to you, Sam. She's very well dressed, and I imagine she can afford you. How do you uh, deduce that? Well, she dropped her purse. I didn't get time to count it all, but there was a hundred dollar bill on top. Well, sure, in Effie. Sam. I... Go ahead, say it. Oh, I don't know, Sam. Sometimes. Well, does just money. No. No, that's one of the reasons I hire you. What's the matter with her? Nothing. That's just it, Sam. She's very Mm good-looking, cultivated, and very kind and considerate. And she seems sincerely troubled. You mean her act is a little too good? I felt that too, Sam. Thanks, Angel. I'll keep that in mind. Tell her to come in. All right, Sam. Mr. Spade will see you, Mrs. Kilcourt. Thank you. Thank you for seeing me, Mr. Spade. My pleasure. Uh, Won't you sit down? Oh, thank you. I'm Lorraine Kilcourse, Mr. Spade. It's about my husband, Leonard Kilcourse. Husband? Oh. We've only been married a short time. It was a quiet ceremony at the San Cedro Mission. Mm -hmm. Leonard didn't want to subject me to any publicity. The difference in our ages, you know? You mean you want me to keep it a secret? Oh, no. No, except for the newspapers, of course. Naturally, all of Leonard's friends know. Oh, he doesn't have many from what I've heard. I've thought it strange, too, that such a prominent man should have such a small circle of acquaintances. I met him only a short time before I married him. He's been very kind and absolutely devoted to me, and I suppose I should feel ashamed of myself for for coming to you. But there are so many things about him that are mysterious that I... Sometimes I... I I can't seem to find my handkerchief. Here. Kleenex. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I uh, take it you're not a San Francisco girl. No. No, I met him at a dude ranch. Well, uh, maybe I can clear up some of your mysteries for free. The reason your husband doesn't have many friends is because they keep dropping dead. I don't understand you. Oh, forget it. He's a big public servant. He's built a lot of sidewalks. The streets of this city are paved with his good intentions. His name is on a thousand manhole covers. If the names of his former business associates land on headstones, it's stuffing to me. I got my own racket. Well, what? I think my husband is paying blackmail to someone. Uh Uh-huh. And upon what do you base your suspicions, Mrs. K? It started about a month ago. He began withdrawing large sums from our joint account. First it was 10,000, then then 20,000, and last week, Mm -hmm. 50,000. And this morning, he closed out the balance of the account. $100,000. $100,000. Well, he's got it to spend, Mrs. Kilcoy. Well, I, I won't pretend the money doesn't interest me, but what's behind it, Mr. Spade? Each time he withdraws these cash sums, he, he leaves the house without a word to me. And sometimes doesn't return until dawn. My husband is not fond of nightlife, Mr. Spade. Only a desperate situation could induce him to leave the house after dark. <clears throat> yeah, so I've heard. They say that's how he kept his health as long as he has. All right, uh, you want me to trail him, find out what he does with the money. Just one question. Why'd you pick me for the job? I... I... Why, your reputation... That's local. You say you're new in San Francisco. Well, I I do read the local papers. Your picture was in only two weeks ago. Yeah, well, that caver didn't help my reputation. I like your looks. A nice, honest face. A man I could trust. Well, don't buy that. And I'm sentimental, too. Your picture reminded me of someone who is very dear to me. My brother. Of course, you're nothing like him, really, but but you do look alike. 
I suppose that sounds like a silly woman's reason for... Yeah. What's your address? Well, I have a little place of my own out on Divisadero. The Balboa Apartments near Normandy Terrace. Mm -hmm. You'd better keep in touch with me there. I don't want Leonard to know. The Kilcourse Mansion is at 1316 Clarendon. 1316. Mm -hmm. He returns from his office around six in the evening. Do you have a car? No. I need one? Well, I don't know where he may go. Now, here are the keys to my car. It's parked in front of the main entrance, a gray Plymouth. He won't recognize the car. My, my, it's my brother's. Now, about your fee. A hundred bucks now. If I need more, I'll leave you now. I had an uneasy feeling I would need more. The last detective that tried to follow Leonard Kilcourse had hospital insurance. I don't. But I'm a gambler at heart, so I parked Lorraine's Plymouth across the street from the Kilcourse mansion and waited. At 9 and a p.m., Mr. Kilcourse, much, much too old for her, came out the front door and flagged down a taxi. I made an illegal U-turn and followed. The trail ended across the Golden Gate Bridge in Marin County. It was a country club-type building on top of a hill overlooking the bay. It did business under the name of Ernie Nogales' Racket Club. The racket had nothing to do with tennis. It came from two sources. The moans and groans of the customers losing money at the roulette wheels and crap tables, and the glad hand the management threw at my quarry as I followed him in. Well, Mr. Kilcourt, surprised to see you. Since when you go out of the dock? Well, I thought a little nightlife might agree with me, Nogales. Oh, 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 that sounds like you, Mr. Kilcourt. I didn't know you better. I think you was afraid to go out night. <laughs> well, now, I was thinking of buying this place to retire to. Oh. But I figured it'd be cheaper to win it at your roulette table. <laughs> What's your limit here? Ten thousand. But for you, wide open. The sky. A hot hundred grand for a starter? <laughs> well, any time they catch you with hot money, Mr. Keeper. <laughs> Come over to the cashier. Oh. I send you the chips myself. <laughs> I didn't have to bother making myself inconspicuous. Everybody in the joint stopped playing to watch Kilcourse while he shoved his hundred grand roll through the cashier's window and scooped up four stacks of thousand buck chips. Make your bets, please. All right, you. Spin that wheel. Huh? How much you got there? Twenty-five grand. Any objections? Is that okay, Mr. Nogales? Uh, spin it, Joe. I'm covering through the table person. Okay, sir. Around and round the little ball goes. Fifteen pay, fifteen and the red. Oh. Maybe next time, Mr. Kimco. Why don't you double up, play the red and the black? It's safer. I'll stay with the numbers. Fifty thousand on fifteen. There. Spin it. It's okay, Joe. I'm still covering. Well, it's your money, Mr. Nogales. Number four pays. Number four and the red again. Well... Twenty-five grand more on fifteen. Uh, look, Mr. Kilcourse, go on, enjoy yourself, take it off your income tax, but please spend those... Spread them out a little there, those chips, huh? It looks bad for the house. What kind of a joint is this? Can't you cover the bets? Okay, Joe. He asked for it. Okay, sir. I didn't wait to see where the little ball went on the last spin of the wheel. I would have made a side bet with any taker that Kilcourse wanted to lose that hundred grand. I would also have made book. He knew I was following him. As I left the table and walked out of the club, I braced myself for what usually comes next. There would either be a dead body in the car or somebody would crease my noggin with a sap. But nothing happened. I switched on the headlights and stood in the glare of them for fully a minute, but nobody even shot at me. I flushed the shrubbery. No gunman. Checked the ignition wires. No booby traps. Driving back to town, I racked my brain for some way to bring them out into the open. I felt like a man with his life savings all on one number waiting for the wheel to stop spinning, which wasn't far from the truth. Not much of a cliffhanger, but the best we could do this week. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. 
If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the hot hundred grand caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Yeah. Uh, this uh, Mrs. Kilcross's apartment? Yeah. She here? Yeah. Well, uh, can I come in? Yeah. Come in? Yeah. Who is that, Mr. Spade? Yeah. Oh, this is, this is the detective I was telling you about, Tommy. Remember? Yeah. The one who looked so much like you? Yeah. No. Oh, excuse me. This is my brother, Tommy Lane. Yeah. I mean, uh... Tommy, won't you run down to the corner and buy me some cigarettes for about 20 minutes? I have something to talk over with Mr. Spade. Yeah. Nice boy, your brother. Small vocabulary, but big feet. Well, he, he's shy. Now, what did you find out about Mr. K- uh, my husband, Mr. Spade? He uh, dropped a hundred grand in a gambling joint. Ernie Nogales' racket club. You know it? No, but I know Ernie Nogales. I knew him in Reno before I met Leonard. He lost his license there for running a crooked wheel. The way Kilcourse was playing tonight, that wheel didn't have to be crooked. He was trying to lose that hundred grand. But why? Why would he do a thing like that? One of two reasons. Either he's paying off to Nogales or he's paying off to somebody else and Nogales is the go-between. Well, I don't believe it. Ernie is a crooked gambler, but he doesn't touch blackmail. And your husband isn't stupid enough to drop a hundred grand in three turns of a wheel. Anyway, I'm not tangled with him and or the Ernie Nogales mob for a hundred bucks of your money or anybody else's. Here, take it. Well, but... And here are your car keys. No, no, wait, please. You, you can't desert me now. Why not? Well, I haven't told you everything. I'd hoped I wouldn't have to. About your brother? How did you know? The only place you get a green suntan is in a pokey. Besides, the act's kind of stir-crazy. Spent a little time in solitary, didn't he? He won't talk about it. But that's it, Sam. That's why Leonard is paying that blackmail money to Nogales. Uh, you just said Nogales wouldn't touch blackmail. Any other corrections you'd like to make in your copy before we proceed? Yes. Well, I might as well tell you everything. Why not? I knew when I came to you this morning that my husband was paying this money to Nogales. I knew because I asked him to. You and Ernie Nogales are working together? I'm not that rotten. I didn't say you were, but you're a rotten liar. There's that much in your favor. But I'm telling the truth now, Sam. You must believe me. Everything that has happened is my fault. I persuaded Nogales to give my brother a job in his place in Reno. Mm-hmm. They quarreled, and when he got closed down, he, he blamed Tommy. He swore he'd kill him when he got out of prison. That's why I begged my husband to pay him to save Tommy's life. Who did rat on Nogales about that crooked wheel in Reno? I did. That's why I feel responsible. Leonard is so fine, so, so generous. But I can't let him go on paying for my mistake. Yeah, like you said, he's going to run out of money. Look at me, Sam. Do I look like the kind of a woman to whom money means everything in the world? No, but you're looking at me, not at Kilcors. You're laughing at me. Oh, I know what you think. Perhaps I did make a mistake in marrying Leonard, but he was so kind, so considerate, like my father. Everybody reminds you of your relatives. You don't believe my story? Well, since you asked. Well, all right, then. Here's the truth. I'm really Jack the Ripper's granddaughter. My parents were terribly wealthy. I harpooned my mother in her Beverly Hills swimming pool, set fire to my father with a $50,000 negotiable bond, and eloped with John Wilkes Booth. That brings us up to 1865. Shall I go on? Don't stop. It's great. Oh, get out of here. Get out of here and leave me alone. After you've told me all your secrets, I'm not that rotten. 
You won't help me. You never intended to. Why go on torturing me? Oh, now, stop that. Please, please. I, I believe you. I believe all your stories. Now, uh, what is my next smart move? Sam, the only way to stop Ernie Nogales is to prove that he's running a crooked wheel. And then he'd pay back all that blackmail money and... And he wouldn't dare lay a hand on Tommy. Well, it's going to be hard to prove and expensive. Oh, but... I'll have to lose a little on that wheel before I can figure the way it's rigged. How much can you invest? Well, I... I have about a thousand dollars of my own. With you? Yes. Here. You take it. Hmm. Smells nice. Sam. Yeah? Sam, after all this is over and after I've put things to right with Leonard... I should have told him before this, but I owed him so much. I, Oh, Sam, I'm so glad it's you. Yeah. Me too, Angel. Go now, darling, before I beg you not to. What time does that joint close? Well, well, it runs all night, I think. Good. Let's stay up late and raid the icebox. Around 2 in the a.m., when I low-geared the Plymouth up the long, steep driveway to Ernie Nogales' racket club, backed into the parking space nearest the road with a car headed downhill for a quick getaway, just in case, and I went in. The joint was still going full blast. I bought 500 bucks worth of chips, swaggered over to the table where Kilcross had dropped his hundred grand and nonchalantly flipped the blue chip onto the red. Happily ship it, sir, ladies and gentlemen. Make your game. Okay, that's all. Around and round the little ball goes. Uh... I didn't look to see where the little ball went. Most of the money was on red, so it was bound to turn up black. Oh, a red, please. What? Number 15. Place your bets, please. Make your game, ladies and gentlemen. Around, around, again. The chips were spread around more the next turn, so I stacked 100 at the bottom of the 1 to 34 column. With a crooked wheel, my 100 made it the best bet to lose. And 19, and the red wins again. Hey! I plunked 500 down on number 5 and raked in 17,500. I left my original bet on the table. When the little ball fell into the pocket, I was 35,000 bucks to the good from my point of view, but not for my clients. I doubled my bet and looked apprehensively around. There were no surly characters edging up behind me. In fact, the only surly character in sight was Ernie Nogales, and he looked happy. That didn't make much sense. When my bankroll got to 105,000, I played a hunch. I threw five grand of it back on the table and lost it. That made a kind of sense. I cashed in the rest of my chips and squeezed the hundred grand U.S. currency into my inside pocket. If anybody aimed for my heart, it was thick enough to stop the slug, which was some comfort. But what I saw when I walked out to the parking lot was no comfort at all. I'd gotten just a glimpse of it through some trees. A sedan backed into a driveway halfway down the hill. It was blacked out except for five glowing cigar ends that showed through the windows. I could think of only one reason for five cigar smokers to be parked in that particular spot at that particular moment. The Plymouth was where I had parked it, pointing straight down the hill. I slammed the door but didn't get in. Then I listened. The car down the hill was getting ready, too. I cracked the door of the Plymouth wide enough to get my arm inside and pressed the starter with the heel of my hand. I switched on the lights, pushed the clutch with my left hand, used my right to shift it into low... And I pulled the hand throttle out all the way and let it go. What's the big idea busting into my office? We're going to have a talk, no, Gallus? Please, don't wave that heater at me. It makes me nervous. I don't like God. I don't either. That's why I'm here. Put your hands on top of the desk and keep them there. All right. Give me back that roll. I give you clean money for it. It was a gamble, so I lost. Can you blame me? Where'd you get this money? I buy it. Fifty cents on the dollar. I don't ask where it came from, but I read the papers. I figured it was that ship row, that shipyard payroll job a few days back. Like it just fell in my lap. I figured it would make 50 grand instead of Kilcourse 5. 
I guess that was dirty trick you just out of stir, Tommy, huh? I had news for you, Nogales. I didn't know this money was hot, and I am not Tommy Lane. No? Then what? Private Dick. Tommy's sister hired me to take the fall for him. Look, I uh, got most of the caper. Kilcors wanted to pay Tommy a hundred grand. You rigged the wheel so Kilcors would lose it one night, and Tommy would win it back the next night. Now, uh, what was Kilcors paying him off for? No caper, legitimate. He was sent up for bribing a public official. You mean he was the payoff man for Kilcors's contracting firm? Sure, legitimate business. The grand jury went out after Kilcors. Tommy took the rap, that's all, for a price. Yeah, a hundred grand. Thanks, Nogales. That's all I needed. Oh, Sam. I was afraid I might be too late. You are, sweetheart. Oh, I have so many things to explain. Where, 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 where can you talk? Right in here. But who's this man? Why, that's your old sweetie from Reno, Ernie Nogales, oh. remember? What's the matter with you two? You oh. crazy? Oh, Sam, I should have told you the truth from the beginning. Check. For Nogales yarn, I can understand. But why did you tell me you were Kilcross's wife? I was desperate. I had to say something. It was the only explanation I could think of for my interest in this case yeah. without telling the truth. But you were making a pigeon out of me. I don't know about such things, Sam. All I know is I'm here in time to warn you. You mustn't walk out of here with that money. Listen. They may kill you to get it back. They already did. They're what? combing the wreckage of that car right now, looking for my body. <gasps> then Tommy was right. They did mean to kill him. How did he get the rumble? While he was in prison, from another man that killed Cors framed. He was in for life, so it was safe for him to talk. Hey, you two. Oh. Yeah, no, Gallus? That car that just drove up. I think that's Mr. Kilcorse. Oh, I... Hey, what's your let hurry? Me go, let me go! Come on, what's your hurry? Tommy's out there in that cab. I've got to warn him. Or right, tip off Kilcorse. Which is it? No, Sam, you've got to believe Sit me. Sit down. Now, stop that. You two have fun. I'm getting out of here. Go ahead. Now, uh, listen, sweet Lorraine, you may as well save your breath for those explanations. You're staying right here until the cape is all wrapped up. Here he comes. Have you got a gun, Sam? Yeah. Well, you'd better have it ready. Mm -mm. But Sam... There's no gallus. I want to see him. Uh, he was called out of town, sir. I'm in charge. Uh, you must have killed Cors? That's right. I want to know why you people have been interfering with my business. It might interest you to know that this building site's on an old Spanish land grant. Title's very shaky. I'll run an eight-lane highway straight through the middle of it and turn the rest of it into a game preserve. <laughs> That's what I do to people who double-cross me. I tried to tell Mr. Nogales that, sir. He wouldn't listen to me. He tipped Tommy off for a split of the hundred grand, but I knew sooner or later we'd have to answer to you, Mr. Kilcourse. Oh, well, what's that? Here's your hundred grand, sir. Count it. Sam. Well, 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 well. Oh, what's your name, son? Sam Spade, sir. Well, I'm glad to meet an honest lad. Well, come along. Uh, you too, young lady. We'll all walk out together. Sam, shut what up, are you... Shut what? Up. Uh, Spade, huh? Yes, sir. I'm a private detective, but I'm ambitious. Hmm. Politic? Uh, yes, sir. Well, <laughs> we'll run you for assembly. In the meantime, I believe there's an opening in one of the public services. Garbage disposal. Uh, executive end, of course. Where the devil is that man with my car? Oh, there he is. Now, you drop around to my office in the morning. Thank you, and good night, Mr. Kilcourt. Yeah. Uh, drive on, Horace. Back to the city. Oh, Sam. How could you? Hmm? All those lies and, and just handing over the money like that. It, it wasn't yours. It wasn't Tommy's either, sweetheart. Get in. Well, Tommy, are you all right? Yeah. Drive us across the bridge, Tommy, will you? Yeah. Tommy. <clears throat> yeah. Tommy, I'm afraid we'll have to do without the money. Yeah? S Sam gave it to Mr. Kilcourse. Yeah? N now, don't get excited, Tommy. I'm sure Sam had a reason. Didn't you, Sam? Yeah. I mean, that was marked money from a payroll job. Oh, then it won't do him any good. It'll send him up for a good long stretch if the eyewitness story that goes along with it is good enough. And you're just the girl to tell it, sweetheart. Am I uh, right, Tommy? Yeah. <laughs> Period, end of report. Already? But, Sam... Yeah? What happened? Who were the five men in the car, the ones who shot at that Plymouth in the mistaken belief that you were in it? Their names are of little account, Effie. Suffice it to say that Kilcourse pointed his pudgy finger at them in the hopes of keeping the charge of attempted murder out of his indictment. But I was too clever. I identified them. But, Sam, you didn't see anything but their cigars glowing in the darkness. Have you never heard of Sherlock Holmes' monograph on the 49 varieties of tobacco ash, you oh, fool? Oh, but, Sam, Sherlock Holmes is only the segment of someone's imagination. He's a fictional detective. Well? You mean... Oh, Sam, you're tired. Yes, I am. It's affected your mind, winning well. all that money. Now, you just sit here and rest. All right. 
think of the snowy mountaintops and uh, blue skies. Mm -hmm. I'll just go and type this up. Snowy mountaintops. Winter sports yet. And now, listen to this. If you haven't yet tried Wild Root Cream Oil, the famous hair tonic that grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff, then here's a wonderful way to get acquainted. Buy Wild Root Cream Oil in the new 25-cent size bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And not that it made any difference, but how did you guess that she wasn't Mrs. Kilcoy? Simple. Kilcoy didn't recognize her. But Sam, that was after you denounced her. I did no such thing. From the report, Sam, in black and white. Quote, why did you tell me you were Kilcoy's wife? Unquote. At that point, you assumed that she was not Mrs. Leonard Kilcoy. I did not. I merely wondered why she had told me. Well, with all the lies she told, you might have assumed anything she said was totally devoid of truth. And I did, sweetheart. I did. Oh. Oh, well, that's a relief. I was afraid for a while she'd taken you in. What's that got to do with the truth? Oh. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Sadie Thompson appeared as Lorraine Kilcourse. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dow. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Score composed by Renee Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with silver lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When it's May and the nighttime sighs briefly, begins the weaving of mist into silken fabric of its dying, Broadway is still. Broadway waits for death of night, for the first cry of day. Entwined with mist threads, the echoes of earlier whisperings, and light pools spilled from earlier neon, diminishing now, contracting into cause of darkness. Dance of litter where dreams were and promises were, and through it, erratic dance of a sodden man who stops, then leans for a while against the edge of night, walks on, and in his wake, ebb of nighttime. And at headquarters, walk a corridor. You're way to a room where you've been summoned by Detective Mugovan. Old thoroughfare to the interrogation room to see... Well, you'll see when you get here, Mugovan, it said. I the poor souls had signed by a stick of more tree. Her hand on her bosom, her head on her knees, sing willow, willow. Well, well, you can cut that out now, well, Miss. The lieutenant is here, and the lieutenant has got your message. I, <laughs> her salt tears fall from her, which soften the stones. Sing, will I? You hear me, Miss? You can end it now, any time. Drunk? In my time, Danny, I have been in the company of many lady drunks, but What's never What's she doing one. here? Why isn't she in the tank? 
She was there, Danny, a couple hours ago. Picked up off of Village Street about midnight. They booked her, searched her, did all their little things, and then sent her up to us. I call my false love, but Lady, what's lady, lady. Why did they send her up to us, Muggerman? Over here on the table, Danny. This knife, it was found in her purse. There was blood on it. Fresh blood, human blood. I let the boys in technical have their way with the knife, and that's the report they came up with. Who is she? No identification. Well, hello, well, hello. And like she is now, how she was when they picked her up. The wrinkled summer dress, the booze. One difference. The knife was in her purse. Miss... My uh, false love said then... You know what he said? <laughs> Give me all you whose arms are soft and slender. Look, Miss... Yeah, Danny, you talk to her. Be gentle. Be... Well, like you are. Maybe you and shall... And said, against your heart so innocent and tender... A little love and some forgetfulness. Well, well, well. And then started to sway and lose control. Oh. Hey, I got it, Danny. Dawn all at once, and she was caught in its first light. Supported by Detective Mugovan, looking up at him silently with suddenly stricken eyes. When he took her away to jail, she leaned against him, head to his chest. <laughs> At nine o'clock in the morning after the small sleep, the day began again, with the juice of the orange and the coffee bean, proven best to enable you to face life, and when fortified with a glazed donut, enables you to face life bravely. Thus equipped, stride down headquarters corridor to your assigned cubicle. The man who's waiting for you offers you his hand, shakes yours once, gives it back to you with a slight underhand flip. I'm Harold Tracy, Mr. Clover. How do you do? I was told to see you because my wife is missing, and I was told you had a woman booked last night for some reason or another, and her description checks with that of my wife. What does your wife look like? Again? Again. About this tall, coloring fair, hair light brown. Joan has a very small beauty mark right here at the corner of her lips. She... Yeah, Danny? Sergeant, the woman that was booked this morning about four, the one without identity? Who had the knife? That's right. Get her up here in my office right away. Only be a second, Danny. She was brought upstairs here for breakfast. Mr. Tracy... No, wait a minute. What's that mean, who had the knife? Is your wife a drunk, Mr. Tracy? No. Now tell me what that... Here, take a look. What's this got to do with Joan? Your wife was incoherent from booze early this morning, Mr. Tracy. If she's your wife, we've got upstairs. How come you're so concerned about her this morning? Why weren't you concerned enough about her last night to keep her out of trouble? I don't have to listen to that kind of talk. You do if you don't know how to take care of your wife. You ever see this knife before? Let me see it. No. Drunk? Joan, no. No, it couldn't be. Look, you sure she's my wife? No, but the description you gave me... Wearing a black dress cut, uh... That's another thing I can't understand about Joan. Right in here, miss. Well, gentlemen, here she is. What got into you, Joan? I'm very sorry. I promise you I won't do it again. That's the very least I'd expect you to say. I'm ashamed of myself. I should hope so. I'll never embarrass you again, Hal. I've been bad. I can't understand you. I've been bad and... Danny! Hal, I hate you so much. Danny, she's got the nurse. Mrs. Tracy. Don't worry, Mr. Clover. I do. Joan. I hate you with all my heart and soul. And I'm going to kill you. Put down that knife, Joan. Kill you, Hal. Because all the years... Give me that knife, Mrs. Tracy. <laughs> what's happened to her? That doctor sent you, you know. <laughs> Joan, what's happened to you? You better go home now, Mr. Tracy. All right. Look up, Danny. Look up from your desk and get hit with it. Oh, Marty. Aha. Uh-huh. Who else but Marty Udenfoint, to be exact? Hits you, huh? This tired face you remember, huh? You look fine, Marty. Tanned. You drove an open-air cab, you would also be tanned in the face. However, what happened to your particular set of values concerning the female of the species, I can't guarantee. Were you a cabbie? What are you talking about, Marty? That dame. What dame? What dame, he says to me. The dame the paper say you picked up booze happy in the village last night. With beauty spot close to lip. With knife in the bag. What dame, he said. Oh, Mrs. Tracy, what about her? Last night around ten when she hailed me, I didn't know for Mrs. or Miss. All I know is a few remarks were passed, and suddenly I find myself nonchalant in the back seat of my cab, and my passenger is driving in the front. Ah, it was a pleasant change. Go on. 
Well, we do the park, we do the plaza, we do the East River. Then she hauls up in front of joint in the village, invites me in. I say, thanks loads, lady, but I already had my quota of fun for tonight. What club? The Crocodile Club on Bank Street. You got to understand, Danny, up to where we parted company, my passenger was only flap happy with the season. Uh, yeah, the... I understand. Thanks, Marty. See, see you around, Marty. Good afternoon. I'm looking for the manager of this club. Truly? Police. Just one couple here, mister. A boy, a girl. A boy and a girl in a corner table. And see how they hold hands? Nah, isn't You the that... manager? I'm Leslie Cobb, and I manage. And just what it is it that you need in the afternoon, you being a police officer and all? Well, some information. You? About a woman named Joan Tracy. She was here last night. Say that name again. Joan Tracy. About 5'4", about a 26-inch waist, and the little thing right here, the beauty mark. And suddenly emancipated. Call me Joan Tracy the Liberated. That one? <laughs> the lady on a tooth? What about her? I only had one drunk in here last night, and she swore to everybody her name was Joan, and she was free, free, free. Come what may, she said, which was a lie. Oh? She found a fellow. She found a fellow with a book of verses, and she had a jug of booze. <laughs> Whether there was bread or not, I wouldn't know. What are you talking about? She went off with a boy in jeans and plaid shirt who calls himself Robin Forrest this week. Has a room down the corner, that way, an attic. And there to laugh and sorrow and taste... Yeah. The... Thanks a lot. And out of the jaws of the Crocodile Club, and onto Village Street in Maytime, past shop of French pastries and French legends scrawled in pink icing on sun-yellowed wedding cakes, and make the quick free translations and walk on. And leaning against doorway, the sandaled girl in batik sari, head posed against the hand-painted sign that reads, Jewels, Custom Made, Second Landing, and walk on to Corner Rooming House, where a boy who this week calls himself Robin Forrest is to be captured in his attic lair, where he usually is if he's not on the wing somewhere else. Attic is the room boasting the skyline. And ascend old stairs, banister carved with old memories, and on to landing, down hallway. And a faulty catch releases... The door drifts slowly into opening. Latticed rays of sun from fulcrum of skylight to hold in dust dance, boy sprawled on floor. Boy in plaid shirt and jeans. Young man with knife wound. Young man dead. Young man murdered. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Thanks to careless people, forest fires have a long season. That season has begun again with the coming of warm weather. In the interest of preserving our natural resources, we are all asked to be especially careful when in or near our woodlands. Nine fires out of ten are man-made. Every fire makes a dent in our natural defenses. To keep our woodlands open and free for enjoyment, eliminate forest fires. The season of promise is dying, and on Broadway its swift, silent passing goes unnoticed. Spring into summer means only the shifting of mannequins in a store window, and draping them in less clothes, preserving only the precise curve of wrist. And still the serpents of light uncoil in identical pattern and leap skyward. And still the street is filled with sounds that were there yesterday. And the people. And the riot. But spring is dying. And summers are coming in. Hurry. Only so many tomorrows for the dream to come true. 
Where I was, office at police headquarters late afternoon time. The hour of the police sergeant from Never Never Land, who had somehow gotten a job in New York. Danny? Come in, Gino. Well, how did you like it? How did I like what? How did I like what, he says. Yeah, that's what I said. That's what I said, Danny. How did you like that book I give you? Book? I, the corpse. You know, the first adventure of the twanger. That two-fisted guitar strumming... Oh, well, I haven't read it yet. You see... Well, Danny, here's the sequel, so you can read both in one sitting. Thanks, Gino. Kiss me, Irving. What an adventure. In this one, the twanger cleans up Anne Arundel County in Maryland. Thanks a lot, Gino. Your jaw will drop. Gino. Mind it. Gino, you have anything for me? Report from Detective Dennison if your mood is such It that... is. Believe me, it is. <clears throat> That Mrs. Tracy is lying in a hospital room under the care of Dr. Sinsky where she lies and stares at the ceiling and says not a word. Go on. Incidental information is all. If you please. Her mother died last week. Oh? Fell down the steps in her apartment house. It was an accident then for sure? I think so. Says here on the report, if accidental death, checked here. It's checked. See? What else, Gino? Joan Tracy is a lady with a talent. She plays cello. In fact, there are three of them. What? In the trio. Two friends and Joan Tracy. If you want who the two people are, Danny, well, here. If I seem like a daisical, Danny, the twanger, my jaw dropped. Please, please, go away. Mr. Codalier? It matters to you who I am? Yes, it does. I'm from the police. Thank you. I am Codalier. Now, please, go away. Police, on police business, Mr. Codalier. You wish I... to enter into negotiations with me concerning private piano lessons, concerning harmony, theory? Concerning Joan Tracy. Uh, theory. Joan. All right, if we talk inside? Please. Then Joan is your business with me, eh? Because the boy she was with last night was found murdered. A boy? Um, not her husband? Not her husband. I think I read of it. I'm not sure. Drunk, a knife, a death. So many in the newspapers. It becomes vague. It becomes so many Joans. Another thing we know about this Joan. She was a friend of yours. She played cello in a trio that you... And you wish my interpretation of Joan. What phrasings, what nuances, what dynamics would bring a woman like Joan to murder a boy, not her husband? All I want from you is... I will tell you of Joan. The theory, okay? All right, tell me. A cringer. A woman who put on the face of a beaten child when no one lifted a finger to her. You'll explain it to me, huh? So you will understand. In a trio, when a cello makes a boo-boo in phrasing, in breathing, in emotion, looks are exchanged between the violin and the piano. When such looks are exchanged between us, Joan sometimes wept, cringed, looked beaten. Well, I still don't understand. I will show you. On my piano. Uh, this is a passage for the cello from a trio we have often played. It is to be sung so, with heart, with subtlety, with delicacy, as I have played it. Uh, Joan played it so. Understand? I think so. Good. Now that is Joan. Strict tempo, strict pitch, and strictly without heart. That is Joan. What I said before to you. Please do it. Please go away. <laughs> I play the violin. There's Joan and her cello, Kodali with his piano, and I play the violin. Well, I want to know about Joan, Mr. Vernon. Not very good with the cello. I've heard that. Uh, other things, though. I love her I... once. Oh? In retrospect, it was pity more than anything else. I was filled with a sorrow for her. Why? This was before she was married, of course. About the pity, Mr. Vernon. Why? She was, is, docile because of her mother, very domineering mother. 
A cliché of a domineering mother. A do-this-do-that cliché of a domineering mom. And if you don't, I'll fall on my face with a heart attack and you'll be sorry. You know? And I pitied Joan. I see. One day I took her in my arms. And I liked it. It started off by feeling sorry. When I was holding her, I forgot my purpose in doing so. I said to myself, love. Tell me something, Mr. Vernon, about this trio. A simple thing. We all studied at the academy. We met. One evening long ago, we said, let's have a trio. We're not too expert, really. We saw and pound and call it Beethoven, and it's a fine time. And you were in love with Joan once, but not now, is that right? Right. You see, I recognized what kind of woman Joan was and what I really felt for her, and that she would need a man exactly like her mother. You know her husband? Just pokes his nose in, waves a right and crop at us, and vanishes. When's the last time you saw Joan? About, uh, let me see, four days ago, Tuesday. Tell me about it. To console her about her mother's death. Well, I understand her mother fell down the steps and died. Well? Well, what? You want me to say isn't that nice? Oh, forget it. I just wanted you to comment on whether you thought Her that... mother was pushed? How do I know? I got better things to do than conjecture on a horror like her. Okay. Uh, tell me about the last time you saw Joan. Joan was in the library at her home. I went to her. She was playing the cello, sawing away tunelessly and loud. She noticed I was there finally, grinned at me, picked up the cello and broke it over an antique brass pot. And don't ask me whether the latter's symbolic. And that's all? Not quite. She sobbed then. And I felt sorry for her again and took her in my arms again, and I thought suddenly what a stupid girl this was. I said goodbye to her. Anything else you can tell me about her, Mr. Vernon? Not a thing. She really isn't stupid, you know. My first impression was correct. To be pitied, that's more nearly correct. And back in the street now, at city at nine o'clock of May, time for Stoop Dweller to chart the course of new fallen star and also observe the nebulae in wake of the summer passage of a boy and girl through a million private comets. Time of the chuckle and the elbow poke in the ribs. Time to check condition of tenement roof and stake out the place of summer sleeping. Walk through currents of May night. Somewhere between where you were and headquarters, stop for the sandwich and the coffee with conjectures on the murder of a boy who had read poetry to a drunken woman. A woman who had tried to kill her husband in your presence, who the night before had driven a cab, had shouted in the Greenwich Village Club that she was free, free, free. And leave them alongside the tip, because there were new conjectures to be had at headquarters, from study of reports, from further musings against May night. And in a while, from Detective Mugovan also. About Joan Tracy's husband. Oh, what about him? Well, him, Joan Tracy's mother, different relationship, different age, different gender. But, uh-huh, but. But what, Mugovan? But peas from the same pod. Happens in a pod sometime. And the way I know is, one summer my seed man uh, showed you me You mind charge. just about Tracy, her mother, her husband. Oh, then. Mugovan, so help me. Oh, don't get riled, kid. Now, you've been doing legwork, I've been doing legwork, so just don't get riled, huh? <laughs> yeah, on your feet, Danny. Walk it. You haven't had enough of it, huh? Look, don't you understand? I've been trying to tell All you... All right, Mugovan, tell me what. What I found out from my legwork. From friends, neighbors, spectators on the life of Joan Tracy. Well? What I already told you. Her husband, she tried to kill in front of me. Her mother who fell down steps and died a week ago. Both the same type people. Both wielders of the big stick, tongue lashers of what they considered lesser persons in the human scale. You'll explain it, huh, Mugovan? Glad to. Now look, mother of Joan Tracy, one of those mothers. The kid, Joan, the woman, Joan, couldn't make a move, couldn't breathe, couldn't smile, couldn't cry until Mama gave the word. Up until Joan married Mr. Tracy, then. Well, she married him, then what? Uh, a word about the background of husband Harold Tracy. Uh, it seems a few years back he was headmaster in a boys' military academy. Seems he had codes of behavior for little boys. Oh, and disciplines to match. <laughs> Pete Chirino of a chap with the willow rod, I understand. Now, Danny, you take a man like that, marry him to a woman like Joan, what have you got? Yeah. Get on the phone. Get him down here, Mugovan. <laughs>
just uh, have a seat, Mr. Tracy. How's my wife? I understand you've been calling every hour. They said she wouldn't talk, that she was just staring. Once... What? Once when I was a headmaster, there was a boy who did that. I took him for a walk. I talked with him. I cured him. He didn't do it anymore. You ordered him to behave, is that right? I illuminated for him the difference between proper and improper conduct. Joan already knows that. Mm. Then all you think your wife needs is talking to by you. Exactly. Why did she want to kill you, Mr. Tracy? You mean this morning with a knife? Of course, that's what I mean. Were there other times? Certainly not this morning Joan was drunk. No, no, I don't think so. I know my wife. You know whether she ever tried to kill her mother? Oh, are you serious? Then she didn't push her mother down the steps, did she? Joan was with me in Atlantic City when her mother fell. Well, that's what I wanted to know. You see... Stay in here, Mrs. Tracy. Hello, Joan. Hello, Hal. You see, Clover? You ready to go home, Joan? Whenever you say so. You see, Clover. Please uh, sit down, Mrs. Tracy. Go ahead, Joan. In a little while, dear, I'm going to take you home and we'll have a little talk. How? What, dear? If you ever get close to me, I'll try to kill you. She don't like you at all, Mr. Tracy. She's not drunk, either. What have you people done to her? Nothing. They haven't done a thing. They gave me time to just lie there in bed and scheme. They didn't bother me. I've got a lot of schemes. And if we go home together, one of them I like very much. Joan. Joan. Uh, don't. Joan. Get away from her. She's my wife. You heard what he said. Get away from her. That's better. <laughs> Mrs. Tracy. Yes. What? You want to tell us about last night? Joan, you don't have to. I want to. Go on. I got very drunk. I met a boy who recited poetry. We got very drunk together. I passed out. I woke up. I think he was dead. I didn't know. I drank some more from the bottle and I walked out into the street. Then it was this morning and I was here. You didn't have to say that. Why not? Why not? What's happened to you, Joan? I'm free. What? You know. I don't understand what she's talking about. She's a very sick woman. My wife is sick. She'll get better. That about does it, huh, Mr. Tracy? What are you talking about? Your wife's mother died last week. I can tell it. I've been thinking about it. I know the words. When she died... I heard about it, and I sat down to cry. I couldn't cry. I felt relieved. You said free. Free. Of the kind of life you had with your mother. Afraid, docile. Hal. What? That's why I was such a good wife to you. Why the transition was so easy, from daughter to bride. It was the same thing. You're the same kind of person. You could have explained it to me. No, not to you. You'd hit the air with your riding crop and demand obedience. Joan, listen to me. (laughs) Joan, listen to me. Joan, listen to me. When your mother died, it happened. You were free of both of them. That's what I meant. What about it, Mr. Tracy? Well? Well, what? I had a shore, that's all. I caught up with her at that place, at that club in the village, as she was going out with that boy. I followed them. They were both in a stupor, a drunken stupor, when I walked in on them. So you stabbed the boy and planted the knife on your wife? It was sordid what you did, Joan. Ugly. Unbecoming. It needed to be stopped. I stopped it. You killed a boy, Hal. You didn't stop anything. I may go now. May I not? Goodbye, Hal. Hal. One thing you can be sure of, you'll never be embarrassed by me again, wherever you are. Dawn touches Broadway now. The last shadows leave and take away the night. And over the river a cloud drifts, and a bird dips and touches it with a wing. The people wake. The fury gathers and funnels out into the streets. Walk easy. Another day has come. The shock has come. It's Broadway. The gaudiest. The most violent. 
the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calford as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mogovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Sammy Hill was heard as Joan and Whitfield Connor as Hal. Featured in the cast were D.J. Thompson, Jerry Hausner, and Harry Bartell. Bill Anders speaking. This Monday night on CBS Radio's Suspense, Dick Haynes stars in Pigeon in the Cage. It concerns a man who is trapped in an elevator between floors, but who dares not call for help because his only possible rescuers are murderers. With this story, CBS Radio hopes once again to keep you in Suspense this Monday night on most of these same stations. And remember, the top dramatic show of all, the Lux Radio Theater, is heard Monday nights on the CBS Radio Network. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. It comes to every street, and it comes to Broadway, the single instant when summer nighttime hits the skids. When tomorrow starts coming in, it's the instant when the shadows start to stretch and the first neon is turned off and a puff of breeze up from the river blows the warmth away. Somebody pays a check and the party breaks up. Somebody yawns. Somebody goes home. It's the time of the delicatessen store where the toast is drunk with cream soda and go home with the newspapers. And it's come to Broadway. Another day's dying. Where I was, the night returns to the river, causes phenomena such as a thousand curves of moon reflected in dark water and drifting to the sea, such as brief, wild sob of a ship suddenly landlocked, such as death sprawled beside it. A couple of kids walking past here stumbled, Danny saw the woman dead, called it in. Any identification, Mugwin? A purse, a wallet, haven't had a chance to look. Here. I guess you got a yacht that gives you the privilege. Huh? That yacht out there, look at him. You make him out? What am I bitter about? Somebody buy me a small yacht, I'd dance, blow the whistle, and... Yeah, just like that, I... Oh, for now, just hold the flash over this way, huh, Mugovan? Yeah. Ruth Shea, 1212 West 65th. In case of accident, notify Robert Shea. Relation husband. Height, 5 feet 4 inches, weight 160. Bet this woman weighs more than that now, Danny. Closer to 250, I'll bet. No money in the wallet. Robbery, huh? Probably. Nothing else in this purse except a couple of candy bars. I'd say she was walking or was driven down here and... That's a real happy sound. Yeah. You know something? What? I never knew what I wanted out of life. 
Now I know. This is a night to remember, Danny. And to headquarters now to file a report, to detail the violence, to wait, because there are entries to be made in blank spaces provided for the purpose. Information not yet available. Information now being worked on in official and prescribed tempo, which may take an hour, two, maybe more, which will then be tendered to the interested party. Wait. And on the fringe of dawn, the tiptoe entrance of that filler-in of blank spaces, Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. Good morning, Danny. Well, you don't have to whisper, Gino. It's Forgive it... me. Unaccustomed as I am to night duty, it follows that I would perhaps not be up in the etiquette for the occasion. So kill me. It's just that you don't need to whisper, Gino. You're not... If for various reasons I need to approach Mrs. T at four of a morning... I whisper. Uh, Gino. If one of my tataglia yells out at four in the morning, water, I need glass of water, I whisper back, get it yourself, honey. Gino, just give it to me. How the information you have? Goes without saying. Uh, report still warm from the hands of the medical examiner, Dr. Sinsky, concerning the deceased Ruth Shea as follows. Weight of victim, 242 pounds and odd ounces. 242 pounds in a woman? This is Just go bit. on, huh, Gino. <clears throat> Approximate age of Ruth Shea deceased, age 27. Condition of Ruth Shea at time of decease, body full of many bullet wounds. The gun that killed was emptied into her, which leads Dr. Sinsky to the conclusion that... That what? That Ruth Shea was murdered in passion, in fury, to quote the good doctor, and for no motives of robbery or etc., also, Danny, not on the report what? that the husband of Ruth Shea, having been notified, is right now waiting outside the morgue. Why didn't you tell me, Gino? And strip... He'll wait, Danny. He'll wait. What else is a husband in his condition to do? Besides, he's been there all... The walk now. Root channeled through plaster walls, bulletin boards stressing courtesy and alertness, and doorways to squad rooms, detention rooms, and other doorways. Root to the morgue. And the final long corridor with the painted red arrows and discreet printing and the permanent beads of sweat on the wall. And the last turn, and the man waiting in front of the brown doors. Are you Mr. Clover? The impeccable man. The man in shades of gray. The natty man who had brought a carved malacca cane to the enormous cold room. Who held a Hamburg between you and him like a shield. They told me to wait here for you. I'm Mr. Shea, Robert Shea. Then you know it's pretty certain your wife might be here in the morgue, Mr. Shea. I knew she was missing. Has been for some hours. Let's go in. You say your wife has just been missing for hours. Since midnight, I'd say. Please. What? Uh... Before I do, before I tell you, before I recite small things as concerns Ruth and myself, the wherefores and so on, let's be sure. All right. Well? Why is she dead, Mr. Clover? She's been shot. Someone empty. I mean, why is she dead? This is your wife. Why is she dead? Let's get out of here, Mr. Clover. Please tell me why. All of a sudden now, Ruth is dead and shot and in this place. I want to know. Maybe robbery, maybe... All right. I'll accept that. Sit down, Mr. Shea. Can I get you something? What did you have in mind that you can get me, Mr. Clover? Water, cigarette, that's all. And the concerned look you're offering up right now? I analyzed that look correctly, didn't I? Partly. Quizzical? That's right. I want you to tell me about your wife's being missing, the, the small things you mentioned. At midnight, about then we were tired. I kissed my wife goodnight. She went to her bedroom. I had mine. Go on. I couldn't sleep. I thought to listen to some music. My bed radio is... There's a little screw on the tuner. It's out of order. I thought to go into Ruth's room quietly and take her radio. I see now how I knew. This ever happened before, Mr. Shea? Two or three times. Oh? But each time I found Ruth on the back porch. You won't believe it. Tell me. Reading poetry by flashlight. Listen, Mr. Clover. Yes? First of all, you must concern yourself with me. I know that. Whether I killed my wife. I didn't. I... I worshipped her. You'll find that out. All right. You can see how wonderful she was. Poetry by flashlight. I worshipped her. You'll find out that I did. You'll see. Now I'd like to be alone. Morning, Mr. 
morning, Danny. Hi. Sleep good? Oh. Uh-huh. That's good. See the morning paper? No. You don't look at the morning paper, Danny. How are you going to know what's happened during the night to our civilization? No, you so help me. That's you... why I brought one with me. Already folded neatly to page 10. Behind the sports section and what the Giants went and did again. Here, the third column. Picture of a young woman. Want to look at it, Danny? I'm sure you do. Look. Very beautiful. Very. Very. <laughs> no, no, don't read it, Danny. Let me lay it out personally. That beautiful woman in harem costume, that ravishing thing, that doll. Oh, that's got heartbreak in it, the way her mouth curves. That's Ruth Shea. The same Ruth Shea we found shot up near the river. I don't... Sure you don't believe it. Neither do I. But that's her, all right. Picture taken two years ago at a society fair with tents on Long Island. <laughs> the beautiful, elegant Ruth Shea, they say about her. Just that long ago. I she's... checked with the newspaper. One of their boys grabbed the picture two years ago. August, 1951. I talked to him personally. All right, Muggerman. She was beautiful. So what does it... Uh... What does it prove? <laughs> How would I know? How would I know what happens to a woman who looks like that and then ends up as a 250-pound corpse? How would I... What do you want, Tartaglia? Uh, what do you want, Sergeant? My mission is to Lieutenant Clover, if you don't mind, Detective What is Muggerman. it, Gino? Just came a phone call to this department from a Miss Dinah Martin. Well? A Miss Dinah Martin who politely informed me she was an intimate friend of the late Ruth Shea. That she saw Ruth no less than day before yesterday, and also, if we will kindly send someone to her place, she will be happy to chat about who killed her dear friend Ruth. Her also, address, Tartagli, you get it? Also, Danny, the address of Miss Dinah Martin, which I present to you for your personal consideration. Thanks, Gino. You did good. Thank you, Danny. And before you mention the squad car, Detective Mugovan, it has been ordered and is awaiting your pleasure. That is all. <laughs> It says over the doorbell, Dinah Martin, just like... You want to ring the bell, Muggerman? Maybe Dinah changed her mind. Try the door, huh? Wouldn't live without it. We go in, Danny? Sure we do. Danny? And the thing that stopped him. Girl seated on the floor, head twisted, leaning up against the edge of bed. Arms unbent, curved inward, fingers taut in attitude of distorted dance. Mouth in silent, infinite scream. Eyes open, staring. Throat. Bruises, Danny. She's been strangled. Girl strangled. In attitude of doll. Attitude of death. Final pose of murder. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Next Tuesday is Coronation Day in Great Britain. CBS Radio has been planning for months to bring you all-out coverage of the actual ceremonies, the parades, and the processions. You'll hear hours and hours of color, background, and pageantry, reported by Edward R. Murrow, Robert Trout, Howard K. Smith, Paul Niven, Alexander Kendrick, and many other noted CBS Radio newsmen. CBS Radio goes on the air at 5.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time next Tuesday to begin coverage of the coronation. Coverage that will make this great event a vivid reality for listeners from coast to coast. Noon time of May on Broadway. Also the time of the excursion uptown to place wreath on stone or on wood. And the gust of memory, memory... Knelt at, memory wept for. Then back to the street, back to Broadway, to observe the dying of May. To stand on the street corner, nibble the hot pastrami, look into the future. When again it will be the time of youth. The two-week romp in the Catskills. The burial in the sand at Far Rockaway. Ecstasy on the high curve of the roller coaster at Coney. And on the moon-burned grass of Public Park, the girl to make talk to. Dream talk. 
crazy talk, summertime talk. When May dies, it'll happen. And where I was, in Detective Mugovan, room of the strangled girl. Room where girl had slept and awakened. Room now subject to more official, more prescribed routines. To be walked by strangers. To be searched. There's little letters here, Danny, all addressed to Miss Dinah Martin. Huh? Those book plates you found going through her books. Dinah Martin, huh? Yeah. Other things, shoes, dresses, lingerie. Looks like they go good with her size, color, material. Yeah. Pretty positive identification, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I do, Mugovan. When she called in, she said she knew about Ruth Shea's dying, said she wanted to talk to somebody. About yeah, it. she did. Now we won't know. She's got nobody to talk you to. You want to look in the other rooms, Mugovan? I'll do that. Hey, Danny, look. Yeah, look at this, this framed photograph. Let's see it. She was younger then. Sure younger. A kid freshly graduated from high school. And the other kids with her. Two girls in white graduation gowns. A boy in blue coat, white flannel pants. <laughs> Diplomas crossed like swords. This older gentleman with the rimless glasses. Autographed to Dinah. This one next to her, Ruth Shea. Yeah, beauty even when she was a kid, huh, Danny? Look how This her... one, Mary Greer. The boy, Steve Harnden. This inscription under the picture of the older man. Yeah, to the bright stars, may fortune continue smiling. Signed, John... The, uh, uh, Brewster. Is that yeah, Brewster? Oh, don't mention it. Oh, don't ask me, Danny. I'll stay and take over. And to Officer Sinker, the man assigned to such things, show him the picture, point out the name, and wait five minutes. Picture taken in front of North Park High School on 95th. And Mr. Brewster, that would be Mr. John Brewster, principal. So the squad car and early afternoon ride uptown... And on the playing fields of North Park High, the young men officially required to wear underwear between the hours of one and two on this day. And the young ladies looking plucky in black bloomers and preparing their ship for the great sea of life by batting a hockey ball up and down. Enter the red brick building. Ask of a giggler where the principal's office is, and her girlfriend has to answer for her. Walk the hall, hallowed by large glass case with only three athletic trophies in it, Two won by girls' teams, and an office, and ask for and be received by Mr. Brewster. It's about Ruth Shea, isn't it? And about another woman, uh, Dinah Martin. Dinah? What's happened to her? Dead. Oh, surely now you We must found be... this uh, picture in her room, Mr. Brewster, only a short time ago. Uh, would you look at it, please? Uh, of course. Dinah, Ruth, Mary Greer, Steve Herndon, and myself. Ah, but uh, you know that the autograph... Five people on a photograph. Two murdered within a day of each other. Can you give me any idea of... Uh... Well, these four students, my scholarship students of that year, ten years ago, I'd say, about that. We had our pictures taken together, an annual thing. I see. Each won a scholarship to college. Had you seen Ruth? I mean... When she was dead. The black hair. What? I, I marveled as black It was as... red, Mr. Brewster, a kind of red. Ruth was so beautiful... I remember how I would stand by that window and watch as she... Time does pass, doesn't it? Yes. It's a pity she didn't go to college. She had a fine mind. Uh, Ruth, didn't you know, she married after graduation. Why she married when she could have had an education... Mr. Brewster. Uh, what? Oh, yes. Had you seen her recently? Not since I handed her her diploma. But I got word from her. Uh, about her from time to time. Oh? Uh, coincidence, really. What is it? I happened into Dinah Martin six months ago. Uh, eight. No, well, it's not see. important how long ago. Just tell me. The... She said she'd seen Ruth often. That Ruth was fat and a horror as a person. A crier, twister of handkerchief, an eaten woman. You know how they are. Go on. Well, that's all she said. She was in a hurry. And now she's dead. Strangled to death. Well, that's all she said. She was in a hurry. You know where I can find this other boy and girl in the picture? Oh, my secretary should be able to tell you. We send out cards periodically to see what happened to our people. She should know. Things really do, don't they, Mr. Clover? They really change.
You won't mind if I let the record play through whatever we have to talk about, will you, Mr. Clover? Well, not if you... Uh... I don't mind it. Why should you? Look, Miss Greer... If not that record, then the radio. Because it helps me when I need to think. When I have to study, when... You're still a student, Miss Greer? Postgraduate work at Columbia. I'm on my doctorate in Oriental Philosophies. Before that, it was medieval tapestries and their profundities. Before that... Miss Greer... It... I won a scholarship in high school, you know. Me and Ruth and... Dinah and Steve. And Mr. Brewster told me. Miss Greer, I want And to... I took the gentle Mr. Brewster's gentle words to heart. And I never stopped studying. And I never stopped learning. And I know absolutely nothing. Positively. May I see that photograph again, please? Of course. This one is dead. And this one is dead. The poor, poor young things. That's the emotion their dying brings to you, Miss Greer? Precisely the emotion. I have no compassion for them, dead or alive. Why not? Good question. Very good question. Well, just tell me, Miss Greer. Dinah. Dinah Martin, I can dispose of in very few words. There was nothing about her to interest me. Shallow girl with brain and soul to match. She fooled others. Mr. Brewster, but not me. And Ruth Shea. A very great beauty in her youth. Once the boys' soccer team carried her around the campus on their shoulders... She was masked, so they built a bonfire and... That's why you don't care she's dead. Could be. Could be one of the reasons. What others? You take a beautiful girl like Ruth. And circumstances are such that you must go to high school with raving beauty. Any questions? Go on. And you, the student and girl, must observe what Ruth does to boys. And later to men. Then you must stand by and watch as she marries... A wonderful man, a handsome man, an impeccable man. Still no questions? Look, Miss Greer, just... And this man takes this Ruth for better or for worse, and builds pedestals for her beauty, where he may worship and not let her lift a finger to anything and not demand anything of her. And years later you see this girl, this beauty, this owner of everything in the world, and... And... And what? And she's still beautiful, but this... Dissatisfied and edgy and making this slow but sure change into a complete horror. When a man has loved her like that, has married her, has... You still wonder, Mr. Clover, why no compassion for O'Shea, alive or dead? No. I didn't take you for a fool. Goodbye, Mr. Clover. How did you find me, Mr. Clover? I got your home address from your high school. I phoned your house. Your wife told me where to find you. She say I'd be up to my elbows and shoulder pads? Yes, she did. It's a joke for people who ask where I am during the day. The things those people are making, shoulder pads for ladies' garments. Here, this is a shoulder pad. Oh, very interesting. Interesting? The heat done something Look, to you? Uh, Look, okay. Mr. Herndon. Okay. He said it's about Dinah and Ruthie when you come in. That's right. Dinah went out of town to college, if I remember correctly. Me, I stayed here. Had you seen her recently? No. No. How about Ruth? In high school, I practically fainted for just one touch of a loose-leaf book. Nuts about her. I understand she used to be a very beautiful girl. You remember Dolores Costello in the movies? Only with cold black hair. Wistful, but with the much of mystery... <laughs> The black hair did it for me. Black hair. Last time I saw it was platinum. How long ago was this? Well, I saw her at a party a couple of years ago. How did she look? Started to get a little heavy, I thought. Figured it was from the booze. Oh? Yeah, she was real loaded. Hey, listen. Uh Uh-huh. You already talked to my wife on the phone, haven't you? There's no need to talk to her again, is there? I doubt it. Why? uh... (laughs) My wife always wondered where I disappeared to for an hour. That party two years ago. I danced Ruth out on the balcony. Ruth was loaded. You remember I told you that? That's right, you did. And she hated him, but she wouldn't let me kiss her. Hated her husband, you mean? Yeah, that's right. She was talking divorce two years ago. Did you know that? She said he wouldn't give her one. What else did she say? Oh, she said she'd get even with him, you know. Why did she hate him, Mr. Hernan? Did she tell you that? Yeah, kind of. Said she wanted to get off that pedestal. She said he wouldn't let her really be a wife. He would do everything for her. 
I'm tired of being told she was so beautiful and she mustn't do this or do the. Look, Miss Stutman on the basting machine has got her hand raised. She's a new girl. Will you pardon me, Mr. Clover? Yes? Hello, Mr. Shea. You uh, remember me, don't you? Yes. Now, this is Detective Mugovan. Pleased to meet you. Well, let's go inside. I was just going... Thank you very much. We will. You know why we came to see you, Mr. Shea? Additional information? Whatever it is, I'll be glad. To answer your question. Question? The one you asked me in the morgue. Oh. Well... Well, what? You mean as to why it happened to Ruth? Why she was killed? I know the answer. Well, let's see if it jives with ours. Mr. Clover himself suggested it. Robbery. Ruth was foolish enough, sentimental enough to take a walk late at night by the river. She left herself open for that sort of thing. It's not an extraordinary happening in the city that, that a woman lonely on a, a lonely stretch of pavement. Ruth was well-dressed, as you know. Ruth, to some people, there was a prettiness in her face. Uh, cut it out, Mr. Shea. It's possible that she attracted... Anyhow, you know as well as I do, she had no money with her. A woman of her class to have no money. Therefore, it points... I've come to the conclusion that it was murder provoked Danny. But... Leave him alone. Well, doesn't that make sense? I've asked myself over and over. Over and over. What about the seven bullets? What? Whoever shot your wife emptied his gun into her. Her murderer was provoked. Down at headquarters, we've got it tabbed as a crime of passion. What do you mean? Love, hate, emotion, you know. A bright man like you. A man shoots a woman, she drops. He stands over, he keeps shooting. You know, Passion. Is that the right word? Danny. Yeah. You, you can have your opinion, of course, but certainly I... Certainly you what? Are you hinting that my wife had a clandestine meeting? That there was another man? Mr. Shea. Well, is that what you're hinting? We found out your wife was a very great beauty. A long time ago. There was still a prettiness in her face. Some two years with... ago, the papers ran a picture of her in a harem costume. Slender, graceful. You remember? Yes. Her black hair. Yes. Then she died at platinum. How'd she look? Cheap. On her. And she was starting to put on weight. Then she dyed her hair again. Uh, what would you say that color was, Danny? I don't know. Orange. She said red, but something happened. And getting sloppier. A beautiful woman like that. At the time she was 16, I loved her. 16 and lovely. And I married her. Mr. Shea. So lovely. And young and slender. What happened, Mr. Shea? What happened, I don't know. I really don't know. I know. She wanted a divorce, didn't she? To lose a beautiful thing like Ruth, I'd have to be out of my mind. Do you understand why she wanted a divorce, Mr. Shea? She said... She you said, wouldn't let her be a wife, is that what she said? I worshipped her. I worshipped the ground she walked Because on. she was beautiful and you loved her. Yes, 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 yes. And she destroyed the woman you loved. Herself. You see what she did? In two years before my eyes, she became a horror, a glutton. Everything I did. So you killed her? Yes. And killed Dinah Martin. I went to see her because I knew she understood what happened. She opened the door for me and saw it was me and started to scream. I strangled her. Let's go, Mr. Shea. You should have seen her, my wife, how beautiful she was, the woman I loved. And Ruth killed her, and there was another person living in her place, coarse, orange hair, and what she had become. I'm ready. It's the street of the hunter, this Broadway, of the smile that's dropped at the tip of the hat, and lights flung from windows out of doorways, and you walk a pavement spangled with a thousand colors, but between the light, that's where the darkness is. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world, Broadway. My beat.
Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Lamont Johnson was heard as Robert. Featured in the cast were Truda Marson, Lawrence Dobkin, and Steve Roberts. Bill Anders speaking. Remember, the stars still shine in the Lux Summer Theater Monday nights on the CBS Radio Network. Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It's just before noon on a bright but blustery day in San Francisco. And Mike Shane, San Francisco's favorite detective, instead of chasing criminals, is sitting peacefully in his office, academically discussing crime and its detection with his able and attractive associate, Phyllis Knight. And, oh yes, the inspector of homicide who has come to take them to lunch. You see, Inspector, I'm not criticizing the police department when I say that uh, I'm not bound by the rules that... Well, you, for instance, are bound. I realize that, Mike. I have to be pretty sure of my ground before I make an arrest. I have to have evidence enough to convince the district attorney, and he has to have reasonable prospects of obtaining a conviction before he goes to the grand jury. Plus the fact that you, Inspector, can be sued for wrongful arrest, whereas we, Mike and I, never arrest anybody. <laughs> we pass the buck to you. <laughs> I know. I know all that. But what I'm getting at is this. Mike has something in the way of, well, being able to nose out a suspect that we, well, that is most of us in the department, either don't have or else don't apply. The answer is simple. Proving it is difficult. Let's hear it in all its simplicity. Well, you and every other member of the department are so busy taking notes, which you have to do, that you get into the habit of reading what witnesses and suspects have to say. Whereas I, uh, I listen to their tones, uh, to their delivery... I strain my ears for the meaning behind what they say instead of the mere words. I'll admit all that. I think there's something else, Inspector. Although I hesitate to say this. <laughs> don't spare my feelings, Phyllis. <laughs> no, I'm not thinking of your feelings. It's Mike's. Oh, don't spare mine, Angel. You never do. Hmm. Well, in spite of the fact that Mike hates criminals and hates crime, I think he has a criminal mind. Angel, what you just said. I mean it. Mike seems to be saying to himself... If I had committed this crime, how would I go about it? Or if I were the important clue, where would I be found? Well, that's not a criminal mind, Angel. That's just that I... Michael Shane, private detective... Hi, Phil. Is the inspector there? Oh, sure thing, Sergeant. For you, Inspector. Uh-oh. Hope this doesn't break our lunch date. Hello, Sergeant. Report a homicide, Inspector. A man named Porter called up and said he found a body at 323 Foothill. Any idea who the murdered man is? Porter said the man's name was Beatty. Didn't give much more information. He seemed pretty upset, not too coherent. Okay, Sergeant. I'll meet you there as soon as I can get there. Homicide, huh? Yeah. Well, what do you want? 
Murder or lunch? Oh, don't be silly, Inspector. We'll pass up a whole week's meals for a murder any time. This is the street. Yeah. And that looks like the apartment. Right there, with a man standing on the steps. Yeah, that's it. No signs of your boys yet, Inspector. No, but then we were closer than headquarters. That must be Porter. Looks all upset. Well, wouldn't you if you just found a body? Are you, uh, Mr. Porter? Yes, yes. I've been pacing up and down these steps waiting. I thought you'd never come. Where's the body? Upstairs, on the couch in his living room. This isn't your house, then? Uh, no. No, this is Mr. Beatty's house. Oh. You were visiting Mr. Beatty? I called to take him to lunch. When? Just before I called the police. Not more than uh, 20 minutes ago. In this way, please. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I, I, I went in, and there he was lying on the couch. There was a knife sticking out of his chest. I ran over to him, felt for his heart, and got my fingers all sticky with blood. You shouldn't have touched the body. Well, I didn't know it was a body. He might still have been alive. Had he been, I would have called a doctor before I called the police. That makes sense. Where is he, in this room? Uh, on the couch there. He, uh... Oh, but... But he must be. Body? There's no body on this couch. But no. he was there. Maybe you were mistaken. Maybe he wasn't dead. Oh, but he was dead. He was cold. He was bleeding. His, his heart wasn't beating. Ugh. What's the matter, Angel? Oh, there's blood on the couch. I just got my hand in it. So you're right. Here, here's my handkerchief. Thank well, you. if he was dead, someone must have removed him. But they couldn't, Inspector. There's only one entrance to the apartment through the front door. There's no back door to the apartment? No, and I've been here all the time. I... I haven't been out of the sight of that front door since I discovered his body. I, I... I feel sick. I've got to sit down. Okay, okay, now calm yourself, calm yourself. I don't blame you for being upset. But we'd better get this straightened out. Mr. Porter, tell us what you did from the very start. Well, I, I told you. I, I came to take him to lunch. If he was dead, how did you get in? Well, the door was open. And that's funny, too, because he was always careful about locking and bolting it. Go on, go on. The door was open, so you went in. I found him, and... When I saw he was dead, I, I, I phoned the police. You'll probably find my bloody fingerprints on the phone. Yes. Then what did you do? Well, I, I walked up and down, and I went to the front door. I came back and... Oh, I, I remember. I saw the mail lying in the hallway. I absently, almost unthinkingly, picked it up. Where did you put it? On the table there. Mm hmm Huh? Oh, the wind must have blown it on the floor. There. That's it? That's it. Uh, then you did what? Well, that's all I... I walked back and forth, and I'd walk downstairs to the front door to look for the police, and then I'd come back. And you were never out of sight of that hallway and front door? No, not for one second. Well, it's a cinch that even Houdini couldn't take a body out this back window. That window was open? Yes. Oh. No signs of anything on the sill. No, and even if there were, Mike, look there. Workmen working on that building would be bound to see anything like that. Yeah, you're right, Andrew. You up there, Inspector? Yeah, come upstairs. Well, what do you think, Inspector? I don't know what to think. What's more, I don't know what to do. Well, what do you mean you don't know what to do? Well, to put it bluntly, how do I go about finding a murderer when I haven't even got a body? But there was a body, and there has been a murder committed. You can't talk like that about not doing anything. The man's right, Inspector. I know perfectly well he's right. Why don't you suggest something? All right, I will. What? Let's go hunt a body. <laughs> Return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. You know, you hear a lot about magical post-war products and how easy they're going to make your life. Well, friends, one such product is here already. Yes, that's right. It's Union Oil Company's Luster Wash, a product that makes washing your car just about the easiest, simplest thing you've ever done. All you do is empty a small package of Union Luster Wash into a pail of water. Using an ordinary rag, apply the mixture generously over the car. Then, just rinse off with a hose, and you're all through. In 10 to 15 minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to taillight. No fuss, no bother, no mess. Union Luster Wash is harmless to the car finish and to your hands, yet cleans as fast as you can apply it, and without the usual elbow grease. Luster Wash is not a soap, 
but a special detergent compound which dissolves road film and traffic dirt on contact, leaving the surface clean and smooth. You'll be amazed at how fast it works and how clean it makes your car. A package of Luster Wash sells for only 10 cents and is enough to wash any average car. Remember the name, Luster Wash, for a new, easy way to wash your car. You can get Luster Wash at any Union Oil Minute Man station. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have been confronted with a murder, a man who saw the victim, but so far, no corpse. They've finished searching the apartment and stand looking at one another. Well, if there's a body in this house, it must be in small pieces and hidden in cracks in the walls. Well, there's certainly no body in this apartment. But, Inspector, Mr. Shane, I, I, I saw it. We know. We know, Mr. Porter, but it isn't here now. Look, we've all had our say on the body. Let's change to something else. We've pretty well covered the apartment. Not only us, but the sergeant and his boys. We couldn't find a thing amiss. Ah, uh, granted. So, let's take a look at the murdered man's mail. Oh, h- here it is. I put it on this end table. Oh, thanks. Ad from Flower Shop. Oh, open this one, Inspector. Okay. Here's another ad. And uh, you open this one, Angel. All right. I'll tackle this one. Hey, Mike. What? Hmm? Listen. I warned you for the last time. Settle up or else. Signed. I can't read the initials, but the signature looks like Reynolds. Oh, that must be. Yeah? Tell us more. Well, I, I, I don't know very much, but Reynolds and another man by the name of Weaver went into some sort of a deal with BT. They felt that BT had swindled them. Well, not in the way that they could go to law, you understand, but in such a way that Beatty didn't lose his money, but they lost theirs. And Beatty told me that he'd been threatened by them. He told me he was worried, but that was all. Why the dickens didn't you tell me this before? Oh, because I, I, I didn't think it was important. You surely don't think that either Reynolds or Weaver would kill Beatty over, over a thing like that? We don't know, but it's our only lead so far. Wouldn't you say so, Mike? Oh, not exactly, but it's one we've got to follow up, of course. You'll return home, Mr. Porter? Yes, yes, of course. I'll be there if you need me. Okay. Let's go, Phil, Mike. We'll go in my car. Let's see. The address on this stationery of Reynolds is Stats Building. I'll stay behind, Inspector, just in case of any phone calls or anything like that. Right, Charles, Sergeant. Um, doesn't anybody want to know what was in the letter I opened? Huh? Why, you little... I wondered why you were so quiet all of a sudden. What is it, Phil? Well, I didn't want to read it while we were in the room. You think we'd better wait till we reach the car? Oh, no, no, no. We're out of earshot. Okay, shoot. It says, I don't suppose I should care what happens to you, but just the same, you are a fool. I've told you before that I don't trust Porter, and I'm more sure of it now than ever before. What's the signature? There isn't any. But although it's written on a typewriter, I'll make you a bet. What? What? I'll bet you this warning was sent by a woman. Eighth floor, please. Yes, yeah, sir, eighth floor. Number eight, sir. There's Reynolds' office right down the hall. Yeah, there's a man just going in. Yeah, we might be in luck. That might be Weaver. Something tells me that this isn't going to be very profitable. Well, we'll soon see. Yes? May I help you? We'd like to see Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Reynolds is busy just now. If you'd care to wait, he has someone with him. The someone with him isn't by any chance Mr. Weaver. Well, well, yes, it is, but how... Oh, you saw him come in just before you did. Then if it is Mr. Weaver, that's most fortunate, because we want to see both gentlemen. Well, I I don't know. I'll ring Mr. Reynolds. Please don't. We're on police business, and we'd rather go in unannounced. Oh, but I... I... Well, and to what do I owe this intrusion? Isn't my receptionist out there? Your receptionist isn't at fault, Mr. Reynolds. I'm from police headquarters. We'd like to ask a few questions. Police? What on earth for? You sent this threatening letter, Mr. Reynolds? Let me see. Uh, yes, yes, I did. And I'll send more if I don't get satisfaction. Uh, Satisfaction for what, sir? I don't think it is anyone's business. It's police business, Mr. Reynolds. Now, we can all be very comfortable and save a lot of time by getting our answers here. But, of course, if you prefer headquarters, then that's your privilege. No. Well, if Beatty has been fool enough to report this letter to the police, I'll tell you all you want to know. We'd like to know why you wrote the letter. Well, briefly, uh, Beatty, Mr. Weaver here and I, uh, put up equal amounts of money into an enterprise. It was at Beatty's inducement. Uh, Beatty had the inside track on the thing. He knew before we did that the venture wasn't going well. 
He withdrew his money without giving us a chance to withdraw ours. And the venture folded. It did, and... Uh, Go on, sir. Reynolds and I feel that Beatty should share the loss with us. In other words, you feel that Beatty should split what he got out of the deal three ways with you two. Yes. Uh, legally, of course, we can't compel him. Morally, we feel entitled to it. Uh, where does Mr. Porter fit into this scheme? Porter? <laughs> He doesn't fit in at all. He's just a real estate man who helped Reynolds find a warehouse. A personal friend of Reynolds? Well, yes. You said warehouse. Is uh, the warehouse being used, Weaver? No, no. We still have a lease on it, but the business folded three weeks ago. And the warehouse is empty? Yes, uh, quite empty. You have the keys. Uh, I do. Uh, you want to borrow them? Yes. Thanks. Now, one more question. Where is the warehouse? It's at 2200 Key Street. Beatty, Weaver, and Reynolds is on the signboard. Oh, boy, what a rat trap. Yeah? Well, here's hoping it's more than just a rat trap. A man trap. Yeah, this looks like the key. Well, yeah, here we go. All right, now careful where you walk. Remember, they said the business folded three weeks ago. There should be enough dust on the floor to show footprints. Place is empty enough. There are footprints leading to that cubby hole of an office. Well, leave us have a look, see. There's not a blessed thing in here, except this old table. Take a look, Phil, Inspector. Hmm? Yeah. You noticed how the dust is disturbed on the edge of the table next to the wall? That means that table was moved. Yeah. No, it may not mean a thing, but keep it in mind. Outside of that rickety chair out in the warehouse, that seems to be everything. No loose boards or hidden closets or anything? No, uh, pretty much of a blank. Mike? Yeah? Inspector. Yeah? Take a look at this chair. I, I may be wrong. But... What is it, Angel? Oh, oh, look, that spot. Dry, shiny. It, it looks like brown paint, but it... It could be blood, huh? It does look like blood. One single drop. If it is a blood spot, it dropped from quite a height. You see how it's spread out like a, like a seal? Inspector. Yeah? That table. Let's get it out here, right in the center of the floor. Okay. Now, the chair on top of the table. Yeah. Mike, that ventilator in the roof. Right, Angel, right. I didn't notice it till now. That's oh, a common failing. People never lift their eyes high enough. Now, give me a hand, Inspector. Okay. I hate to twist an ankle, even on a murder case. There. Any luck? Yes. Yes, blood on the edge of the vent. You need a flashlight, Mike? Uh-uh. Uh, the body's here, all right close to the eaves and lying along the rafters. That'll do till the police surgeon gets here. Yeah, okay. Phil, will you make an inventory of all the stuff as we search it? Uh-huh, shoot. Okay. Leather wallet, identity card, J.J. Beattie. Driver's license, age 52. Mm -hmm. I think... Yeah? I think he was stabbed twice, Mike. Once in the back, and that was the stab that killed him. Stabbed again in the chest, eh? Looks that way. Autopsy will tell us definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, pocket handkerchief. Okay. One or two? One in trouser pocket. One folded in breast pocket of coat. Mm-hmm. Got it. Checkbook. Balance, $800.30. Any stubs to Porter, Reynolds, or Weaver? No, Mike. Seems to be all for light bills. Gas bills, department store purchases, things like that. Pipe, tobacco pouch, and book of matches. Yeah. Bill clip with $25 and loose cash. Three silver dollars, 90 cents, and two streetcar tokens. Old-fashioned gold watch and chain. Watch and gray. J.J. Beattie from fellow workers, Wadsworth Plant. Kansas, 1913. Uh-huh. Fountain pen and pencil. And that seems to be it. Okay, then. That's all. Got it. Got it all down in my own inimitable shorthand. So, that's all, is it? What do you mean, Mike? Yeah. Why that cat that ate the canary look on your face? <laughs> 
Once before, I told you that something was so blamed obvious that I wasn't going to tell you what it was. Oh, we remember, Daddy. Okay. The same thing applies here. Now, come on, let's get going. I don't know where you'd like to go, but I'd like to put in a phone call. Who to, Phil? First, to Mr. Beatty's wife, if he has one, ex or otherwise, to see if she wrote that warning note to Beatty. One run? Go ahead. If no Mrs. Beatty exists, then to the little receptionist at Reynolds' office for additional... Two runs, no errors. I'm with you. Good. And I'd like to use a police teletype. I'm with you on that one, Mike. We'll teletype Kansas to see what associates Mr. Beatty had in the days of his past. But I'm still puzzled about what you seem to know that we don't. <laughs> I don't know a thing that you don't know, Inspector. I'll give you one hint, just one. But you mustn't ask any more questions. I'll bite. Go ahead. Just put your hands in your pockets, Inspector. That's all. Just put your hands in your pockets. In just a moment, we'll return to Mike and Phyllis. Ladies and gentlemen, a few minutes ago, we told you about a sensational new way to wash your car. Now, if you think that there can't be anything new about washing a car, well, just try Union Luster Wash. You see, Luster Wash is a special detergent compound that makes washing a car just about the easiest, simplest thing you've ever done. All you do is empty a small package of Union Luster Wash into a pail of water. Then, with an ordinary rag, apply the mixture generously. To finish, you simply rinse the car with a hose. That's all. No rubbing or elbow grease is necessary. In 10 to 15 minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to taillight. Luster Wash cleans glass and chromium, too, which means you don't have to use a chamois afterwards. It's harmless to the finish and to your hands, and leaves no film to dull the surface. No matter how dirty your car may be, Union Luster Wash will wash it as swiftly as you can apply it. A package sells for just 10 cents, one dime, and is enough to wash any average car. Remember the name, Union Luster Wash, for a new, easy way to wash your car. You can buy Luster Wash at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Mike Shane, Phyllis, and the inspector are at headquarters. Phyllis is on the phone. Mike is looking at his notes, and every few minutes, the inspector guiltily puts his hands in his pockets, pulling them out again when he catches Mike's eye. Doggone you, Mike. You got me as self-conscious as a giggling schoolgirl. <laughs> it's your own fault, Inspector, your own fault. If the solution of the murder depended on it, I'd tell you right now, but, well, it's only hush, one way. Hush, hush, kids. Huh? She's on the phone. Oh, who? Oh. The ex-Mrs. Beatty. Oh. Hello? Uh, Mrs. Beatty. Yes? Mrs. Beatty, don't hang up when you hear my question, because if you do, you'll be called right back, and that will be by the police. Yes. Go on. Uh, did you by any chance send a note of warning to Mr. Beatty? Well, Mrs. Beatty? Yes, I did. Why? Well, it's, it's hard to explain, but there was something about this Mr. Porter I didn't trust. Oh, I haven't seen much of Mr. Beatty these last few years, but... I've met him socially several times when he's been with this man, Porter. Mm -hmm. Go on, Mrs. Beatty. Well, that's all. I have only a woman's intuition for not trusting Mr. Porter. He, he reminds me of someone. I can't remember who, but someone not to be trusted. And that's all? Honestly, that's all. Thanks very much. Well, there's not much there. She sent the note. But just womanly intuition made her distrust Porter. You think she was telling the truth? Well, yes, don't you? Uh, not entirely. Not the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes? A boss from Kansas, sir. Bring it in, Sergeant. Yes, Inspector. I'll get it typed up. Doggone, if there isn't something in the Kansas report, we're going to have a regular unsolved mystery on our hands. Wouldn't like to call in Sherlock Holmes or Father Brown, would you? Oh, Mike, this is serious. This is murder. I know it is, Inspector. Now, look, both of you. Yeah. Yeah? When we burst in on Reynolds and Weaver... They didn't show any signs of knowing that Beatty was dead. I mean, they were wholly taken up with the idea that Beatty had brought the police into it because of the threatening letter. That's right. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Reynolds said that if that letter didn't bring results, he'd send more letters. Right, Angel, right. 
And although that could be cleverness, I'd be inclined to mark it down as truthfulness. You may be inclined to mark it down that way, Mike, but until we have the murderer in our hands, everybody who ever knew Beatty is a suspect in my little list. Granted, Inspector, but Weaver didn't hesitate to give us the uh, keys to the warehouse. Mm, you can't lay too much stress on that, though, Mike. Bo both Weaver and Reynolds knew that we could get into that warehouse without keys. True, true, but to be able to carry off their interview with us uh, with such savoir faire would indicate that they were very clever and very experienced crooks, which I, for one, don't believe they are. Yeah, yeah, but Mike, murderers don't have to be crooks. Many a killing is a criminal's first and last crime. I know that, Inspector. I'm thinking out loud to convince myself. You see, what I... Yes, yeah, sir. Not much, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Let's see what this says. Only connection Beatty ever had with police was his witness in robbery trial. His testimony was essential in proving guilt of defendant. And the defendant's name was Porter. Yes, Phil, the defendant's name was Porter. Poof, well, what are we waiting for? That's it. No, no, not quite, Phil. You see, Porter died in a penitentiary in 1936. Oh. Oh, well, then, of course, it isn't the same Porter. That hmm. report doesn't say whether or not Porter had a brother. No, Mike, it doesn't. But I'd be almost willing to bet that he had... What so many women like to call woman's intuition is uh, nothing more or less than a half-forgotten incident or something half-heard and half-forgotten. You think that Mrs. Beater's instinctive dislike for Porter is because of the name or a likeness between the Porter who found the body and the Porter who went to jail? Yes, Inspector, that's exactly what I do oh, mean. Well, that shouldn't be hard to find out. But it still isn't the stuff that convinces district attorneys or grand juries. No, Inspector, but on the face of it, I think another interview is justified. Interview? Who with? All of our suspects, Weaver, Reynolds, Porter, and Mrs. Beatty. All right, Mike. We've got nothing to lose. We have everything to gain. You see, our chief suspect holds the key to this little mystery, and we'll find that key at 323 Foothill. Well, I can understand why you Quiet, please. Quiet. Now, to some of you, this is going to be somewhat of a shock. But... Mr. Beatty has been murdered. What? We found the body in the warehouse you used, Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Weaver. But Mr. Porter had the distinction of finding it first, although he lost it again. Uh, will you take over from there, Mr. Porter? Well, uh, I, I came here this morning to take Mr. Beatty to lunch. The door was open, which was funny because he was very careful about locking and bolting the door. Mm -hmm. I came upstairs, found him lying on the couch, stabbed through the chest. I, I ran over and felt him to see if he was alive. Found he was dead and called the police. And got your fingers all sticky with blood? Yes. Uh, then I, I, I wandered about the apartment. Went downstairs to the front door to watch for the police and came back upstairs and picked up the mail. The mail which contained the threatening letter from Mr. Reynolds and the warning from Mrs. Beatty. Uh, I don't know about that, but uh, anyway, when you arrived, we all came upstairs and the body was gone. It uh, couldn't have been taken out the front door because I was never out of the sight of the head of the stairs. And we know it wasn't taken out the back because there's no back door. Would uh, you have any explanation for that, Mr. Reynolds? Uh, no, no, I, I can't see how. Or you, Mr. Weaver? No, no explanation. And I'm sure that Mrs. Beatty hasn't. Oh, no, it's completely baffling to me. It was to us for quite a while. The reason it was baffling was because we were stupid enough to believe Mr. Porter. What? If you picked up the letters after you examined the body and after you phoned the police, how come there are no blood-stained fingerprints on any of them? But I... And with the wind blowing so hard that it blew the mail off the table, how come the front door was open? It would have blown shut. And if the body couldn't be taken out the back window and you never lost sight of the front door, how could the body be spirited away? I, I don't know. I don't know. That's the mystery. No, no mystery, Porter. Just a tissue of lies well rehearsed. The body never was here. But the blood on the couch. Put there by you after you had hidden the body in the warehouse rafters. Oh, this is absurd. You can't throw accusations around like that. We can and we will. Give me your keys. My keys? Yes, yes, the keys in your pocket. There you see. When we searched Mr. Beatty's dead body, we found everything a man usually carries. A wallet, pen and pencil, watch, checkbook, handkerchief. But, uh, but, Inspector... Yes? No keys. No keys to get into his house or anything. Now, what Porter did with the rest of Beatty's keys, I don't know. But here's the key to the warehouse. Uh, F-24 is its number. It checks with the number of your keys, key, Mr. Weaver. Yes, that's right. And one of these two keys is the key to Beatty's apartment. This apartment. Shall I try them, Porter, or do you admit it? I... I admit it. Okay, Inspector. I guess that takes care of that. <laughs> Early in 
the evening, and we're on our way home. Aha! But we're not on our way home, Angel. No? Where are we going? We're going to meet the inspector and have a late snack at Fisherman's Walk. Oh, good. Mike, I, I wonder if Porter is a brother of the man who died in the penitentiary. Oh, I'm sure of it. He'd better be. Why? Because if he isn't, we'll spend the evening talking to the inspector about motives. Oh. And what would you rather do, Mike Shane? Are you asking me or taunting me? Well, I just... Uh, Mike. Huh? No, not here in the car. I mean... Why not, Angel? I can drive with one hand as well as the next. <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story, based on the character created by Brett Halliday, was written and directed by David Taylor. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. people smoke camels than any other cigarette. The reasons behind camels' great popularity are flavor and mildness. Smoke only camels for 30 days and see how rich and flavorful camels are pack after pack. See how mild they are, how well they get along with your throat week in and week out. Then you'll know why camels are America's most popular cigarette. Here, transcribed, is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. In my business, nearly every case I get mixed up in has some kind of an interesting angle. If it isn't some woman who spotted a neighbor floating bodies in his bathtub, or a lonely husband who got lonely because he disposed of his wife with a meat axe... Then it might be a case like the one I got mixed up in last week. Mr. Richard Diamond? I agreed with him, watched him close the door and walk into my office. I looked, closed my eyes, looked again. I made up my mind I wasn't having hallucinations. He couldn't have weighed more than 140, a kindly face that supported a sad sort of a smile. He was dressed well and his actions seemed perfectly normal. But there was one little thing that bothered me. He was a good eight feet tall. You seem a little disturbed, Mr. Diamond. Oh, oh it's nothing, no. Just a, just a high fever. About 110, I'd say. You've noticed something out of the ordinary? Oh, no, 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 no. I work for a carnival, Mr. Diamond. Oh? My name is Adam Rayburn. I'm billed as the thinnest man in the world. And you must come close to being the tallest. Seven feet eleven in my stocking feet. Well, I'm glad to know you, Mr. Rayburn. What can I do for you? I wish to hire you. I charge a hundred a day in expenses. Well, that's agreeable. A hundred in advance. That's just so I won't have to take time off from your trouble and sell some of my steel stock. Here's a hundred. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rayburn. You are now the proud owner of a pedigreed private detective. I suppose you'd like to know about my problem. Well, it's cheaper than letting me guess. There's a girl who works at the carnival. Her name is... 
Rowena. Rowena? Professional name. You've heard of her? Oh, yeah. She's a dancer, isn't she? That's right. We've been in love for some time. Oh, she's a wonderful girl. Beautiful. All that any I watched him talk know. about her, and I swallowed a big lump in my throat. Adam Rayburn, almost eight feet tall, was reminiscing about his love with all the sincerity of a handsome Romeo. I'd seen Rowena, and I could certainly understand why the skinny guy had it bad. But being a pretty practical guy myself, Adam just didn't look like the type a girl like Rowena would go for. But I always say you never know about some things. She's in trouble, Mr. Diamond. Oh, what kind of trouble, Adam? Oh, that's why I came to you. I don't know, and, and she won't tell me. She won't let me help her. But it's obvious whatever trouble she's got in is, is more than she can handle. And you want me to find out what it is? Yes. Well, I'll do my best. Oh, thank you. It's very important to me. He told me about the carnival and where I could find Rowena. He also warned me that if Rowena found out, she would be more than mildly unhappy. He thanked me again, shook my hand, and went out of the office. I closed up, went home, and napped until six. Then I headed for the carnival. Hey, hey, hey! Step right up on the inside. It is the most amazing spectacle ever to be witnessed in this hemisphere. Long go to Gorilla Boy, captured it's in the world. Hi, the fast, safe, sensational ride. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen. Ride the high boy. Only a dime. Fast, safe, sensational ride. Carnival, colorful, gaudy, fascinating if you're five or fifty. You get initiated when you're a kid and you never forget it. The nostalgia of hot dogs and mustard, pleasant emotions kicked up when you smell the sawdust or see a little kid buy a stick full of cotton candy. And then you look up and see Rowena dancing on the small stage in front of the tent. Doing just enough of her bit to entice the customers and not offend the sheriff. And suddenly you realize how fast you grew up. I purchased a ticket, making sure to flash all of the hundred dollar retainer and went inside. The tent filled in a hurry, the lights went down and on came Rowena. Yeah! She did her bit, the usual routine, and got off. I waited for the tent to empty and then went back to look for the beautiful dancer. There was another small tent in the rear of the big one, and as I approached, I could hear two girls talking. Rowena, sure, I'll keep it for you. Now look, Dixie, I don't want anybody to know about it. Not anybody. He's giving you trouble, huh? Yes, he's been... What's the matter? Uh, um... Yes? Who is it? Uh, uh, Rowena. Yeah? You, um, want to see me? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll be going. Oh, don't let me bust up anything. Uh, that's okay. I, I gotta be going anyway. Uh, this is Dixie Jones, Mr., uh... uh... Diamond. How are you, Dixie? Bushed. Well, nice meeting you, Mr. Diamond. I'll talk to you later, Rowena. Mm, cute. Mm-hmm. Now, what can I do for you, Mr. Diamond? I just saw the show. Good. I'm glad you liked it. Is that why you stopped back? Oh, I thought I'd like to meet you. It's against the rules. Whose rules? The guy who runs the carny. Not your rules? Mm, sometimes. Mm, not this time. Oh, I'll let you know as soon as I find out what's on your mind. Well, that shouldn't be too difficult. I'm the type who likes to break rules. Well, you're a little old for the usual schoolboy and too hep for a yokel... Uh, what do you do, Mr. Diamond? Well, nothing obvious, but I make a few bucks, and occasionally I use the few bucks to buy a pretty girl a drink. Just one drink, Mr. Diamond? Score for Diamond. She was interested, and I made a mental bet with myself that she'd spotted my bankroll and not my blue eyes. She excused herself, did a quick change behind the screen in the corner of the tent. She came out dressed in mink and a black number that could have snarled up traffic on any quiet intersection. She took my arm and we headed for the nearest pub. In this case, the Fallen Duck. A cozy little bistro that certainly seemed appropriately named. If a duck had wandered in, it would have taken a nosedive in a hurry. 
Man, boy, duck, or diamond, nothing could have stood for long. Mm, it's a little crowded. Oh, it's probably necessary. If all the people left at once, the walls would fall in. <laughs> Here's to, uh... To what, Mr. Diamond? Well, to you calling me Rick. I'll drink to that. Rick. <sighs> aren't, uh, aren't you a little warm? Mm-hmm. But you'll suffer a little and keep the mink on. Mm. It's a nice coat, isn't it? Mm, charming. You do all right. Diamond bracelet, the mink. I could use another drink. Oh, sure, sure. Without the water. We sat and I watched to kill a few more, and in between times she moved. The pitch was subtle and as practice as a lion trainer with a kitten. She worked hard and I played along. It wasn't difficult. Rowena was quite a girl, and as far back as I can remember, I've liked girls, particularly the type you classify as quite a girl. About the time I was offering my fullest cooperation, we were interrupted. Hey, there's Rowena. Yes, well. Hmm, friends of yours? It's Dave Sylvester and his wife. He owns the carney. How are you, Rowena? Fine. Hello, Paula. Hello, Rowena. This is Mr. Diamond and Mr. and Mrs. Sylvester. Hi, how are you? Uh, can I buy you two a drink? Well, that would be... No, thanks, Dave. We were just leaving. Uh, come on, Rick. Well, nice meeting you. Nice meeting you, Mr. Diamond. Yeah. Sorry you gotta be going. Good night, Dave. Paula. Well, that answers that. Not friends. I've known Dave for a long time, way before I joined the carney. Uh, what makes you think we're not friends? Oh, just a casual observation. I got the idea when your hair stood straight up. You better take me home. And I took her home. Rowena didn't have much to say on the way. She was worried, and she dropped the pitch. We got back to the carnival about 1 a.m. and walked down the deserted boardwalk toward her trailer. Up to that point, I had made up my mind about several things concerning the lovely Rowena... First, she didn't figure to be in love with Adam Rayburn. Second, if she did have troubles, she hadn't given any indication until Dave Sylvester and his wife had shown up at the fallen duck. At her trailer, she stopped at the door and turned to face me. Oh, I could see it coming. The pitch was on again. But now, she was being cautious, too. Who are you, Rick? Me? Oh, I'm uh, just a guy. I told you, just a guy who wanted to buy you a drink. Nothing else. <laughs> what else? Worried? A little. Why pick on me? Well, honey, you go on inside and take a look in the mirror. If you're a little objective about it, you'll get the idea. Rick. Yeah? Good night. Mm, well, good night. Rick. Yeah? Will I see you again? Yeah. Why did you do it? Why did you do it? Wait a minute, Adam. Wait a minute. Let me go. Oh, take it easy. What's the matter with you? What do you want to slug me for? Why did you kiss her? Why did you kiss her? Oh, for Pete's sake. I saw you. I saw you kiss her. Well, you didn't see very well then. It was the other way around. I didn't hire you to take her out and make love to her. Oh, come on, Adam. Get hold of I don't want to hear it. Oh. What's the matter? That tent. It's on fire. <laughs> I turned and looked in the direction he was pointing his skinny arm. The small tent Rowena had used for a dressing room was on fire. Fire! Fire! Some others had already noticed it, and by the time we got there, the tent was completely engulfed in the roaring flames. Every one of the troop turned out in odd stages of undress and got a bucket line going, but the tent was past saving. The fire department arrived, put out the last of it, and then one of the troop, Picking his way through the charred ruins made a grisly discovery. Hey, hey, there's a body in here. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. You know, smoking is a day-in, day-out pleasure. And it takes day in, day out smoking to tell you how rich tasting and how mild a cigarette is as a steady smoke. One puff won't tell you. 
One sniff won't tell you. Smoke only camels for 30 days, and you'll see why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. You'll enjoy the first puff and every puff, for camels' costly tobaccos are properly aged and expertly blended. No other cigarette has camels' rich, full flavor, a flavor you'll never tire of. And no other cigarette gives you this proof of mildness, proof based on steady smoking. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Make your own camel 30-day test and see for yourself why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. One thirty in the morning, standing in the middle of what was left of a gutted sideshow tent, standing with the members of the Sylvester Carnival Troupe, looking down at the burned body of a girl. A case with a simple beginning, and then a fire, and a girl dying in the fire. The crowd spread out as the fire department moved in to look for a cause, and Dave Sylvester, the owner, identified the body. Ah, Dixie Jones. She slept in the tent. Poor little Dixie. Oh, hello, Mr. Diamond. Hello, Mr. Sylvester. It's a terrible thing. Yeah. Mr. Diamond? I'll beat it, Adam. I'll talk to you later. No sense in letting people know we're acquainted. All right. So all of a sudden I smelled smoke. See, I thought that I was dreaming or something. Rick? Oh, hello, Ray. Isn't it awful? Yeah, it's pretty bad. Oh, poor Dixie. Uh, Rick? No? Uh, will you walk me back to my trailer? Sure. Cold? Yes. You act like you got a chill. You better take my coat. No, oh, it, it's, it's all right. I, I'll be all right. Well, uh, good night, honey. Uh, Rick? Yeah? I, I don't feel much like sleeping. Why don't you come in for a while? Well, what's the matter, dear? You act as if you're scared. Of you? Well, I don't know what it is, but you're scared of it. That's ridiculous. Good night, Rick. Oops. Mr. Diamond. Well, now, don't start swinging again, Adam. I didn't even hold her hand. I just left the fire. The fire department found out it, it wasn't an accident. What? I heard the chief say the fire was started deliberately. They called the police. Well, now the simple case with a fire and what looked like an accidental death had turned into murder. I asked Adam why anyone would want to kill Dixie, the coarse girl. But he couldn't even come up with a guess. I warned him again about keeping our relationship a secret. I went out to the corner to wait for the police. In about 20 minutes, I spotted a prowl car with a familiar figure in the front seat. Rick! What are you doing here? Well, I stayed for the late show. It's a nice fire. Just got a 211 report. Some girl in the fire. Yep. Yeah. Name is Dixie Jones. Hey, Walt, look, uh, nobody around here knows I'm a private cop. You want it kept that way? Yeah, for a while. Okay, climb on the running board. We'll drive down. We drove down to the scene of the fire, and I stayed in the car while Walt and Sylvester looked at the body of the dead chorus girl and talked to the fire chief. A couple of times, I spotted Adam standing off to one side, watching... And if he noticed me in the car, he did a good job of not showing it. Sometime later, Walt came back and we took a drive. I told him everything up to date, how Adam had hired me to find out what was troubling his lady love, how I'd gotten a big pitch from her, her obvious dislike for the Sylvesters, and everything leading up to and after the fire. Well, that's sure not much. I know it, I know it, Walt, but there's one thing, sure... Rowena was scared stiff after the fire. Sometimes fires do that. No, it was something more, Walt. This dame lives high. Mink coats, jewelry that runs into a lot of carrots. She has a real taste for anything that smells like that green stuff. I flashed a roll when I went in to see her show. She acted like a steady date when I went back to her dressing room. Uh, Rowena doesn't make enough money at this carny to buy all those things, Walt. Well, I'm having the whole troop brought in for questioning. Maybe we'll uncover something. This client of yours... Adam Rayburn? Yeah. 
What does he know? Oh, apparently not much. He's so in love with that dame, he can't see anything else. What does he do? Well, he's advertised as the skinniest man in the world. He's nearly eight feet tall and weighs a good 140. He thinks Rowena's in love with him. Are you kidding? Rowena? A dame like that? Yeah. Poor guy. Walt dropped me off in my apartment and I got some sleep. The next morning, I went down to the precinct and listened through an open line as Walt interrogated the entire troupe at the Sylvester Carnival. It took all morning and most of the afternoon. Rowena answered her share of questions, and her voice was shaky and cautious. Adam answered his, admitting his association with me only after Walt informed him the fact was known. The last two questions were Dave and Paula Sylvester. I have no idea why anyone would want to start a fire. How about wanting to kill Dixie? I can't imagine. How about you, Mrs. Sylvester? No, Dixie was just a nice kid, slept in the tent. I don't know why anyone would want to kill her. Mr. Sylvester, how long have you known Rowena? Just since she's been with the Carney, About uh, five years, I guess. First break. First hint of a cover-up. Dave Sylvester had said he'd only known Rowena since she'd been with the carnival. I left the precinct thinking about the time I'd spent with Rowena and the fallen duck. She'd said she'd known Sylvester for a long time before she joined the carnival. I grabbed a cab and went back to the carnival grounds where I hung around until my client showed up. We found a quiet spot and talked. I know she's never said much about Dave or Paula. Oh. Well, how about the girl who was killed, uh, Dixie? Well, they were friends, that's all. Why, have you found out something? How much money have you given her, Adam? Oh, no, no, wait a minute. How much? Well, not much. Well, how much does she make? Well, about 200 a week. Then who's buying those minks? Well, she is. And the jewelry? What do you mean? She told me she bought those things with money she'd saved. Out of 200 a week? Well, yes. Well, then why ask you for more? Because she needed it. I, I didn't ask her why. She, she likes nice things. We're in love, Mr. Diamond. A man doesn't ask... Okay, Adam, okay. I lost myself for the rest of the afternoon in the newspaper files, looking up past history on David Sylvester, his wife, and Rowena. There was a story about David and Paula the day they got married, and enough about Rowena to give me a pretty fair background. She'd been in show business for a long time, from parents in the business. Never done much until she joined the carnival, and then her fame spread far and wide. There were some publicity pictures that certainly showed why she had become a headliner. She'd been married once to a man named Black, who had disappeared ten years ago, a small-time agent who had left her stranded in a hotel somewhere in Ohio. And according to the article, he was wanted by the police for a forgery rap and left her holding the sack. I looked some more, but I couldn't find anything about a divorce or that Black had ever been caught. At seven o'clock, I let myself in Rowena's trailer. I sat down and waited for her. Hello, Rowena. Rick. I'm glad to see you, Rick. Oh? Well, I'm a private cop, honey. Still glad? You're a... Private cop. Yeah. I don't understand. Well, I think I do. Whatever happened to your husband, Rowena? Oh, Rick... Whatever happened to him? Name was Black. Left you stranded in Ohio with a forger wrap pinned on him. What happened to him? What? I don't know. He, he disappeared. I, I... How do you manage to buy minks and diamond bracelets? Rick, what is all this? Why How are you... come Sylvester hired you and shoved you right to the top when you didn't even have a reputation? I don't like this, Rick. I don't think it's any... I don't like it either. Now, tell me about Dixie. Why was she killed? I don't know. Rick, you don't think I... It's I'm... the one thing I've got to tie up. Whoever set fire to that tent, did they think it was you in there? Don't be ridiculous. Well, see how ridiculous this sounds, honey. Dave Sylvester is your missing husband. No, no. He's paying you to keep your mouth shut. Get out of here. You don't care who you pick on, do you? If you can't blackmail a guy, you work him, like Adam Rabin. Poor guy thinks you're in love with him. Get out! Get out! How much did you get? A couple of lousy dollars? Anything for a buck, huh? If you don't get out of here, I'll have you thrown out. I want to know why Dixie was killed. And, baby, you're going to tell me. <laughs> Rick, please. Oh, it won't work, honey. Now, what was the connection? Please, please. 
Baby, if you know why she was killed, that makes you an accessory before the fact. I'm not very happy about you, honey, and I'd be more than willing to do my bit to see you get a few years. Rick! <laughs> now, you better tell me all about it. It'd be a lot easier. All right. Dave, Dave Sylvester is my husband. His real name is Martin Black. You're right, I, I was blackmailing him. Somebody fired two shots through the open window and nailed her twice. I caught her, she dropped, and I lowered her to the sawdust floor. I kept my arm around her because she couldn't do much more than look up and smile, a tired smile. Thanks. Thanks for the lift. Honey. It's all right. Dixie was keeping the marriage license for me, so... So Dave wouldn't find it. I guess he did anyway. He must have killed her and set fire to the tent. I'll get a doctor. I, I, I gotta say something, Rick. No excuses. I, I took Adam. I took everybody. Mixed up. Who's, who's going to take you? And something happened, I guess. Maybe... Maybe I thought you might be the boy on the white horse. Baby, look. Telling the truth, Rick. A lady wouldn't lie at a time like this. No, I guess she wouldn't. I put a pillow under her head and went out. The carnival had suddenly turned into a bad dream, a lot of noise and confusion. There was a killer loose, and I wanted to get him. Look out, Diamond! It was Adam Rayburn again, standing near a tent. David Sylvester had been waiting for me to come out. Sylvester jumped as Adam yelled and turned his gun on Adam. He caught Adam with the first one, and the big, thin guy toppled like an anemic sapling. I got my gun out, but Sylvester had disappeared in the darkness. Go get him. I'm all right. I circled the tent and spotted Sylvester running up the main drag. He turned and tried a quick shot. People started running when they got the idea, and I kept low, trying to stay in the clear. The place emptied faster than a ballpark in a thunderstorm, and Sylvester was caught on the empty walk. He turned for another shot, but I beat him to it. The slug knocked him sideways, and he staggered into a building, and I went in after him. It turned into the weirdest chase I'd ever gotten mixed up in. I found myself looking at a dozen Richard Diamonds and an equal number of Dave Sylvester's. I was faced by a room full of mirrors, and to top it off, a recorded laugh was playing over and over. A gimmick to show the public how much fun they could have inside. Oh, some fun. The dozen Sylvesters had all turned and taken a shot at the dozen diamonds, and the dozen diamonds suddenly became one less. It was a process of elimination. Sooner or later, one of us would stop hitting mirrors and get the real thing. I picked one of the Sylvesters, and we both went to work. Lousy mirrors. Yeah, you shot every diamond but the right one. Turn me over, will you? Get my face out of this stuff. Sure. I don't mind dying, but I hate to watch myself doing it. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. Again, doctors in all branches of medicine have been asked this question. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Again, the brand name most was Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Baseball is getting underway, and it's interesting to note that Camels are the favorite cigarette of many baseball players. Bob Lemon, Vic Rashi, Howard Paulette, Dick Sisler are a few of the stars who choose camels for their rich flavor, cool, cool mildness. Try camels yourself. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Take the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of camels are sending gift cigarettes to our wounded and disabled servicemen. 
These cigarettes are forwarded to and distributed by the Military Air Transport Service, United States Air Force, which evacuates virtually all overseas wounded personnel. Gift camels are also on the way to Veterans Hospitals, Fort Meade, South Dakota, and Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. U.S. Army Station Hospital, Camp Campbell, Kentucky. U.S. Naval Hospital, Beaufort, South Carolina. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Dick Powell can now be seen starring in RKO's Cry Danger. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in the cast were Arthur Q. Bryan, Michael Ann Barrett, Sandra Gould, Sheldon Leonard, Paul Duboff, and Bob Bruce. Then, for pipe pleasure, get the National Joy Smoke, Prince Albert. P.A. has a rich flavor and wonderful natural fragrance. It's crimp cut for cool, smooth smoking and specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. You'll enjoy Prince Albert, America's largest-selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. I get ten a day and expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan, the Lion's Eye, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of the Pilgrim's Progress. Cosmopolitan Building, 7th Street near Olive, downtown L.A. A mess of granite thrown together by an architect who must have taken his degree on the rock pile at Leavenworth. It's up on the third floor, room 308, right next to a credit dentist who shares his office with a collection agency. On the other side, there's a school for models, and the lion's got sore eyes trying to see through that cloudy glass. International Detective Bureau, Anthony J. Lyon, President. He's also vice president, secretary, treasurer. I work for him. Well, the office isn't much, but there's enough elbow room for a client to write a check. I went to the office Friday night, about 5.20, answering the lion's call. He was sitting behind the desk, sucking on a quarter cigar. He looked real pleased, like a fat lady locked in a cream puff factory. Man I know had a baby. Plumber named Broman or Groman or something like that. Uh, Mazel tov. Cancel any arrangements you got for the night. I got something for you to do. Got your car? It's in the lot. Gas it up. You're taking a trip. Where to? Calabasas. A man wants to see you. I got no friends out there. Friend of mine. Name's Hendricks. He counts his money with an adding machine, and his finger's always swollen. What's the problem? I don't know. He didn't say. He just called and told me to send out a man. How much did he give you for a retainer? When an important man like Hendricks calls, you don't insult him by asking for money. Oh, stop it, will you? You're the kind of guy who would steal pennies out of parking meters. That's enough, Regan. If one of them turned up empty, you'd sue the city. Here's the Hendricks address. Now get out there. All right. Uh, Regan. Yeah? Remember, do a good job and I'll give you Thanksgiving off. And I'll pay you. With what? Cranberries? Well, I headed out Beverly and then up through Hollywood. You know, it's only November, but Santa Claus is breaking out all over the boulevard. I fought my way over Coenga Pass, and by the time I was dodging station wagons on Ventura, it was dark. Calabasas is a place with a couple of service stations, a hot dog stand, and a few road signs full of buckshot. The Hendricks place turned out to be about five miles down a road that the Indians built for hauling firewater. I guess they couldn't keep the cork in. But the house itself was strictly prohibition stuff big pile of slate roof and leaded windows. It looked dark and lonesome. I figured somebody had their holidays mixed. <laughs> Hiya, Pilgrim! It was a big fat guy. 
who was holding a six-foot gun in the shape of a straightened-out tuba. He came closer, and I could see his hat. It was a high one with a buckle on it. He was dressed in black, and he had buckles all over him. Well, I figured that I'd been eating too much Quaker oats. What's the matter, Pilgrim? A little shoot and make you nervous? That's a big gun there. Shoots musket balls. Good for Indians. <laughs> well, I'm no Indian. Well, I wasn't aiming at you. Well, that gun wouldn't know the difference. It's a blunderbuss. Great weapon. Is it? I, I saw you. Now you prop it up on a crutch. You keep fooling with that thing and we'll both need one. Shut up. Be quiet there. Load the barrels. Lots of powder. Look, why don't you give that thing back to the museum? He does it. More powder. <laughs> Gotta use lots of this black powder. Buster, huh? you need black coffee. Come on, give me that thing before it blows yeah, up what? in your... Oh. Uh, you broke a window. Oh, it's all right. It was only the attic. You live here? Of course not, Pilgrim. I'm Miles... Sandy's. Well, where's the rest of the party? They're all inside, talking to John Olden. Yeah, sure, sure. They oh, are. you just think I'm kidding, don't you? Pilgrim, you just haven't got the Mayflower spirit. No, you drank it all. It's just cider. Nothing better on a cold New England night. Thanksgiving's not for a week. Come on, get off it. Shh, shh, shh. Hark. What's the matter? Put that down. I'm not going to shoot him. He's the friendly type. Brother Regan. Yeah? If thou wilt follow me, please. Oh, you too, huh? I beg your pardon. Okay, okay. Well, so long, Pilgrim. Yeah, keep your powder dry, Standy. I'll see you on Plymouth Rock. <laughs> okay, this way, Brother Regan. Now, look, Sunshine, you work here. My name is Phelps. Why don't you lock that guy up? I'd be outnumbered, sir. For a 21 pilgrim. Bad winter. They make you wear those corduroy knickers? Knee breeches, sir. It was Priscilla's idea. You need a union. I need more shapely legs. Through here. Now, well, it's quite a place you got. Well, it looks better without the decorations, sir. Yeah. How do you keep from stepping on these pumpkins? It's only when they use them for bowling that it's difficult. Come on, fill me in. What's this all about? Thanksgiving, sir. 1621. Okay, this room here, sir. Go right in. Okay. Shut the door. Shut it. Mr. Hendricks around? He's not here. Come over, sit down. Who are you, Priscilla? Don't. Please don't say another word of that silly rigmarole or I'll start screaming. Yeah, well, I could use a little yell myself. I'm Agnes. I'm Mrs. Hendricks. Or Agnes. It doesn't make any difference. Got to my friends. Didn't I say sit down? Yes, you did, and I didn't. So you don't like the party, huh? I'm not much of a Puritan, Mr. Regan. Well, that great Dane says the masquerade was your idea. Oh, helps is stupid. This goes on all weekend, Mr. Regan. It's called a turkey shoot. Oh, so that's it. Who gets the bird? The Pilgrim Fathers. My husband's friends. They ought to be shot, every one of them. Yeah, well, I'm not from the SPCA. Oh, wait a minute, a minute Mr. Regan. I, I like you. That's not the point. I won't bore you. Your husband might. Him. He's crazy, Mr. Regan. Crazy as the things he does. Shooting, drinking, spending money. It's a hard life. I don't know how I stood it for as long as I have... My lawyer says I'm the most patient woman in the world. Yeah. Well, thanks for the conversation, Miss Hendricks. Why did my husband send for you? I don't know. Yes, you do. You do know. Tell me. I don't know. Please. You don't realize what kind of a man my husband can be. I never met him. You don't know how much I need help. How lonely I am. Well, where is he? I'll tell you if you promise to come back to me. No, I'll write you a letter. He's out in the shed, the other side of the patio. Thanks. I wouldn't act this way if I weren't so frightened. You don't know what it is to be frightened all the time. No, but I'm learning. I wish you'd stick around, Mr. Regan. Well, thanks, Mrs. Hendricks, but the pin feathers are a little sharp. <laughs> Mrs. Hendricks went back to her worrying, and I wound my way through the house looking for the back entrance. My legs got tired before it finally showed on the other side of the pantry. 
It poured out into a flagstone patio as big as the Palladium. A walk took me to a shed. It was a two-story redwood place that must have made a loud noise on the cash register. And alongside, fenced in with chicken wire, was a whole population of turkeys. Well, I went into the shed. It was a little round-faced guy with pink skin was leaning over a barrel of cider. He wore a blue silk smoking jacket with gold initials E.H. on the pocket. When he caught my footsteps, his head bobbed up and he gave me a deep look like he was trying to see the back of my eyeballs. Yes? I'm Regan, International Detective Bureau. Oh, I've been expecting you. I'm Hendricks. Yeah, I know. Why the fireworks? Huh? Oh! <laughs> Miles Standish and his blunderbuss, eh? Oh, just having fun. It's a party, you know. Big party we're having here. Yeah, well, the neighbors will complain. <laughs> ah, neighbors. None for miles around. That's why I like it out here. Have trouble finding me? You ought to put up signs. Eh, yeah, signs? Uh, glass of cider, Regan? Carefully. Bless. I'm not thirsty. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's not what it's for. Uh, <laughs> strong kind. Oh, go on. Thanksgiving soon. Get the spirit. No, I can hold out till Thursday. Well, uh, suit yourself. Excuse me. <coughs> Well, uh, uh, yeah, it's going to be quite a party here, you know. Your wife's got a different version. Oh, you spoke to her? Yeah. You were told to come out here to see me? I got sidetracked. It's not good for a man in your position. All right, Hendricks, why am I here? What'd she say to you? I forgot. Regan, you're making me angry. Now, look, mister, you didn't get me out here to make a pilgrim out of me. Hey, that... <laughs> no, no, of course not. Fine woman, Mrs. Hendricks. We've been married for years, you know, happily. Fine, fine little woman. So she makes me a little nervous at times. Mm-hmm. Would you like the sound of guns going off? Ah, she shouldn't get so excited. Boys just having little fun. It's only once a year. What's wrong with that? Come on, now, what's the job? Oh, didn't the lion tell you? He said you would. Oh, well, <laughs> nothing to be so mysterious about. They've just got a package I want you to take to. Here it is. A turkey. You got me all the way out here to play escort to that bird? Well, I just want to be friendly. Here. Yeah. Now, go on, go on, go on. It's a long way back to L.A. And you want to be there for Thanksgiving. What's the difference? I got the turkey. I can celebrate any time. Sixty miles to do a delivery job on a dead bird. Well, I wandered back to my car and I listened to the crickets and the gunshots try to outdo each other. And then I dumped the turkey into the back seat and I started the car down the drive. I just thrown it around the bend when the headlights caught a pair of buckled shoes and black knee breeches. Miles Standish was lying face down in the dirt and there was a wet shine on his side. He was breathing hard. The blunderbuss was lying beside him and I figured that he blew out the wrong end. I would have gone for the Hendrix phone and a doctor, but I got a good look at the holes in him and I headed for a hospital instead. The blunderbuss may have been kicking up a fuss, but the holes in Miles Standish were 20th century. About the size of a 32. Well, I turned him over to an emergency hospital and I put a call into the sheriff's office. I gave the story to uh, Lieutenant Robinson and then I headed back toward town. At the lion's place, the lights were still on, so I figured he didn't have company. I rapped on the door and he flung it open before the echo could die away. He had a carving knife in one hand and he was wearing an apron. His eyes were big and he had an eager look like a college couple on Mulholland Drive. Regan, you're back. Oh, now that takes a big brain. I've been waiting for you. You know, I had a chance to go to a classy party tonight. Russian caviar and champagne and favors to all the guests. You know why I didn't go? You lost your crash suit, huh? I said to myself, is it fair to go out and have a good time while my employee is working real hard for international detective? The answer came out yes, but the party was called off. <laughs> Well, as a matter of fact, it was. But I wouldn't have gone anyway. Where is it? Where's what? The package from Hendricks. Now, you can change your plans, big shot. You're getting a bundle of trouble instead. What do you mean? Turkeys aren't the only thing they're knocking off out on that ranch. Huh? Somebody's handy with a thirty-two, and he's found a target. You've been drinking? Check the county emergency hospital. They'll show you the holes. I send you out on a simple little job, and you come back with a crazy story about a shooting. You're out of your mind. Now, listen, you. There's a big smell out in Calabasas. What about my turkey? The sheriff's office are going to have a lot of questions. You got the answers? I don't know anything. I was miles away. Well, then find out something. Check into the guy who shot. Find out who he is, what he does, and what he was doing out at Hendricks. Where are you going? To scratch around in the Hendricks closet. They tell different stories about their wedded bliss. Hey, Regan. Yeah? Where's my turkey? It's too rich for your blood, fatso. Stick to chicken. Well, I left him standing there with his apron hanging out. Miles Standish might get enough wind to 
through that extra hole to say who shot him, but more likely not. Anyway, with the bucket load he had, he would have sworn it was the last of the Mohicans. But there was an angle of that Hendricks woman, even if it didn't show. So I walked up the street to where my car was nuzzling a lamppost, and the turkey and I were just going to wake up a newspaper office, only something changed my mind. A newspaper. It was wrapped around a bundle, and the bundle was under a guy's arm, and the arm was shutting the door of my car. Now, good evening, Pop. Uh, uh, hi. Going somewhere? Sure, sure. Just find a place to sleep, that's all. Want a cigarette? Say, I don't mind if I do. <laughs> Thought you was a bull for a minute. You mind if I take two? No, help yourself. My brother smokes two. And not much in the streets these days. Yeah, it's bad all over. Yeah, something ought to be done. Well, no, no, I... stick around, Pop. No, no, Sonny, you give me smokes. I don't hit you for cash. It's a rule I got. I'll make the touch. I said. What's in the newspaper? Russia. Inside. Uh, funny paper. Yeah, sure. Well, now take it easy. Boss, the guy's got a right to his privacy. You weren't sleeping in my car. Oh, so that's it. Yours, huh? Small world, ain't it? Yeah, come on, let's unwrap. Uh, no, it's Thanksgiving, Mac. Ain't you heard of Thanksgiving? I'm going to plug my ears. Give. Now, please, Mac, show me the spirit. Once in my life, both drumsticks. Now, huh? Stop it, you're breaking my I heart. I mean it, Mac. Let me have it. I I'll break the wishbone for you, sonny. I will. You ain't got no use for all that meat, have you? Oh, you have, huh? What's so long, man? Hey, wait a minute. Hold it. No, I let go of my arm. That was a pretty dance, but you should have changed your shoes. What's that? You didn't get those buckles in the bread line. Oh. Now, come on. Change the record. Who are you? That's none of your business. Let go of I me. said talk. I will not. You're from the Hendricks place, aren't you? You're from the... Oh. Thank you, Phelps. That's all right. Got the bird? Sure. Let's go. Yeah. Nighty night, Pilgrim. <laughs> You are listening to the story of the Pilgrim's Progress, tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Commissions are still available in the Army Nurse Corps. Graduate registered nurses between the ages of 21 and 45 may qualify for service with this fine organization. If you are interested in joining the Army Nurse Corps and believe you qualify for a commission, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to Jeff Regan, Investigator, and the story of the Pilgrim's Progress. Well, none of it made sense. The lion sent me out to pick up a turkey on the Hendricks Ranch in Calabasas, and the Mr. and Mrs. were having an old-fashioned turkey shoot, and all the guests carried blunderbusses and dressed like pilgrims. Only it wasn't just the turkeys who were acting as targets. One of the pilgrims ended up with some 32 caliber holes in them. And then the Hendrix lackey and a buddy shoved the gun at me and stole the lion's bird. Well, I picked myself up and I went home. A heavy man was doing a heist job on my icebox. He was pouring himself a glass of milk to wash down a sandwich he was munching on. Hi, Regan. Yeah, right ahead. Help yourself. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I didn't know how long I was going to have to wait, and I was getting hungry. There's a restaurant just up the block. I like it better this way, homemade. Fix you a sandwich? Pretty good deviled ham. Come on, let's close the box and open your mouth, buddy. Why not? We had a date, remember? Robinson, sheriff's office. Yeah, that's what I figured. You don't mind me coming in like this, do you? What if I did? Well, I'd leave. Sanctity of the home, you know. You can throw me out even though I got a badge. Right, let's cut away the fat, mister. What do you want? Answers to a couple of questions. What were you doing at the Hendricks place? Picking up a turkey. Well, that's a new one. Now, look, you ask him. I'll answer him. Never mind the feature page. How long have you known the Hendricks? Never met him before. Wrong answer. What do you mean? We found this out at the Hendricks house. A page torn out of the yellow directory with a red circle around international detective. Now, that doesn't say a thing. Maybe yes, maybe no. I'm still scratching around. It'll ruin your manicure. You know, Regan, you don't seem to realize the seriousness of this. That pilgrim you dragged in died. Well, that figured. We don't like unsolved murders messing up our record books. Well, then you're wasting your time here. I got lots of it. I don't come up for pension for 12 more years. What was that pilgrim's name? Well, he gave me Miles Standish. Sounds like a fake. Well, don't count on it. I once knew a John Smith. Give me the real name. I don't have it. All right. He's not a town boy, but we'll track him down. Now, straighten out something for me, Regan. 
How long did you say you knew the Hendricks? Now, look, I gave this to you once. Nothing's changed. How come we find a $5,000 check in that joker's pocket made out to cash and signed by Hendricks? Go ahead, answer. Just don't make a date. You may not be available. Yeah? Mr. Regan, this is Mrs. Hendricks. I, I must see you right away. Who did you say? Mrs. Hendricks, you remember? Charlie? No, no, there's no Charlie here. You must have the wrong number. Sort of annoying, isn't it, Regan, when you get a wrong number late at night? Well, it happens. Sure, sure, it does happen to me once. Anything else you want? Another deviled ham sandwich? Kitchen's closed. Pretty rotten hospitality. Well, you weren't asked. Okay, I gotta move anyway. See you later, Regan. Keep the mud off your shoes. E R three four O eight. Hello? Mrs. Hendricks, this is Regan. Well, I just called you. Well, I couldn't talk. What do you want? Can you come out, Mr. Regan? Right away. You're still lonely? Things aren't going well. Well, murder's like that. I've got to talk to somebody. Won't you please come? Give me a reason. I can tell you some things now I couldn't mention before. Like why your husband wrote a $5,000 check to the dead man? Check? But there must be some mistake. What do you mean? My husband couldn't write a check that large. He doesn't have any money of his own. It's all in my name. All right. Put a lantern in the window, lady. I'll need some light. Well, well, I hit it out there fast. But when I raised a racket with a brass knocker, nothing happened. I tried a window, and a couple of scratches later, I was in the hall. The place looked empty like the Rose Bowl on January 2nd. I found Miss Hendricks' room where I talked to her and stepped inside. The decorations were different. This is Regan. I got something for you. It better be good. You're going into overtime. What do you mean? Bring some boys out to the Hendricks place with a wet rag. Somebody blew out Mr. Hendricks' fuse. Well, I backed out of the room and I made it for the bar trying to turn up a bottle. In the corner, something else turned up instead. Another dead body. The turkey Phelps and his buddy had stolen from me. Somebody real eager had done a carving job on it before it was even cooked. They'd torn it apart like they were looking for something. Well, it was morning before the sheriff's boys cleaned up the Hendricks mess and we got back to town. Robinson had a few more questions, but I was still short on the answers. Ballistics had one, though. Same gun did the job on both Miles Standish and Hendricks. That's all. Homicide was getting places in a hurry, like a snail hauling a piano. Well, the lion was waiting for me outside the sheriff's office and he pulled me to the side. His eyes were lit up like a pinball machine and you could tell he'd caught the scent of a greenback. They treat you okay, Regan? Eh, good enough. No rough stuff? Oh, nothing that shows, no. Thinking we're in luck. I've been turning up things. We've been playing the wrong horse. Well, that figures you're good at picking losers. Hendricks is a piker, a social climber. He's a dead one. I'll send him flowers. But I'm telling you, he could only write checks for five Gs. With a big bounce. Somebody else in this thing can write bigger ones. Well, let me guess who. Mrs. Hendricks, that's who. Uh, I tell you, Regan, it pays to keep up your connections. How high can she go? The sky is below sea level. What else you got? Standish is a phony moniker. That's grammar school. Real name, Jeffrey Kelly, age 42. He's a wholesale jeweler. He had a little business with Mrs. H. $250,000 worth. That's going to run up his taxes. He can handle it. What did he do for her? I drew a blank, but he deposited her certified check in the bank yesterday morning. Mm -hmm. How does Phelps figure? I don't know. Well, who's the little man in the big overcoat? I can't do everything. you got to do some work, too. Yeah, sure. Now, find Mrs. Hendricks. Offer her the services of international detective at our usual nominal rate. But don't underplay it. Now, get busy. Where are you going? Home to bed. A man's got to get some sleep. Well, the time was ticking out, but the game wasn't over yet. I figured to have a fast finish, and the lion had a pretty good idea about catching some shut-eye. So I moved for the office and a stretch out on the couch. But through the glass, I could see there was a light on. Company was inside. Crestview 2045. Phelps, no luck. I looked all over. I, I told you, I tore the place apart. Nothing's here. I'm trying my best. Stop harping. Oh, well, it must be someplace else. 
Okay, okay, right away. Leave a nickel, Buster. Huh? Oh, Regan. You're looking for something? Yeah. You, Pilgrim. What else? Plymouth Rock. Come on, punk, level it. Oh, it coax me. All right, Nick, because you've been crying for this. <laughs> now, flatten out. <laughs> Well, it felt good to watch the big guy fall. He folded in like a steeple in an earthquake. When his head bounced on the lion's carpet, it figured he was due for a long sleep, so I went through his pockets. Ticket stubs from the prize fights, the gun, and a pocket knife I dumped into the safe. It was a pass to the Don's game on November 25th. He must have swiped that from his boss, so I filed that in the lion's desk for future reference. But this guy, Phelps, had taken orders from somebody besides Hendricks. I just heard him do it on the phone. So, when I turned up an old envelope with 832 North Palm scratched in the back, I crossed my fingers. He'd been calling a Crestview number, and the phone book said that I had a lead. North Palm was in the Crestview exchange area. So I called for the cops to sweep up Brother Phelps, and I climbed back onto my broomstick. I drove out through Beverly Hills. I wound up in front of a big Spanish house with potted $10 bills on the driveway. There was a new Nash sticking out of the garage, and I walked around to take a look. But honest John had beat me to it. Now, stick around. I want to talk to you. Stand back. Stand back. You like cars, don't you? Maybe you want a hot rod. No, you don't. Get away from me. Hey. Well, it was the little turkey fan that I'd last seen in an overcoat. Phelps' buddy. He took out of there like a cow in deer season, so I let him go. No license. Well, I took a look around the car he'd been sniffing, but nothing showed except the registration. It said Mrs. Agnes Hendricks. I went to the house and rang the doorbell, and she answered. Oh. What's you? I'm Mr. Regan. All right, I'll ask myself in. Yes, c- come in. Who are you expecting, John Alden? No, I... I'm glad to see you. You know, I don't like girls who break dates. Oh, that. Yeah, that's one thing. I couldn't help it. I, I couldn't wait for you to come all the way to Calabasas. You got impatient on account of a body in the house. You saw him. Yeah, after I tripped over him in your room. I didn't do it. Did I say you did? You've got to believe me. Relax. I look like a jury. You've got multiple vision. Oh, Mr. Regan, I was so frightened. I didn't know which way to turn. We've been through all that woman driver routine. You don't like your husband. You wanted to get rid of him. But only in Reno. All right, now let's get back to page one. You gave 250 G's to a jeweler named Kelly. You bought a rock. What? A rock, Plymouth rock. It's a diamond. It's got to be. Well... Why'd you do it? Who'd you buy it for? Myself. My lawyer said I should get it for myself. That's all. He likes you pretty, huh? No, no, it was a community property thing. He said I could keep my husband from knowing how much money I had when he asked for a divorce settlement. Only hubby got wind of the deal. I guess so. Now, you're making sense. Only why did he write a check to Kelly? Well, it was a small one. It must have been for a paste imitation, don't you think? That's not my business. Keep dealing. I mean, maybe he planned on switching them and getting my real one. Yeah, that's been done. But he actually did it. Because all through this, there's been a diamond in the place where I always keep it. All right, you got a strong boy, Phelps. Had him out looking for the real diamond. What? And the other guy, the old man, was out in the garage. No. Phelps tore up my office, phoned here to you. Mr. Regan, Now, look, there's been two guys killed. Mr. Regan... (laughs) Good evening, Pilgrim. Where's your overcoat? Stand still, please. Yeah, my foot's in a crack. Mr. Regan, this is... This is John Alden. Oh, can it, will you? I've seen him act one part already. That's true. Mine is the only name that's real. This is my house, Mr. Regan. Lawyer? Yes, I came here to see him, Mr. Regan. I just got here before you did. Be quiet, Agnes. Well, I got it all now. You won't keep it. Phelps took his orders from you. It's a waste of testimony. You started this. Spotted the gem switch. Figured to cash in. You're losing your chips. Shut up, will you? I got aces. Hendricks outfoxed you. You never found the real diamond. Five and a hand draws blood. Mr. Alden, don't... You keep out of this, Agnes. She's not in it. You are. That's all, Regan. All right, come on. Drop it. Drop it. Go of that. I... I guess I hit him with the paste one. Huh? Look, the diamond, it... It broke. Yeah. It was just luck. I... I have the other one, too. I thought Alden was honest. I came to tell him I found it in my husband's cider. Well, that tears it. Come on, Priscilla. That docks the Mayflower. Well, the whole thing folded in like an elephant on a pogo stick. Yeah, the lawyer did it all right, both of them. When he spotted what Hendricks was up to with that diamond switch, he moved in, but not for his client. The jeweler, Miles Standish, alias Kelly, got bumped because he was the only one who could tell the real diamond from a phony. But Hendricks got wise to the muscle act, and so he got shot. 
Well, the lion was real happy the way it worked out. That dame with the nerves wrote him a check. So he invited me out to Thanksgiving dinner. He offered me any part of the turkey that I wanted. I told him. But I got it anyway. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at the same time next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by Larry Roman and Jackson Gillis. Produced by Sterling Tracy. Featured in tonight's story were Mary Lansing, Marvin Miller, Paul Fries, and Paul Dubuff. Original music for this program is by Milton Charles. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. They offered me a cool million and a half, but I couldn't be bought. Oh, Sam, all the time fooling. Straight goods, Abby. Oh, really, Sam? Why didn't you take it? Oh, but you couldn't, of course. That's right, Angel. Taxes. Oh, you mean it would put you in a bracket? Uh, the girl's name, in case you were going to ask, was Sugar Cane. Was she sweet? Oh, Effie, you made a joke. Oh, not much of one, though. That is true. But even though you do seem to be, as you would say, in a jugular vein, I shall be right down, serious and frowning... To dictate a chronicle steeped in the bitter tea of general confusion, brewed in a witch's cauldron of murder, greed, and avarice. That's what gives it that nutty flavor. What, Sam? Silly girl, I refer to the sugar cane caper on which I will forthwith my report be down to dictate on, uh, uh it, uh, uh, with, uh, goodbye. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Want to look better on the job? Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Want to look better to that gal of yours? Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic improves your entire appearance by grooming your hair neatly and naturally, relieving dryness, removing loose dandruff. If your family hasn't yet enjoyed the benefits of America's leading hair tonic, here's what to do about it. Ask at your drug or toilet goods counter for the new 25-cent get-acquainted bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Hello, Sam. How are you, Sam? Hmm? You were so lugubrious over the phone. Sometimes you're so bucolic, but tonight... What am I... When? Lugubrious tonight. Just, just, just bowling over. Do you uh, possibly mean I'm being lush with my verbiage? There, you see? Well, that's because I've been at work in the environs of Snob Hill, where they never use one word if 12 will do. <laughs> Are you uh, ready for the uh, dictation? I guess it is. I plan to be most amusing tonight. Already <laughs> I am yet. <laughs> Look, I haven't even started. Oh. Really, I haven't. All right. <laughs> now... Pencil. Date. <laughs> Alan should have such an audience. Date. October 3rd, 1948, to Clifton Cavanaugh, Esquire. <laughs> Down, Effie. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the sugar cane caper. On Thursday last, 
at 11 a.m. as I waited for the traffic signal so that I might legally cross Powell Street in order to board a cable car, a cat rubbed up against my leg. I leaned over to stroke it and noticed that it had six toes. I wondered if that meant anything. It didn't. Most Knob Hill addresses don't mean much anymore, but yours still does. The house was big, hideous, and reassuring. Oh. Are you from Pfeffersnow? Uh, no, I'm in business for myself. Mr. Cavanaugh in? Oh. Well, come on in. I can't understand what happened to that boy from Pfeffersnow. Oh, uh, pardon me if I seem a little hungover. Gladly, but can you ever forgive yourself? <laughs> I like you. You got a sense of humor. You'll need it. You uh, trying to tell me you don't approve of Mr. Cavanaugh? That perfume pothead. What did he do to you? He married my mother. Oh, Stepfather? Yeah. No, I'm Fred Blair. Spade's my name. Where do I find him? Detective? Check. I'll give you a clue. Look behind you. I did. I turned and found myself looking straight into your handsome face. You looked several years younger than your stepson, with regular aquiline features, dark, widely spaced eyes, and blue-black hair. Well, so you're the notorious Sam Spade. Well, I don't want to seem modest. Come into the conservatory. There's just the barest chance that we'll not be overheard. Good. There. Sit down. Uh, what's your problem, Mr. Cavanaugh? Problem indeed. Problems, plural. Starting with that junior grade lush that collared you at the door. He's very fond of you, too. Well, you can't imagine what a trial that boy's been to me. Both the children. For some reason, neither Fred nor his sister Eunice ever quite accepted me as their father. You don't say I suppose my youth counted against me. I think they misinterpreted my motives. When any man marries a wealthy widow twice his age... Yeah. Yeah, Why did you send for me, Mr. Cavanaugh? Well, it all started several months back, before my wife, uh, their mother... uh, 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 Where was I? Oh, died. The scandal quite literally killed her. You're sure that's what did the trick? Fred, uh, who, among other talents, was a positive genius for knowing the wrong sort of people, struck up an acquaintance with a hoodlum named Johnny Verona. Nice, clean-cut gangster type, runs a joint on Pacific Street. Precisely. With the positively hysterical name of the Subtropico. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a sordid brawl of some sort. A man shot. Obviously, this Johnny Verona shot him. Fred had to give testimony before the grand jury. It was all we could do to keep it out of the paper. But you did No, and old Eleanor, my wife, that is, uh, dropped dead when the butler brought in the Chronicle. But the worst was yet to come, Sam. Well, uh, don't keep me hanging, Cliff. Uh, Well, Fred continued to frequent this bistro, this dive of Verona's. I understand. I believe the bait is a toothsome little teaser with the unlikely name of Sugar Cane. She likes Fred. No woman in her right mind would look twice at that idiot, even if he were twice as rich and only half a sodden. That... Uh, where was I? Oh, yes, this... This, uh, uh, this Verona person came here several times on the pretext of pouring Fred through the front door and thereby bet, met my, my, my stepdaughter, Eunice. Well, uh, that's uh, a very interesting story, Mr. Cavanaugh. Now, uh, maybe you'll tell me what you want a detective for. Because my stepdaughter has brazenly informed me that she intends to marry this gangster. I want you to help me prevent that marriage. I, uh, don't see. Don't see what? I don't see how I can. Perhaps I didn't make myself clear. When Verona was arrested for that shooting in his club, Fred didn't tell the grand jury all he knew. Now, if you could prove that Verona is guilty, then we'd be rid of him for good. Is it Verona you want to get rid of or your stepson? Good Lord, you don't, you don't think Fred did it? Do you? Why, no, of course not. Okay, supposing Verona did it, then Fred goes up on a perjury rap, maybe accessory. Oh. Well, I have no overwhelming desire to injure Fred. Uh, look, why don't you tell me what you have an overwhelming desire for? Well, under the terms of her mother's will, Eunice will inherit three million dollars as soon as she marries. When? Uh, when what? When do I meet her? Be serious, man. Now, I will pay Verona fifty thousand dollars in cash if he'll stay away from her. Would you take fifty grand as the payoff in a three million dollar caper? In this instance, yes. Eunice is not very well, and you may quote me on that. Book, chapter, and verse. To Johnny Verona? Uh, To Johnny Verona. Okay. Water's mighty cold this time of the year at the bottom of the bay, but if you don't care, I don't. Thank you. Let me know how it comes out. Don't give it a second thought. You'll know. Uh, Don't get up, Mr. Cavanaugh. I know the way out. 
Hey, Spade, wait up. Well, you look a little better. Listen, there's something you ought to know. He was my sister's boyfriend before he married my mother. He did it out of revenge because Eunice threw him over. He still wants to marry her. Any particular reason? Oh, my mother put that crazy marriage clause in her will. He's been systematically getting rid of every man who's been interested in her. Bought him off, threatened him off any way he could. Why? He thinks Eunice will eventually marry him to get her inheritance. But she won't. She'll kill him first, and if she doesn't, I'll do it for her. Fred. Oh. Oh, yeah? Fred, what on earth are you saying? Who is this man? Well, he's the detective. Sam Spade. You're Eunice Blair? Yes, I want to talk to you. Fred, go go and... Yeah. Uh, see you later, Spade. I know why my stepfather hired you, Mr. Spade. If you need the money, go ahead. But this time, it won't work. You look as if you'd like to be a nice girl. How did you happen to settle for a cheap grifter like Johnny Verona? Because we understand each other, and he can't be scared off. Any message I can take him from you? Tell Johnny I'll meet him at the usual place. And tell him I still like my coffee black. No sugar. I didn't ask her what kind of sugar she didn't want any of. I thought I knew. The only thing wrong with uh, Sugar Cane's dance was her dancing, but the customers didn't seem to mind, and I didn't either. It was a pleasure to size her up carefully, as I would have felt obliged to do anyway in my professional capacity. She was a black-haired number with aquiline features and widely spaced dark eyes. It was a beautiful combination, and I wondered where I'd seen it before quite recently. I decided to find out. What's the idea of barging in here after me? Can't you see the sign on the door? No customers in the dressing room. Then let's go someplace else. I want to talk to you. Beat it. Take it easy. This is on business. Good. I'll fix it up with the boss. Johnny! Yeah, sugar? Uh, what's the matter? Is Joe giving you trouble? You trailed in here after me to cheat, Masher. On the pretext of discussing business affairs. Okay, out you go. Now, wait a minute. Come on, move. And don't uh... come back. Well? Uh, sorry, I had to give that bum's rush routine. I don't want to get her excited. She's a nice kid, and she doesn't know why you're here. I take it you do. Yeah. Eunice called me and told me you'd be down. Okay, Johnny, I'll give it to you fast and get out. Clifton Cavanaugh will pay you 50 grand to leave Eunice alone. He also made a few idle or not-so-idle threats about what might happen to her if you don't take his money. Uh, for example? He said she hasn't been feeling well, might not live long enough to get married. I don't have to tell you what I think about that kind of talk, and I wouldn't be peddling it if my office rent wasn't due. That's why when you started giving me that bums rush, I made only, shall we say, a token resistance. Yeah. About me, Mary, and Eunice, you can tell Clifton to stop worrying. Hmm? Yeah, Eunice and I got married three weeks ago. You what? Mary. Uh, you want to see the papers? Why the secrecy? I don't want her to get hurt. You're scared of Clifton? Nah. Sugar. She's got a very low boiling point. She's a... Oh, uh, pardon me. Yeah. Yeah, Nick. What is? Go ahead. Yeah, I heard you. No, no, don't touch anything. Don't let anybody in. I'll be right over. Bad news? Yeah, Eunice. She's dead. How? Well, one of my boys found her in my apartment. She was supposed to wait for me there. How did it happen? He's not sure. He thinks she took poison. <laughs> I had to give Johnny Verona one thing. He didn't make any pretense about being grief-stricken. But after all, he just inherited three million bucks. Sugar Cane took it standing up, too, but she just lost a rival and got her man back three million bucks richer. I wasn't with you when you got the news, Mr. Cavanaugh. But the one I really wondered about was Eunice's brother, Fred. What brought that on was something I picked up in Johnny Verona's apartment where we found Eunice's body sprawled out over a tray of coffee things. It was a medicine bottle with a doctor's prescription number on the label. The name of the druggist that had put it up was Pfefferschnau. I remembered what Fred had said to me when he admitted me to your house that afternoon. Quote, are you the man from Pfefferschnau's? I wondered if I'd answered yes, would Eunice still be alive? The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, 
here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So, if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Sugar Cane Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. The morning papers didn't carry anything new on Eunice's death. The cause was put down to an overdose of a toxic drug... The doctor who prescribed it said she'd requested it for migraine headaches, which he suggested might have driven her to suicide. He did not explain why she had taken four doses in capsule form and dissolved the rest of it in a decanter of coffee. I thought somebody else had dosed the coffee, and so did you, Mr. Cavanaugh. Verona did it, of course. He knew she was taking those pills and dosed the coffee just enough to be fatal when added to what she took voluntarily. You knew all that, too. Well, so did Fred. But you had more reasons, three million more. But they were already married. You know that when you hired me? Yes. Then how come? I knew she was planning to do away with herself. I thought if we could pin it on Verona, after all, he's guilty of that old murder. Fred's a witness to that. Well, if he were convicted, the money would revert to me. Nuts. You don't believe me? She wasn't planning suicide, and you know it. Well, then... I don't care who takes the fall, but I got less on Verona than I got on you. Then I'll give you something. Here. Take a look. Verona's lawyer sent this around before her body was cold. A claim for three million dollars notarized yesterday while Eunice was still alive. Well, Mr. Spade. Pardon me when I drop dead. You did and waited hopefully, but I managed to stay on my feet. I even managed to make it down the hall to the bar where I found your stepson ambushed behind a row of empty bottles. Fine detective you turn out to be. I warned you. Stand up like a man. That's all right. I'll take on both of you. Come on, sober up. Makes sense. Where's my drink? Who took my glass? Here it is. Give me a Sure. You spill it. Ice on my shirt. Listen to me. This is very important. Important? You were expecting a delivery from a drugstore when I arrived there yesterday morning. Who ordered it? She did. Eunice, she told me to watch for it and bring it to her. Did you do that? No. No, she wasn't here. What did you do with that bottle of medicine? I'm sleepy. I gotta get some rest. Wake up! I said, wake up! Leave me alone! Now, now, listen. You took that bottle with you when you went out. Where did you take it? If I tell you, will you let me go to sleep? You took that bottle with you, didn't you? You're guessing. I know you're third degree. You went to Verona's apartment, didn't you? Two gentlemen of Verona. Willie Shakespeare. You doped that coffee, didn't you, with the poison that killed your sister? I didn't mean it for her. I I didn't know she was going there. Go on talking. (laughs) I want a lawyer. I I know my rights. Listen, I'm not a cop. I'm not taking a statement. You're too drunk for it to hold anyway, so you can tell me. Uh, Okay. Here's how it happened. She... She took her four pills and went to bed. Yeah? I I, I sneaked a bottle out of the medicine chest and I went over to his place. His boy Nick was there making coffee for the boss, he said, when he got home. I hung around talking for a while and I I, I slipped some of the stuff in the percolator while he was getting out of the cups. And and that's all. Why did you want to kill Johnny Verona? So Eunice wouldn't have to marry him. What do you mean, have to? (laughs) She was doing it for me, so he'd keep quiet. About that brawl in the club, that old killing they tried to nail Johnny for? Yeah, yeah, that's it. That, uh, the gun that did it. He, he got rid of it before the cops arrived. That was my gun. Fred, straighten up. Look. Yeah. Johnny dictated the story you told the grand jury. How do I know he didn't dictate the one you're telling me now? Who are you covering for? I, I didn't say anything. I didn't tell you anything. 
Get out of here! What's the matter with you? I get... Revolver barrel that crashed through the darkened window pane behind the bar spoke twice. I answered it. I looked out into the darkness, making myself a good enough target to draw some fire. I fired back at the flashes. I was depending more on luck than aim, and luck was what I wasn't having much of. I went back to the place where Fred had fallen. The shots that had dropped him were luckier. He'd been dead before he hit the floor. What is it? What's happened here? See for yourself. Who? Shot through the window. Couldn't see anything but the gun muzzle. Looked like a forty-five. Johnny Verona, he packs a forty-five. Who told you that? It came out of that investigation. One of the reasons they couldn't indict for that old shooting. There were a lot of reasons they couldn't get that indictment. What are you driving at? Neither one of the leading suspects was guilty. I don't follow you. Sugar Kane did that job. Well, that's wild. What if I told you Fred made a statement of that effect before he was shot? You're lying. He confessed. Did I tell you that? Well, he must have. He he always talked about it when he was drunk. All right. All right. I was bluffing. Why? Just a crazy hunch. I thought there might be something between you and Sugar. Now I'm sure there isn't. Of course not. Should have spotted it before. You're too much the same type. Even look alike. I can't make you out. Well, don't try. It's not worth it. Uh, You better call homicide about Fred here. Tell Lieutenant Dundee if he wants my statement, I'll be at my apartment. After I pretended to leave, I came back and did a little eavesdropping of my own. You didn't phone homicide, but you did spend an hour filing out the barrel of a forty-five automatic. Then you went out. I tailed you to an address on Sloat Boulevard. A short time after you went in, Sugar Kane came out alone. I followed her to, you know the answer, my apartment. I went in the back way via the fire escape and arrived in time to answer her buzz. Oh, Mr. Spade, thank heaven I found you at home. So am I. Come in. I know it's terribly late. Forget it. Won't you take off your uh, coat or something? Can't stay very long. It's not safe. I may have been followed here. Oh, surely not. Sam, you don't mind if I call you Sam? No. I'm so frightened. It's about Johnny Verona. I don't know what he may do. He's convinced that Fred killed Eunice and he's out gunning for him right now. We've got to stop him before he does anything rash. You come to the wrong party, sugar. I'm working for the enemy. Enemy? Kavanaugh. Oh. It's no skin off his nose if Johnny Verona drops Fred Blair or if you all drop. All he does is sit back and collect. He can't be as cynical as that. You ought to know. Has he told you anything about me? I'd rather hear it from you. May we sit down? Well, there's not much to tell. I played along with Johnny for one reason and one reason alone. To save Fred from that old murder rap. Were you uh, figuring on marrying into that family, too? Oh, sir. A regular pincers movement, wasn't it? Johnny and Eunice, you and Fred. All right. It's true I wasn't in love with Fred, but it wasn't all the money. I was sorry for him. Money's not what I really want. I know that now. What do you want? Someone. Someone I can trust. Me too, sugar. Oh, Sam, you're what I want. Say you want me, too. Please say it. Don't answer it, Sam. Why not? Johnny may have followed me here. He's insanely jealous. Well, I gotta face it out with him sooner or later. Might as well be now. Sam, be careful. Stand out of the way, sugar. No, Sam. No, no, please. Don't reach, Johnny. I'm not gunning for you, Spade. In that case, come on in. Well, sugar... I didn't believe him that you were coming here. I had to, Johnny. He got some crazy confession out of Fred while he was drunk. I had to stall him until you and Cliff could talk to him. To save Fred, I mean. Oh, stop horsing around. We all know that we all know Fred is dead, and we all know that we all know who killed him. Oh, then Cliff was leveling. You are trying to pin that on me. I don't need it, but if you want it, you can have it. There's three million bucks in my part of it. I'll split down with the middle with you. If you throw in with them, it's a three-way split. There's no split at all if you take the rap for Eunice's killing. And you will if you throw in with me. It's their word against mine. Two witnesses against one. And all I've got is a confession by a drunk who is now dead. Sam. Oh, Sam, I was sure for a moment you... Get away from me. Sam, (laughs) Go on. Go to work on him. I should have given you a little more time. That wasn't fair, was it, Sugar? I hate you. I hate you both. I never want to see you again. Get back in that room, Sugar. What happened, Sugar? Why were you running away? Johnny double-crossed us. Now, Sam knows everything. What does he know? The whole caper. 
part of it I wasn't quite sure of until I saw you and Sugar standing side by side. That blue-black hair, the same eyes, plus the fact that the bell on Sugar's apartment on Sloat Boulevard reads Kane, parenthesis, Cavanaugh. You took a crazy chance when you knocked off Fred with me right there in the room. The kind of a crazy chance a brother would take to keep his sister clear. I could have told you that. It would have helped a lot, Johnny, but you didn't. When a man lets his sister go on dancing in a joint like yours after he's in the chips and she goes on liking it, you can be sure they're both playing for big stakes and for nobody but themselves. Where do you think you were supposed to wind up, Johnny? I'll tell you. Drinking that poison coffee that Eunice got hold of by mistake. That isn't true, Johnny. I never told Fred a thing. He thought you really loved Eunice. I don't know how he found out you were forcing her into that marriage. Uh, did you also neglect to tell him that he was innocent? That you pulled a trigger in that old killing and, and shoved a gun into his hand when he was too drunk to know what he was doing? I've heard enough. Watch it, Johnny. No! Oh! I winged you a split second before you fired. Your aim went wild. All I saw at first was that it missed Johnny. Then I saw him move forward in her direction. She was leaning against the wall, a puzzled expression on her face. Her hand plucking nervously at a spot of red that was spreading against the white of her dress. He caught her as she pitched forward and carried her over to a couch. She didn't speak again. You and Johnny knelt beside her until the cops arrived. If you were aware of each other's presence, neither of you showed it. Period. And a report. That was a sad ending, Sam. Yes, it is. I'm sorry it ended so sadly. Well, it was bound to one way or the other. There wasn't anybody in the whole gallery that thought about anybody but himself. Except poor Fred, I guess, and his his only friends arrived in bottles and left in the ash can. All those millions and millions. Oh, get the money now, Sam. I'm glad you asked that. It leaves me cold. Go type that up while I knit myself a sweater. And now, listen to this. It's the smart mother who sees to it that Wild Root Cream Oil is always kept handy around the house. For she knows that Wild Root Cream Oil grooms her family's hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff, Get acquainted by asking for the new 25-cent bottle. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Well, here it is, Sam. Goodness, what a terrible group of unfortunates. Hmm? As you say, it just had to end badly. If you hope to get back in my good graces by quoting me, to trick me into agreeing with you, you have succeeded. Oh, there you go, Sam. So lugubrious. Effie, what is this? What means lugubrious? Oh, Sam, it's wonderful. It's my new habit. Oh? Every time I read a book now. Mm-hmm. And you know, like you read a book and there's a word you don't know what it means or you're not sure. Yeah. Well, I make it a practice now to write down and learn three new words per day. Well. And learn the definitions to use them in conversation. You know, like, uh, desultory. And lugubrious? Yes, that's one of my three for today. Mm. You see? Lugubrious. Right here it is. Mm-hmm. To talk a great deal. Um, bucolic, state of being sorrowful. And verbose to be out in the country. I see, I see. Very praiseworthy. <laughs> Enlarging your vocabulary. Yes, love it, love I it. I am. But I don't expect to be really lugubrious for, oh, for the novel. Uh, look, Effie, why don't you go verbose for the weekend? It's the best cure for the bucolic. Oh, Sam, look what I've done. What have you done? I've clipped the wrong definition to the right words. Well. For instance, lugubrious, well, it isn't that at all. Mm-hmm. And bucolic, oh, let me see. Oh, Sam, I've learned them wrong. I wasn't going to tell you, Effie. It's better to find out for yourself. It's more, uh, Effie cases. My new habit. Oh. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorreen Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dow. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin with score composed by Renee Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get wild root cream oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You 
better get wild root cream oil. Charlie, start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie, keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get wild root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It's one of those drowsy summer afternoons, the sort of day executives spend on their favorite golf course, and office workers spend watching the clock. But not Mike Shane. He's hard at work. Hudged over a desk in his private office, Mike's mind is clicking like a Powell Street cable car. In fact, he's right in the middle of a crossword puzzle. Phyllis Knight, his capable assistant, is daydreaming in the outer office, gazing out a window at San Francisco's rooftops. A quiet day? <laughs> Let's be frank. It's a downright dull afternoon. But wait. Is this Michael Shane's office? Uh, uh, yes. Do you wish to see him? Idiotic question. Of course I wish to see him. In there, I suppose. Wait. Well, of all the nerve. Are you Michael Shane? Hmm? Oh, yes. And the young lady who was suffering from spring fever is my usually capable assistant, Miss Phyllis Knight. Won't you have a chair? I'm Winifred Spencer. The society columnist? I believe that is the correct title, although most of my readers and radio listeners prefer to call me a gossip writer. I know something of your work as a detective, Mr. Shane. Well, I'm just an amateur, Miss Spencer, in comparison with you when I think of all the skeletons you've dug out of closets. I'm afraid I've found one too many, Mr. Shane. Hmm? I received this letter this morning. I'm going to kill you. Your poison words have caused grief, wrecked fortunes, divorce, suicides. Now they're going to cause your death. There are scores who would like to kill you. None has a better reason than I, so I'm going to kill you. What would you do if you received such a letter? I'd read it the second time on a train, a fast train. No, Mr. Shane. You'd go after the writer, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. You think you know the person? I hope I... Uh, to know tonight. Mr. Shane, will you and Miss... Uh, Miss Knight? Will you and Miss Knight be at my home at eight o'clock? Hmm? I'm having a dinner party, and I believe you will find the guests interesting. You may even find the person so intent on murdering me. We'll be there, Miss Spencer. Oh, may I keep this note and the envelope too, please? Of course. And please dress. You're to be friends from out of town tonight. We'll endeavor to be presentable. And I trust prompt. Goodbye, Mr. Shane and Miss Knight. Goodbye. Mike. Hmm? You didn't ask her any questions. Well, for the present, Angel, I'd rather she did the talking. Hmm. Now, I believe she was actually frightened. Oh, she's scared stiff, honey. Her chickens are coming home to roost. Half the people in San Francisco, the so-called better half, would like nothing better than to send flowers to her funeral. Yeah, I guess that's true enough. Now, you can't grow up on the right side of the tracks, tattle on your friends, and not get your fingers burned. Hey, isn't there a brother somewhere in the background? Mm-hmm. Mm, a bit younger than the old Dane. Went through his money fast, and now they say he's going through hers. I believe he lives with her. Oh. Let's have a look at the note, huh? Envelope plain, business type. Dressed to the old girl at her office. Mailed at 6 p.m. last night. You uh, noticed anything odd about the paper? Oh, let me look at it against the light. Watermark business stationery, Mike. This has been torn. The letterhead's been torn off. Right you are, Angel. Now, look at the typing. Yeah, it looks almost like a professional job to me. Could be... But well, come on, let's do a bit of research on San Francisco's society. Oh, that won't be necessary, Mike. I'm one of Winifred's uh, constant readers. Just ask me questions. I'll remember that when the time comes. Uh, now, please, Mr. Shane, I'd like the rest of the afternoon off. We get a red-hot client and you want to play. No, dear, I want to get my hair done. We're stepping out in society tonight. Say, I wonder if I've got a black tie. <laughs> Mm. 
It's an old mansion. Look at the Iron Deer on the lawn, Mike. Mm. The bay window in front. Not as big as the Palace Hotel, but older. Anybody with Iron Deer on the lawn is just inviting murder. Yeah. Ooh, it gives me the creeps. Ivy all over the walls. Probably some growing inside, too. Yeah. Anyhow, let's find out. Ring the bell. Uh, you mean lift the knocker. Oh. This way, please. Bring them in here, Henry. This way, please. Oh, I'm glad you came early. Nice to be here, Miss Spencer. What an unusual house. Oh, yes, this old house is filled with memories. The Spencers have lived here since 1850. Say, that's a fine old square rigger model on the mantelpiece there. My grandfather sailed the original round the horn. He brought uh, most of the furniture you see here with him. Oh. This desk was one of his prized possessions. Well, it looks like it's being put to use these days, too. Typewriter, lots of books. Is uh, this your study? No, I do my work at the office. My brother Seward spends quite a bit of time in here. Seward likes to think of himself as a writer. Is your brother here tonight, Miss Spencer? Yes, with his latest conquest, a Miss Melody. You'll meet them at dinner. Oh. Uh, we'd better be getting back to the dining room. It's time for the guests. Uh, I think there's somebody behind that curtain. Huh? Of course there is. The curtains hide a service entrance. Come in, Henry. Pardon me, Miss Spencer. Oh. May I announce dinner? Yes, Henry. We're ready. <laughs> oh? Will you please stop boring one another and listen? I have a surprise for you. This is my broadcast night, and it's almost time for me to go on the air. You're going to do your broadcast right here? No, I recorded it this afternoon. But we're going to listen to it on the radio. I thought it would be interesting to have the people I'm going to talk about as my guests. That's why most of you are here tonight. I'm sure you'll find what I have to say uh, interesting. Uh, Mr. Davis, Hugh, please step into the drawing room and turn on the radio. I don't want anyone to miss a word of this broadcast. Oh, you might have spared us this, Winifred. I'm through protecting you, Seward. Well, I'm not going to sit here and be made a fool of by my own sister. You'll remain right where you are. What's the station, Winifred? Now, for heaven's sakes, how do you turn this antique on? Oh, bother. I'll come and do it. I believe he was afraid to turn it on. What's this all about, Mike? It looks like she's going to tittle-tattle on Seward and her guests. Oh, Hey, Mike, look at Seward. He's ready to explode. He's not by himself, honey. Most of the guests seem to have high blood pressure. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. There's Mr. Davis. He's standing there by the door laughing. Huh? <laughs> oh, it looks like the joke's on Winifred. I don't believe the radio's going to work. Well, what seems to be wrong with the radio? Well, that's what Winifred's trying to find out. She should have bought a new one years ago. Are you sure it's plugged in, Winifred? Well, I guess we're going to have to listen to her. Now, your society reporter, Winifred Spencer. Good evening. This is Winifred. Have I been gathering tidbits about people you know? The first item tonight concerns an immediate member of your reporter's family, my brother Seward. He has played with fire once too often, and I regret to announce that I my brother has listen. gone too long. Come on, Merle. She's got no right to talk to me. There goes Seward into the drawing room and Miss Melody right after him. Oh, come on, Bill. Let's get in there. Hey, hey, what goes on here? It's Winifred. She's dead. She's dead. Hmm. A knife in her back? She's dead, all right. <laughs> We'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures in just a moment. Friends, if your automobile engine has a habit of giving a death rattle when you step on the accelerator, the fault may lie with the motor oil you use. You see, most rattling and pinging in an engine is due to excess carbon. And contrary to popular opinion, nearly all carbon formed in automobile engines comes from the lubricating oil and not from the gasoline, as so many people think. 
Now, no two motor oils form the same amount of carbon. That's why we say your carbon troubles may be due to the brand of lubricating oil you buy. Because, and this is a proved laboratory fact, Triton motor oil forms less carbon than any of the seven leading motor oils sold in the West. Yes, that's right. Triton cuts down carbon. The secret of Triton's superiority lies in Union Oil Company's exclusive propane solvent refining process. That means all harmful asphalts, waxes, and sulfur have been removed, leaving a pure 100% paraffin-based lubricating oil, an oil that will furnish hundreds of miles of safe, dependable lubrication. So, friends, with parts and mechanics as scarce as they are today, why not take advantage of the unusual protection you can get from Triton Motor Oil? You can buy Triton at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. The inspector is on his way. Mike has announced his identity and taken over. Ten minutes has elapsed since someone murdered Winifred Spencer in her drawing room, not more than 12 steps from where a dozen guests sat finishing their dinner. May I have your attention, please? Now, I'm sure that you want to return to your homes, and there's no reason why those of you who were at the table when Miss Spencer met her death should remain. Uh, you may leave now before the police arrive, if you wish. Hey, the inspector isn't going to like this, Mike. Hmm? You said yourself that there were ten people here who had reason to murder Miss Spencer. I said there were at least ten people who would love to murder her. Hmm. Whoever killed the old dame had a lot stronger motive than revenge, Angel. I let them go because they were cluttering up the place. Now, well, just the same. The inspector isn't going to like it. Watch this I'm not going to like? No. Huh? Mike got big-hearted and let some of the guests go home. Uh, we can always bring her back, Phil. Who's left? That's Miss Spencer in the chair with a knife in her back, Inspector. Oh. I believe I told you on the phone that her brother, Seward, took a powder. Yeah. The lady on the sofa is his... Uh... I am uh, Merle Melody, and I'm sticking around a little. Cause Seward will be back. He just lost his temper and couldn't face the guests. Lost his temper, huh? Oh, tut, tut. And uh, the gray-haired gentleman who looks like a banker is a banker. Family friend named Hugh Davis. He's coming over to say hello. Glad you're here, Inspector. I'm Hugh Davis. Mr. Shane has told yeah, you... Yeah, that's why I'm here. I understand you're an old friend. I suppose I know Winifred as well as anyone in San Francisco. I've been the Spencer's banker for 20 years, Inspector. Hmm? Did uh, you handle Seward's financial affairs too, Mr. Davis? Yes, although I must say they became rather tangled. Miss Spencer mentioned something about his spending a great deal of money on his new girlfriend. The charming Miss Melody. None of us approved of that infatuation. All this might never have happened. Well, you'd better tell us all about it, Mr. Davis. I'd much rather discuss the matter when Seward is present. Mr. Spencer isn't here. He's flown the coop, so let's have it now. What about Seward and his money? It wasn't his money. Oh, Winifred was generous with him, generous to a fault, in my opinion. Seward spent the last of his fortune more than a year ago. So he has uh, been living off his sister, eh? Yes, Mr. Shane. Well, it's not a very pretty picture, but you can't hang a man for sponging. Something I'd like to know, Mike. Yeah, what, Angel? Well, I'd like to know what Winifred Spencer said about Seward in her broadcast tonight. It ended rather suddenly here. You know? I picked up the script on the way over, Phil. Just a lot of society gab and a sprinkling of sneers. Right people in the wrong places. Uh-huh. What'd she say about her brother and his girlfriend? Well, let's see. Oh, yes, she said Seward had stepped out of bounds with a chorus girl. They were dropping his name from the social register. Then she said she doubted that Miss Melody would be able to support Seward in the style he'd been accustomed to. Oh, so his sister was going to cut him off. That right, Mr. Davis? Yes, they had a bitter quarrel a couple of days ago. Will Seward inherit Miss Spencer's money, Mr. Davis? I think the proper person to advise you on that matter is Miss Spencer's attorney. Mm. Maybe you're right, Davis, but as uh, Miss Spencer's banker, I believe you can answer the question. Well, I'd much prefer that Seward was present, but... Well, I don't suppose this is any time to be guarding family secrets. You're right so far. Now, look, if you know anything, spill it. I doubt that there will be more than several hundred dollars in this old house for Seward to inherit. What? Well, what happened to the old lady's fortune? Well, I'd much rather wait... Well, it'll have to come out sooner or later. Winifred and Seward have had the same safety deposit box at the bank for years. Just three days ago, Winifred came to my office highly agitated. More than $200,000 in negotiable bonds were missing from the box. And just what has your bank done about finding the 200 grand in bonds? Mr. Shane, there are times when a bank has to use discretion. We hope to recover Miss Spencer's property without undue publicity or scandal. 
That's one reason I sent Winifred to you this afternoon. So Brother Seward raided the box. That is all too evident, There's Miss another I... thing quite evident, sir. If you and Miss Spencer hadn't been so cagey ducking the very thing that little Winifred dished out, scandals, she might be alive right now. We thought we were doing the right thing. Well, that's water under the bridge. Mike. Hmm? Do you notice anything missing from the room? Well, sure, Ranger, the body. The police doctor just left a few minutes uh-huh. ago. No, not that body. Merle. Merle Melody. Huh? Holy smoke, she has gone. You better search, Mike, with the murderer still on the loose. There's only one way she could have gone. Through here. The door's open. Try that room, Inspector. I'll try this one. Right. Here she is, on a bed. Is she alive? Well, I don't know yet. Yeah. Yeah, she's breathing. Hmm. Now it's like a light. Oh, oh sleeping pills. Yeah, I guess so. Pulse is slow, but regular. Didn't want to answer questions, eh? All right, let us sleep. Let's have a look around while we're back here, Mike. You read my mind, Inspector. Uh, which way is the kitchen, Davis? Next turn to the left and down the hall. Here it is. Hmm, it's as big as a barn. And just as empty. The sergeant came back here when he searched the house. He probably sent the servants All to right, their quarters. What's that? Like that? What have you picked up, Sergeant. I just nabbed the butler. Let me go in the back door. Bring him into the light. Wow. Look who's with him. The missing brother. Thanks, Sarge. I'll take him. All right, sir. Bring him into the drawing room, Inspector. Here we are. All right, talk. Where have you been all evening, Mr. Spencer? What are police doing all around the house? Where? Where's Winifred? What have you done with Miss Melody? I'll have the answer to my question first, Mr. Spencer. Where have you been? I've walked for miles. I don't know where I've been. You were here when I lost my temper and dashed out, Mr. Shane. Winifred had no right to humiliate me before my friends. I hated to come back here. Then why did you come back? I don't know. This is my home. Where is Winifred, Merle? Miss Melody's asleep, Mr. Spencer. Your sister is dead. What? Murdered. No. No, that isn't true. I saw her sitting in that chair when I ran out the front door. Yes, Spencer, she was there. It also looks as if you stopped long enough to stick a knife into her back. No. No, I didn't do it. I might have wanted to, but I didn't. Just a minute, Henry. Where are you going? To my quarters, sir. You'd better stick around. Say, where were you when Miss Spencer's broadcast began? Uh, oh, yes, yes, I recall. I... I was preparing to serve the coffee, sir. I saw you going toward the side entrance to the drawing room when Miss Spencer left the table to turn on the radio. Oh. So you entered the drawing room by the side door, just ahead of Miss Spencer? I did not, sir. The door was closed. I I stood outside listening. I, I never miss one of Miss Spencer's broadcasts. Why did you lie to me about serving the coffee? I was frightened. You don't look like the type that frightens easily. Were you outside with Mr. Spencer? No, I heard someone at the back. It was Mr. Spencer. I let him in. Didn't the sergeant tell you to stay in your room? I have always answered the door, sir. That's probably the only truthful answer you've given me. Inspector. Yeah? Want to help me with an experiment? What are you going to do, Mike? I'd like to refresh my memory, Inspector. Let's all go into the dining room. Now, there's one thing I want to find out. All right, everybody, please take the places you had when Miss Spencer turned on the radio. I see. Mr. Davis. When I give the word, you are to get up and walk to the radio in the drawing room. Yes. Wait a few seconds and call just as you did at dinner. Very well. Phil, Phil, you be Miss Spencer and answer him. All right, Mike. Henry, Henry, you had better take your eavesdropping post by the side door, if that's where you really were. Yes, sir. Mr. Spencer, when Mr. Davis returns to the dining room, I want you to run into the drawing room. Oh, do I have to go through with this again? Yes, you have to go through with it again. No, I can't. Uh, Seward. Seward has fainted. Was that what you wanted to find out, Mike? No. No, that wasn't on the schedule, Angel. We'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, an automobile radiator that's clogged with rust and scale is a menace to your gas coupons. Yes, that's right. You see, choked water lines block the easy flow of the water. 
That means your motor heats up more than it should. And that spells trouble because motors, when too hot, can waste gasoline. Now, another thing which many people overlook is that cars driven around town with constant starting and stopping get hotter than those driven on the open road. So, even if you aren't planning any trips this summer, it's a good idea to drop in at a Union Oil station and ask the Minute Man to clean out your radiator. This service takes but a few minutes and works like magic. Union Radiator Flush is harmless to metal, but its special solvent action cuts scale, rust, and grease right out of choked radiator cores and water lines. Then, when this foreign matter is cleaned out and the Minute Man fills your radiator with fresh, clean water, you can be sure it will really circulate with a fast, steady flow. So, for cooler driving, economical mileage, just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil Radiator Service. Thank you. A couple of minutes has passed. Seward has been placed on a leather couch. Mike, Phil, and the others are gathered around the couch. A rather cruel thing to do, Mr. Shane, pretending to make Seward go through with all that nonsense. It wasn't nonsense, Mr. Davis. Here, loosen his collar. Henry, is there any brandy in here? I'll fetch it, Mr. Davis. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's coming, too. Oh, no, I can't. I can't. Huh? Oh, I fainted. Yes, yes, you fainted. All right, now, now maybe you'll tell us why you killed your sister. What you did with those bonds. I didn't kill Winifred. I tell you, I didn't. And I don't own any bonds. My glasses. I've lost my glasses. <laughs> 